Do you want to be a part of the COCO community? Sure, we all do. So join this free weekly live talk show to find out how easy it is to watch at home and learn about your color computer. At the COCO Nation, more than 9 million men and women have participated in the community without setting foot outside their homes. And now at home in your spare time, you can see what's happening or even join the discussion. Choose from any one of these segments. Panel intros, project updates, acquisitions, COCO thoughts, featured interviews and events, the Game On Challenge, news, Ron's Garage, COCO commercials, show coverage, panel goodbyes, or you can join one of our extra shows. You can choose from the Game On Challenge Live or COCO Tech. Join the COCO Nation right now. Click the link for the free information TJB Chris spoke about. Then decide if you want to watch the Coco Nation live show, the world's leading live weekly talk show featuring the Tandy Color computer, its siblings, cousins, and redheaded stepchildren. Visit the CocoNation.com. There is no obligation and no salesman will visit you. Visit the CocoNation.com. The Coco Nation Show is an unscripted, live, and interactive broadcast. Anything can and will happen. The views and opinions expressed by members of the panel and the live audience are their own, and not necessarily those of the Coco Nation Show, its sponsors, affiliates, or subsidiaries. Open minds are encouraged, and a sense of humor is recommended. Thank you for being a part of the Coco Nation. Radio Shack. Okay. What? The 80s called. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome to the Coco Nation, the world's first live and interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer and its hardware cousins. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Coco Nation Show, episode 355. <clears throat> How's everybody doing today? Great. I'm awake. Good morning. We're here. <laughs> uh, turn the mic on. It might work. What? Is the show on already? Yep, show's on already. This uh, is a show? <laughs> We're all... Darn, cutting out of the bag now. <laughs> ah, we, just yeah. to, we just get together the pub and it, and it ends up on YouTube. Oh, well, I gotta go get a drink. <laughs> Everybody drink. We fax. There we go. <laughs> I'm running behind then. Uh, let's see who we got on the panel today. Starting up on the top corner, we got Marco. I'm on the top corner again? Hey, glad to yep. be here. And then Terry Stee. Hello, everybody. Welcome and to the show. In the usual number three spot. Yours truly. And Rick Uland. Greetings, all. And let's see. Let's do a line feed and a courage return. We've got Ron Delvo. Hello. Welcome. Okay, the nail Curtis Boyle. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm imagining Nick has uh, might have slept in. It's a time change really early for him now. <laughs> and our resident radio announcer. He'll he'll join us in an hour or so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. We got Henry Gernhard. Hi, folks. Welcome to the Coco Nation. And today, we're that much closer to seven years on the air. Okay, and <laughs> Frederick Cigars. Did somebody hello, dial hello. back hello, his hello. mouth. I can't beat what uh, Henry does. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's gotten contaminated. Bring it down. Bit... Draw it in. <laughs> I'll take all the blame. He's, he's been rubbing against David Ladd too much. Yeah, I, I didn't know David Ladd was infectious. That's kind of scary. Infectious or infected? I don't know. Something like that. Um, <laughs> let's see. Next up, Ken Waters. Good day, everybody. And Jason, the Cooker Man. Hello, hello, hello. Again, it's time to follow your fun compass towards the Coco Nation. Now featuring 20% more Diet Dr. Pepper. Diet, ooh. And Brian Weasler. Hello. And next up, we got the real David Ladd. Ooh. Why, hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I hope you're ready for today's show. I certainly am, because this is going to be a long, filled day. <laughs> Okay, and next up we've got Alan, Exile in Paradise. Howdy, howdy, everybody. Glad y'all are here. Okay, and last but not least, Bob Emery. You're muted, Bob. But not a Zoom mute. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> You've never sounded better, Bob. <laughs> Here's what he said. <laughs> It's Godzilla. We must flee. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> that was scarily accurate to the movies. <laughs> All right. Let's see. In the chat. Exile of Paradise. Marco. Anonymous Facebook user. Wayne C.A. Any retro things? Amigos Retro Gaming. Uh, more of that anonymous Facebook user. Uh, it's a very see. popular name. Yeah, Breaky Kevin Holloway. Uh, let's see, new ones, new ones, new ones. Mark Siegel, hello. Uh, let's see, Tom Eric Gunderson, Amigos, Marco Kevin, Tim Franklin. I know. Uh, Michael Zweffel, Carrie Shrug. And now uh, we know Henry doesn't like Diet Dr. Pepper. Regiment Regiment AP. Ah, there's Regiment, our there's Regiment our mispronunciation Tap. of the week. 
He needs banning. Yeah, it's like I gotta think about this one. It's like, here, where do I put the syllables? And it's like, okay, just just insert some extra syllables. It'll be fine. <laughs> All right, we also got Scott Cooper, J.E. Jones, and David Ladd. All right, that's the intro. Yeah, David so, Ladd. <laughs> first up today, Marco, you made the observation, our resident historian. Yes, I was just thinking recently that uh, it was March 19th of 2017 when we had the very first Coco Talk show. And uh, so that is uh, basically we're coming up on six completed years here. So next week will be our beginning of our seventh season of uh, the Coco Nation slash the Coco Talk. Anyway, we did have some episodes before that, as uh, Curtis was pointing out, going clear back to January of 2016, the joystick episode that uh, Stevie and Curtis did, talking about joysticks for the uh, color computer. And there's also a few interviews in there, including Dale Lear and uh, and uh, the pr image producers and uh, Rick Adams. And who else did they interview? There's a few of them in there, but there's some good backstory stuff. You can see that all on OG Stevie's channel. Anyway, stick shares in the can. Well after today so or dumpster depending or on dumpster, point of view. Yeah. <laughs> depending on your point of view <laughs> maybe so in be on fire maybe in year seven we can get it right yeah the lucky seven nah. Nah. we can that, try anyway i would i would no, consider no, that delusional no, no, jason no. yeah that won't work I'm, we got it we got to get it we got to get the starboard we can't get it right starboard. we got to get the starboard starboard ah. yeah I, right. i'm just trying to be uh positive about it unlike some people's <laughs> feelings with diet dr pepper hey i like dr pepper it's just diet dr pepper has a funny taste to me yeah and diet yeah, anything has a funny it. taste to it to me yeah david are you hearing this hey he drinks he's in shock dr. he can't even speak <laughs> hey, diet dr pepper is one of the things yeah. that actually tastes better than the original so, so are we so is this show going to be considered among the greats like uh mash or next generation or other, other things yeah. that have lasted hey, oh years. it's going to be i think it's going to be in the same category as maybe plan like nine my, from outer space it'll be like that i was thinking like my mother the car yeah there there you go <laughs> yeah that was a good one. aim high <laughs> anyway aim high. except less intellectual yeah all i can except... say is i'm surprised we've lasted this long i don't know how we come up with stuff every week but we seem to but i'm well, glad to it turns out anybody with an internet connection can start a YouTube <laughs> yeah, stream. I think that's yeah. how that works. Yeah, case in point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there are cats with their own YouTube channels so they get more views than we do. So what, what can you say? <laughs> yeah. True. Cats True. have wider appeal. Hey, maybe maybe if we had maybe <laughs> if we had a, uh, a show that was just the cats. Yeah, we yeah. have enough of them on the show. That's that's a possibility. <laughs> the cats. Oh, the, the cats came back or something. I don't know. Well, cats of the cocoa. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so my okay. dogs would love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I guess uh, in in honor of the uh, the fact that we're coming up on our seventh year as of this following week, um, does anybody have a favorite episode, interview, segment, something they want to mention? <laughs> I'm oh so boy! Everybody just loves the show, huh? Where, where is the cricket sound? I just sound I just board? found out about this. I'm so unprepared in the spirit of the show. We are completely unprepared. Right. And I'm someone. I'll go first then. Something. My my yeah. favorite segment is the interviews. I I I've, you know whether I've arranged them, Ron's arranged them, or somebody else's arranged them, doesn't matter. I love hearing the stories and stuff from the developers, especially the ones back in the day. I've always found that absolutely fascinating. Oh, Dennis I could have been that big. I'll I'll be narcissistic and say I love the shows where I'm on there showing things. How's that? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we love the things. So the you last know. half of it, basically. <laughs> and, and I yeah, love the biased. shows reminding you that you have a problem. I love the shows where people are talking. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't add the word intelligibly at the end of that. Otherwise, we might be in trouble. Oh, no. <laughs> we, we could throw less than six hours into the favorite show pile. I'm, I, I'm a we big had, fan of the closing credits. We've had many shows where uh, things can and will happen. <laughs> yeah. Ken, I was going to think you're going to pick your own segment there, um, you know, gaming. Oh, no, I'm boring. <laughs> <laughs> but I, sure I, have to agree with, uh, I have to agree with Curtis, though. I mean, getting some of these people on that were, you know, kind of the rock stars back in the day and stuff like yes. that and hearing their stories 
and you know kind of what an exciting time it was back then you know because everything was new and everything so yeah i have to agree those are hearing those those people talk about how it was and and uh you know the things that they went through to to you know to bring forward what they had and it's it was, it was, it's neat. Yeah. The fact that everything was thrown at the wall and see if it sticks. Cause it was the wild west. Nobody had idea about standards of anything. So they were trying the weirdest games ever made and the weirdest hardware ever made and all kinds of things. So it's, yeah. And wood grain prototype computers, that kind of stuff. There you go. <laughs> well, have you I ever think... uh, sat with somebody like last night I was at a dinner party, you know, we had six people there and, um, my wife mentioned that I'm on a computer show like this, you know, and w what exactly is, you know, the cocoa? <laughs> and uh, um, so then uh, it's an old computer, you know, I went on about what we do and stuff. And they said, um, do people, you know, still use those things? You know, it's, it's, you had a tape drive, you had, you know, and then uh, one of the guys speak up and, you know, I, well, I used to start with and then you get a conversation about what their first computer was, which mm -hmm. was pretty cool. You know, you should ask him, Ron, do you people still drive 70s hot rods? Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> it's just yeah, a, no, they don't, a retro they don't hobby. Use them, and, they don't use the, them for your serious commute. Or, you know, and, you don't do your serious work on your Coco, but it's, no, it's a but, hobby, just like a like a classic car. Don't speak for yourself, Jason. I do. <laughs> Their garage becomes <laughs> important. Oh, you and your uh, you and your ease of use, your serious work. Yeah, are you still are you still making? Are you still you you still do actual work work that you get paid for in the cocoa? Um, no, not anymore. Ah, okay. Because I don't charge for you, you so. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so <laughs> it's not. It's no. At that point, I don't think it can be considered work because you're not being paid. It's more of a a hobby or a. For some of us, a labor of it's love. It's called a dumb maybe. business model is what it's called. <laughs> it's called a failing <laughs> business model, yes. Uh, You're spending the money till it runs out. Yep, his, 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 reward, his reward is being able to come here each week and you know be here with all of us. And pimp it like mad. Uh, that's pretty good. I thought Mark, your reward was that Nick Morenti's trash can icon. That was Mark, pretty good because he swore he'd never touch OS9 in his entire <laughs> lifetime, and I broke him. <laughs> Mark, Mark. Mark. When did you start, Mark B? Because you've been around a while now. Uh, I think it was on episode eighty-six. I think yeah. it was somewhere in there. Eighty-six. That that late. I think I I always really? confused. I would have thought it was remember. earlier. Yeah. I I I popped in at like thirty-six or thirty-nine. I can never remember which one. I should really make a note of it. But I started at twenty. So uh, how about the rest of you? When when did you start, or do you remember like Terry and Patrick and? Number one, just like Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no idea. I was 100 is where I was. 99, 100, somewhere in there. Okay. And Henry, you've just joined recently since we found your videos. Yeah. And Frederick, same thing. Yep. Thanks for joining the party. We're sorry. <laughs> better yeah, than ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're sorry. sorry to waste so we're much sorry. of your time. <laughs> and Ken, we recruited off your videos, too. Yeah, yep. I don't know when that was. That was like years ago. <laughs> right. It's a Couple long, long time I think time we were ago. probably like in the hundred and some episodes. Yeah, because you started playing game on, I think, fairly early on. So yeah, probably about the 140s, 150, somewhere there. Yeah. Did wow, you start with episodes, your shirt though. on the first one? Yeah, I've that? always had the shirts. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> so oh, so, the, um, so you mean like the a Hawaiian shirt or just a shirt in general? <laughs> well, actually, my original videos I did shirtless, but uh, that really didn't yeah, get any really views. So. I, I've never seen a negative view count before, but that was the first time. <laughs> that, so, so that's the reason why they got rid of the like button or the uh, dislike button. <laughs> yeah, because I was going shirtless in my original <laughs> videos. So you broke right. the dislike button, <laughs> and we had to change the name of the show. So, anyway, Mark's been trying to say something here for the last five minutes. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> uh where the heck were we now um uh dave and sharon various mentions we've already played over 200 coco games together uh there it is uh scott cooper the series he liked the best was the 6809 assembly with steve bjork yeah that was a good one um then uh uh fred provancia 
yes, you may join us for the game on segment. In fact, you you already late for being on. <laughs> oh, you're already here. Or what? No, I'm confused. Anyway, Fred Fred Pavancho, <laughs> Mark's yes, confused. No, that never happens. <laughs> join the party right. now. Oh. Now, now, now. That's right. Uh, you're late. <laughs> Someone write him a tardy slip. That's right. Uh, and we're caught up on the chat. Okay, and then Brian, David, Bob, and Alan. When did you guys first join? I can't remember. Uh, I've slept since then. It was somewhere in the middle, like a Gen Xer would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I. It's been at least four years. So you over know. half of them you've been on. Yeah. I would say at least at least four years, right? probably probably four or five years. When you so. only had twelve cocos, <laughs> right? <laughs> twelve warehouses yeah. of cocos. You know, now that I think about it, it's probably it's it's been at least five years. Now that I think about it, so yeah, it's been five years. So okay, David. Um, for some reason, I thought I was on the first episode, but you I are. Remember now, <laughs> you are. <laughs> David is on episode one, and John Lindbell, and eventually Alan Huffman, and Curtis, and I, and Stevie. God, seven. Oh. Bob Henry, Six, four, you, remember, years. you might have to flash numbers if your mic isn't working, but. <laughs> yeah, it's just ama- uh, amazing. Six years. One year. Oh, I heard you. I can hear you. Yeah, about one year I've been back in the scene. So yeah, and I think we found you through, through one of your videos too, didn't we? Uh, um, probably, Pretty yeah. Sure. I mean, there's some people now we've probably met through Discord and stuff, and then you eventually come onto the show too. But well, it looks like yeah, my first this, episode this was episode one seventy seven. So it's just over half the sh- span of the show. Then I'm surprised no exactly. more, we no needed more mentioned, Canadian content. No one mentioned mm-hmm. the meltdown as being a pretty. Uh... <laughs> That wasn't a show I liked time. particularly. No, I know. Right, right. It wasn't a favorite show. It did happen. It though. happened. It happened. Yeah. It's done. It's over with. Yeah, we've had a few shows that, you know, the internet went down and stuff for people too. So a uh, couple, you know, yeah. beyond our control disasters. Those are some I... of the highest rated ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. The ca- the Captain Meltdown show. Yeah. Thank God we're off. They're off the air now. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> I think the virtual fests and stuff too, like the big gatherings, the big dragon specials, MC10 oh, specials, yeah. cool. are pretty good too. And then there's some of our highest view shows as well. Oh, yeah. like the yeah, like the ver- the first virtual Coco Fest we did during 2020. 2020. That was that was a marathon yeah. show, but it was awesome. It's not yeah. like I had anywhere to go. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, what was I gonna do? I, 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 I could be down here, be. or I could go downstairs and get coffee. That's my two choices. So. Yeah. So wow. six plus hours. Yeah, it was good though, and lots of yeah. views. Yeah, and then the Dragon Virtual Fest the next year in 2021. Yeah, we had to stop for dinner on that one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. right. <laughs> and have a dinner. You know, I you know I I enjoyed the MC10 special we did. That that yep. was great. Where we had a lot of the MC10 guys on here, and uh, you know, just you know, it had been a butt of jokes for many years. When there's actually some really neat things that they're able to do in that limited uh, architecture, even with that yep. uh, little keyboard. And then you got to meet people like, you know, Jim Gary, who can write three to five games a week and has mm-hmm. been doing for years. Like, I can't even mm-hmm. fathom that. Another great thing is having uh, reviewed each Cocoa Fest. I mean, yeah. you know, we yeah. go especially for the people who can't make it because yeah, they yeah. kind of get a better hands on of what, what's going on. Some of us can't see all the um, shows that they, they put on the yeah. exhibits. Yeah. And the other thing is the, the talks are kind of neat, you know, to review them and because you can't go to every one. So, you know, yeah, I had that problem with Rainbow Fest too because there was a few times when they they used to run like four seminars seminars every hour at the same time, and I'd have like two I really wanted to go to. Like you just have to flip a coin because you have no idea, right? In yeah, fact, I, we've been I, streaming them and streaming the actual Cocoa Fest and stuff too is actually really nice. the The weird thing about our show is it's pretty much always about the past, you know, and there's not much. Well, it's retro, except, so it kind of makes yeah. sense. So it's, all, <laughs> it's also about until, the now. The until somebody makes a board or something that's new and and makes it do interesting, neat, new things, you know. 
Yeah, or new software. There's there's a fair bit of new That's stuff too. Yeah, I would say. And some some of the people that make the new stuff don't even come on our show. Nope. Like just, some people just don't like being in public. Like I know there's a few people that are active that just would hate Patrick to be on Taylor. a camera or mic. Yeah. I make new stuff. I'm on the show. Yeah. Well, he, he's a good country. <laughs> Wait, who are you? Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, let me check he, here. He's that uh, guy I, who likes Diet Dr. Pepper. Oh, yes. Yeah, Diet Dr. Pepper. He doesn't look like David Ladd. He's Ooh. like the, the mobile Coco guy. He's always mobile. Yeah, been, I will be yeah. when amusement park seasons open up, and oh, that's there you that's, go. that's kind of my that's my side that's kind of my side project with my my since you've mentioned my my uh, my fairly amused YouTube channel that'll be kicking back into action with the and yeah you'll see me on the road more. I was real impressed with your uh, MC10 at one of the was it the last show or the show before where you had the um you had the game playing and it looked so good. Um, uh, the Co- was it Coco VGA equipped or something? Or? Um, I don't no. know. It was just on a silver TV. Oh yeah, right? that's I. I have a. I do have a composite mod for it that I got from Zipster, but that's oh the Pac Man game. Okay, yeah. yeah. And it, I usually it, yeah. It was a highlight of one of the shows having that on and playing, and it looked great. And people come by, and go, "You're kidding!" You know, <laughs> it looked well, great. I started bringing the MC10 because I think there was a year you weren't going to be able to make it or something. And it's like, well, there's not going to be an MC10 there. I have to bring mine. So, there and then go. I eventually got the composite mod from, from Zipster Zone and put that in there. And that works out real nice with that little Walmart, old Walmart brand uh, CRT TV with the uh, AV input right on the front. Yeah, it was, it was great. One, one of my favorites was the uh, Coco Forever launch party we did all oh, right that was fun and i think that's just kind of that's just kind of stored away somewhere i don't think that's available is it oh we still keep running i think he still it. sells it doesn't he oh i mean uh, the actual <laughs> launch party video i thought that was that was saved for something and i don't know whatever whatever happened to that oh yeah because i think steve is really planning it to be a patreon or some i think it was something he? that went to or bruce uh, did maybe to I, bruce, I think it went to bruce and i i don't know whatever bruce yeah, made that, that was a blast a great booklet, didn't he? That yes. Was little, it was pretty awesome. Nope, it's mm-hmm. still available. Is it? I figured the, the booklet would be available. I was talking about the launch party video. Oh, that yeah. He did. Yeah. Although, I think the video out there of me you know, winning the mug is out there somewhere. That, that was a blast. <laughs> yeah, the second I, mug? The second mug, yes. It's... it's it's nearby. Maybe I'll maybe I'll have to bring it to Coco Fest and actually drink some cocoa at Coco Fest for my. Uh, <laughs> yeah, make for sure, my, make uh, sure the lights on the casework. Oh, that that's, was that that, that was a one time, that was a one time <laughs> joke. I'm the the root. I, I that was one of those things that I just I just mentioned in passing to my brother Ken and was like that would be funny. We'll put it in a box and and, and he and he made it happen. I just thought it was mm. it was too funny. Yeah. Well, your Marco, brother, I put the link in our chat there if you want to share it for the uh, okay, Coco Forever launch party video. We had a lot of lot of fun I'll poking at uh, the the people that were caught in the elevator, and then we had the uh, um, Coco game that came out later, which is or the famous couch game. Yeah. Oh yes, Nightmare yeah. Highway. Yeah. Right. That was pretty cool. Yeah. I think one thing that nice is that we we're a show that covers the gamut of going from being you know serious about you know cool new projects or trying to help somebody fix some hardware software problem up to being you know just completely off the cuff trying to be funny type thing. So we don't we don't stay one way. We're not just a dead serious show, which means people like humor kind of get turned off, stress, or vice versa, trying. where people you know too much humor. You guys are what was the quote we used to get. Um, what they call this uh, sophomore, I believe. Sophomore, yeah. yep. Yeah. <laughs> and and we kind of we go you know from one gamut to the other. So basically, there's something to hate for everybody. So it's just... well, you know, you know what else is cool is uh, a lot of people have made their um, life's work computers from starting on a Coco at some point. Yeah, and that's pretty cool to hear. You know, even the newbies that come on uh, um, Discord. You know, they, they mentioned that uh, they got started and they became a, you know, programmer or, you know, went on to make millions of dollars and they're not going to come on our show. 
<laughs> well, I know like there's been a few uh, people from the co community, obviously like Glenn Dahlgren. He's just finished publishing a four book fantasy series, and uh, you know he's doing major games for some of the major PC developers. And then Alan Huffman just this week was mentioning, and I think I forgot to put it in the news, so I might as well mention it now. Uh, Vaughn Cato used to write some stuff. He wrote one of the early Bonsing Ball demos for the Coco 3, and he also wrote you know, the View Gift Utility, which is pretty close to Sockmaster's Eye Color in under OS 9. And uh, he ended up being part of a team that did the um, motion capture for the, um, uh, what the heck's the blue skinned John Cameron movie? Avatar. 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 Yeah, Avatar. He, he, yeah, he was on the team that did the motion capture for that, and he actually won an Oscar. And he started on the Coco as well. So, I mean, there's there's quite a few there about that type of story. And you were okay. talking about Glenn, Glenn there. I, I've actually, I, I've, I got the audio book, so at least the first three, and I've listened to them. I, I enjoyed the heck out of them. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great series. He's really series, excited about this fourth one. He's actually got some I'll, pretty good reviews. I, I'm I'm waiting for the fourth one. I don't know when that comes out, but uh, yeah, I mean, the book itself's out already. I don't know about the audio book yet, though. Oh, the audio book, yeah. That and the guy he has reading the audio book, he's great. But he should really be giving <laughs> that guy a raise. <laughs> I think he will be. I don't know. He's complaining about overtime. I think uh, last I heard. So, and for who those who don't know, Glenn reads his own book. Just that's the <laughs> joke, everyone. Just you know, <laughs> just Henry so we're clear. Should, Henry should read some book books he's got a great voice i want to i want mark i want mark b to read a book yeah uh, without a pronunciation guy just wing it and go yeah <laughs> okay let's sleep. start with a pamphlet i can't do it without my button. insomnia mark b well, well i mean i'm doing the uh um uh, on thursdays i do the instructions of the game yeah the dramatic reading of the uh manuals for games oh yeah. yes where I've learned, learned the games are pronounced completely week. differently than I always thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> Page 233. We need an intro graphic for Mark B. Mispronounces. <laughs> Wasn't there a YouTube good. channel that's devoted okay. to that? They used to do those sarcastic mispronunciations of, of words. I remember seeing there was a whole series. Some of them were hilarious. And Mark's right up there. He's at that upper echelon of mis mispronunciation. Well, we, we strive for excellence in whatever field it may be here. Asparagus. It's like English not? is not my first language either, so. Now, you pronounced that correctly, Brian. That doesn't fit the theme, so. No, I know, but it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> wasn't, I was only saying asparagus, not because we're 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 talking about all this, though, but uh, wasn't that one of the funny things that we kind of picked up for a while there, asparagus? When we went it to was. The, oh, yeah, when we that... talk about something for too long. Yeah, most of the safe home. word. Yeah, yeah most most, word. most of the time it would be when we <laughs> when we when we're on to the fifth utility in OS nine that does the same thing as the first four. That yeah, then well, I got your Let me get on to the sixth. No, I'm just kidding. I believe it was last last called about six shows ago. If you check the index, oh. <laughs> is is there an asparagus <laughs> index? I'm not aware of. It, asparagus is I, noted in the show index for every show. I don't. I gotta check these indexes if, now. Yeah, I, I don't did know not if it know was that. That's hilarious. On the show, though, I think it was called by the. I think it was called in the in the chat. If I recall correctly. Yeah. And, and because I'm one are. of the one of the older people on the show, you wind up having a break because Ron has to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, the and pee the meter, other, I think we call it. The only other thing I've, I've <laughs> donated to the show is. Uh, Everybody drinking because I said we fax. We fax. Mm. <laughs> Can't imagine why somebody would want into our office on a Saturday. Uh anyway, hey, we're ready to move on to project updates. Oh, we have we have a we have a plan? Well, we do. Oh yep. sometimes some, some, I, some I got a few scribbles on a notepad here. Uh, cool. <laughs> uh let's see. Uh, who wants to go first? Me. Uh, Pat, get me, get me out of the way. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we can. We can see All it. All right. What we have here is Ron's garage, naturally. 
And you guys can come and take a look anytime you get a chance uh, then see what kind of crazy things I have nothing to do with. So I just put it <laughs> up and, you know, it gets there. In this case, I picked up a um, Black Beauty, looked at it and thought, what's wrong with this? Well, it, it didn't have any. Um, the embossing it, on the bottom. And, and nothing on the top. Oh, nothing and it only, has, it only has two screws in it, too. Yeah, and you see how a regular one looks at the bottom? Yeah. Only two. Was yeah, that's the old aluminum thin stick version, but yeah. yeah. And somebody dremeled the uh, pad off. The, the know, info in, in off of spot. it. Yeah. And, and Full so screen, it, please. And so, huh? Uh, that's to remark B. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the regular one, Radio Shack one. And it really is no different. It just doesn't have any... Uh, you know, it doesn't have a 26 number. Isn't it weird? It doesn't say the shack, and they took off whatever it really is with the... Yeah, but the holes are missing for the other two screws. Prototype? Yeah, yeah like they're yeah. not even in the, the molding. They're it, not punched it out. It works, right. and I have two of them. And you know the um, little machine that you use to punch letters out? and That's what they put on yeah, here. The Dymo. Yeah, oh, yeah Dymo tape. And yeah. it said left. The other one says right. And I, I can't find where the other one is right now. It's buried somewhere in the garage. But uh, I just thought it was weird. Yeah, and here we have a um, joystick show <laughs> to commemorate our other first show, right? Oh, right. Joystick right. Re recall. There. Yeah. Yep. Huh. So that's about it, guys. I'm not going to bore you with other stuff I do all the time. Okay. Uh, that's Thank curious. You. I don't know where that would have came from. Yeah, right. maybe it's. Do you remember if that was when you bought yourself at a Radio Shack store? Is it something you no, picked it came up? With, it came with a big load of uh, computer stuff I bought that, you know, got me into Ron's garage stuff back in the day. Um, this is like uh, 1997, 98. I bought uh, some, someone passed away. They had all this stuff in their basement, and the lady said, uh, Bring your truck. They wanted 800 bucks for the whole load, and they had, uh, you know, model T. Uh, Tandy 2000, 1000, two Tandy 2000s, a couple of other, uh, um, a bunch of, uh, you know, Model 1s, Model 2s. I got the whole load for 300 bucks. Wow. And, uh, yep. You won't find that anymore. I packed my no, van full. No. It had the uh, MM1 was in it. Um, oh, that's that's a rarity too. There's only yeah. about 500 of those made, um, I think. There were printers. There was all kinds of stuff. And um my mom, my 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 wife stayed with me when I brought it home. <laughs> That's the better part. Said you better get a grab. <laughs> That's a miracle. Yeah. yeah, I thought you said I got I got this. Uh, you were going to say you, this got you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Not, well, I, I uh, cleared it first. You know, uh, I I've been married a long time, and and the thing is, uh, whenever I do something, I always usually bring it across. You know, show talk to my wife about it and stuff and uh because you know it's like the how do you say um proper thing to do to have a partner stay with you and be happy you know you just need to do that and i do that and it's worked and she's very forgiving and very you know how do you say like even with the show i spend hours on saturdays away from her and she, you know and and i'm doing my own thing and she she does her own things, you know, and uh, it just works out. So I really I thank her for, you know, putting up with me all these years. And she has her own stuff that uh, I could probably talk about. We have mugs that you would not believe from all over <laughs> that she goes <laughs> on eBay and sells and stuff. And she cooks. She's a baker. She bakes cookies and stuff. She has her own little business. Pretty neat. Okay. Yeah. Um. Rick, you want to go next? Sure, why not? Um, I guess to, to kind of gel everything together, I put a blog post on my website, which is uh, computerconnect.com, one N. And on the top of the page, there will be, in fact, a blog entry. Um, let's see, I could, I could actually even uh, maybe put it on the screen and show you what I'm talking about. Uh, my store. Share my store. Oh, what do you mean? You can't share. Cool. 
Okay, well, my thing's broke. So I guess I won't share anything with you. Um, Is someone still sharing screen? Is that what happened? No. Well, no, I'm just trying to jump on my camera, but uh, Restream has has jumped the shark. So in any case, my website, computerconnect.com, only one N. There, if you, I posted a link to it. I don't know which okay. uh, URL exactly you want, but okay. Let's see. Here, here, I'll put in the chat the link to the whole blog post here. So the no idea, problem. the idea was to make this simpler by uh, just putting. Uh, Is the one called OS Nine Networking? Yeah, that's 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 the the one that kind of covers what I've been what I think uh, networking under OS Nine might look like. Spoiler alert. I stole it all from Unix, and uh, then dun, dun, to dun. to go with that, I enhanced my if up and host commands to follow the things that uh, that I've suggested here. So the links at the bottom of the article lead to um, the GitHub's for me and Henry, and also bootable sixty three and sixty eight oh nine images. This is COU with the, these things already pre installed, and then a uh, Coco nice. file is a 720k floppy, which on the SDCU mount is H1. And then you can copy, there's a script there to copy all the things onto your OS9. So you don't have to hand install all of these different things. Um, so I've just kind of congealed the projects so far all into one um, one place. So you can, you can come here and find all of the things, download the, the disk images, um, let's see where else are we at so as far as we know the hardware all works now if it doesn't a firmware upgrade should fix it if that doesn't do it i'll swap it out because i'm considering all of these things warranted so far because we haven't really you know spent any time on them i mean users haven't had time to figure out now rick does this have different drivers in it too or is it just a bunch of so actual at, at, program software like you run as a regular user under those things. At, at this point, this is all user space stuff. Uh, Henry's written a bunch of F dot utilities that do very basic things like um, configure the chip, run DHCP, do dig calls, but it's all just run in user space. So we're actually depending on the user to do the coordination. You either run one thing at a time or arrange it yourself. You know, obviously, this is very early days here, um, but it all works now. And so I figured this would be a good way to kind of get it out there and let people start playing with it. Hey, Rick. Um, for those people who don't know that you built a network interface card to Ethernet for the Coco, you might want to give a 25 word spiel on what this is for. Oh, we should start year. with that, I guess. Well, and like well, the you're blog assuming, post, you know, yeah. Who's going to count? Kind of heads into what I'm thinking about. Rather than just encapsulating stuff, you know, serial stuff and sending it over the Ethernet, I want to actually play with Ethernet itself. Right. So the Coco IO is an Ethernet card and it offers nothing. There's no um, there's no menus, there's no server to help you. It's just the Coco against the world. So it's it's a little bit of work. <laughs> Um, this is the, the old link. You want the Coco IOR out of the, the hardware stuff. It's the one you want now. Um, because in addition to the utilities on OS 9, um, Henry Strickland's written a boot thing. So the thing can boot your Coco. It can load several different operating systems or various demos. Uh, it's really quite the quite the thing he's got going. So it's, it's kind of a dual purpose card now. You can either use it as an Ethernet card under OS 9 or you can boot from it and do various other things. Which, now, you'll uh, be selling these uh, at, at Coco Fest in 48 days, right? Exactly so. And uh, this is the wrong link showing on the share right now. There's a, the $55 one has the EEPROM e e in it. Uh, uh, there you one? go, that one. The, the, that one. Here we go. Okay. So 55 bucks, you get the chip. 45 bucks, you don't get the chip because the chip cost me about 10 bucks. But what I'm doing is I'm going on and putting uh, Henry's Axion built in, which works for almost the whole world's Coco 3s and every Coco 2 I know about. I have a Coco 3 that won't boot from it, but I think that's my special child problem. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in any case, so you can either 
selected to boot and play with all the Axion boot stuff, which explains itself pretty much. Or you can not select it to boot and just use it as a network card from OS 9. Uh, there's also a link in my GitHub to a, a Deck B program that I wrote to make it do very basic things from Deck B. So, well, uh, what, would you be able to make videos showing how this works? You know, sh showing you like a tutorial type there. thing? Yeah. There yeah. are some videos around, but I need to make newer ones because this is all pretty new now. We've, we've accomplished a lot of things in the last couple of months that aren't really documented yet. So, this is my first, my first tries at getting it all documented. So my next question for you, Rick, is I'm going to be bringing out EOU 1.01 before Cocoa Fest. Would you like me to include this with it? Uh, sure, but it's it's like I say, it's mainly user space stuff. So, um, you know, no, it's fine. I'll just make a directory for it, and then people yeah, will watch your card. will have everything pre-installed. Yeah, I think it should be bundled there. Sure, please do, and uh, we'll we'll. Um, I'll I'll. I'll, I'll Talk contact you offline to kind of go through, you know, in case we have to write any additional docs or something like that. Right. But, and then we'll plan future updates to work under that. So it all. So would this work seems... with um, NetMate at all? You know, on an RS DOS area? Someone would NetMate's have to write a terminal something. program. That's not really what we're doing here. Exactly. We're kind of breaking out of that, do something with the terminal program mold to do, do something with Ethernet itself without any kind of intermediary terminal program host. Yeah, like you got uh, like listed that. here, some of the stuff that Henry's done, like ARP and DIG and PING and DHCP and NTP and FF, or TFTP, time so, viewer. And then you, like you mentioned, you've got stuff like streaming video audio demos and stuff too, so. It's actually, we've actually, I think, hit critical mass as far as software where it's gonna start rolling exponentially because there are enough different things to play with that don't require you to start from scratch. You know, the, when I first wrote dub, 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 everything was a peak and a poke and you start to chip and scrap. <laughs> and, and I barely got started and I ran out of room because I'd spent so much time peeking and poking and starting up things. Well, now I've managed to shove about half the work off on Henry's utilities. And now it's just finding time to get back to rewriting the web browser. Now that it can just simply do the web browsing part and not have to worry about Starting up a network and getting an address and put you know. Well, here's the first step into being able to crack NORAD. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, no one will understand us. We'll sneak right under the radar. Okay, well, I'll tell you officially right now, Rick. I have one ready for me at the fest. I'll buy one with the uh, ROM. Cool, cool. I will I will bring I'm gonna be including the OU. I probably should have one to test. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll play with occasionally. They're fun. I, I'm pretty excited. Mine's in the mail. Rick told me this morning. Yep. Yeah. So, so can you? Rick, you gonna have those at Cocoa uh... Fest? What was that, Henry? You gonna have those at Cocoa Fest? Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna bring eight or nine of them anyway. All right. So uh, the booting one. Do you have an, uh, the ability to um, update the? Yes, it can update itself. Okay. That's and cool. Henry is now working on a rescue utility in case it fails to update itself. And if that all falls apart, I'll I'll mail you a new ROM. <laughs> so cool. We'll, we'll keep it working. I'm going to warranty these things until we have enough hours on them all, you know, collectively to know. Okay, this is where the way it works, and and I can I say, you. okay, 90 days from now, you need to know if it works or not. Right now, I'm going to say if you've got one, if it don't work, we'll fix it. So, so what's the next item you're going to work on in, in your skunk works there where you're doing all this stuff that's going to be uh, the next project? Do you have one? I think you've got quite a bit more to do on this one. Like there's whole bunches of projects you could do based on this. <laughs> yeah, this this one needs a whole lot of work. It could it could get a wireless module. It could get all kinds of things. But all of that's serial going to mouse. take a lot of work. Yeah, serial mouse. I mean, <laughs> all of these things take a lot, take more work, and we need to get something going and get some, you know, so that's where, that's where Henry's proven absolutely invaluable because he's been doing a lot of the oh, front my, work software yeah. stuff. He's done all of the real work, and I'm still just doing demos. But uh, I'll take it. <laughs> and I you'll join when... in. It's it's getting fun now. I mean, OS nine now. You need a network type IF up. You need an address host www.aol.com. You get that address back. You know you can. So. Mm -hmm. The, the basic work of starting a network application is kind of present now. 
And now you can start worrying about what do I want to actually do now that I can connect to some remote. You mean like having links or server. something so you can browse? Exactly. You don't have to do it all yourself. You can just say, I want to connect to the server. It'll connect there. Now you're going to have to do something with it. But that's up to you. You know, it's because yeah. you actually have a little bit of a web browser, I can remember, web wrangler, I think you're calling it. It's a, yeah, you're, the, you know, the a limited one, but it does actually let you hit simple pages. Well, actually, I've deleted half of it to use all of these new utilities that have come out. And so now I've got room to expand it again, and I'm working on tables now. So that project is also moving forward. But like I say, you've got so many irons in the fire, you have to pick one. So <laughs> the one I picked with now was getting this this uh, generalized networking thing going. So do you have a 3D printer? Did you do your own, you know? Oh, yeah, I, I, I did these cases. I'm kind of proud of them. They require no fasteners. They snap together and pry apart. Nice. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of. Does it say connect on there with one end? No, I didn't put any <laughs> any lettering on it. Just some cooling <laughs> vents and uh, you know, the, the, the tandy memorable little side slots to unplug it if you've got the thumb grips yeah yeah if you've grips. got you know pepperoni juice on your hands or something you can just <laughs> so i have a i have a question here so i have this version of your card oh, the, the earlier one that doesn't have a run okay yep can this do what you guys are talking about or do i need to upgrade well it can do everything except boot by itself now you can put the same program that we boot in a slot on an SDC and then, you know, boot at four or whatever okay. to boot from the SDC with the card that doesn't have the EEPROM. But then if you have the card with the EEPROM, you don't need the SDC. So, okay. but then you don't have any local storage unless, you know, it, it's right. You can okay. see where this is all going, but. Yep. Hey Brian, the bootable one, you can literally put just the network card in the Coco directly, no MPI and have it boot off a server and load like OS nine or something. You don't have to have anything else. Okay. That's, that's the advantage of the ROM. Like I said, and as Rick said, you can put that ROM in the SDC, the MPI, and then you have both of them. And so that's right. the only advantage. Yep. So where, okay. where would your storage come from? You don't have RAM on the. Well, the this is, this is being worked on. Um, the idea would be you boot from the remote server and you get a space on the remote server to keep your status the files that you've done and how you've changed your configs and so forth. So oh. you don't need anything locally. It's all handled. It's, it's basically a diskless there. workstation. You're and literally booting like, off the network and app. everything. And yeah, and then yeah. Connect or Henry or whoever will take care of all of your storage for you so you don't have to do anything. But then at any point, you can just stick it in a multi-pack and say, okay, I'm doing my own stuff now and copy it all local and and. Then in three months, you get a bill for $700. <laughs> well, no, this, this, this is cocoa. We charge you cocoa prices. Oh, okay. Zero times as much as you can afford. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's where we're headed. I'm really happy where things have gotten just in time for the Cocoa Fest, I think. We can get it all polished up. and and uh, That looks there. like it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. And um one of the things that I'm thinking right now, I know it, it kind of parallels with uh, possibly with the Fujinet, uh, with, with the Fujinet thing, because I haven't put mine together yet, but it looks like what's happening with Fujinet is it's mostly handled, you know, it's it's mostly handled in the ROM, it's mostly handled in the ROM on the, uh, on the ESP32 itself. And I'm kind of thinking, okay, if there's a ROM on, the if there's a wrong on the coco io that can do the same thing is that something that can work together well, this this is where we're kind of at cross purposes because the fujinet is sort of the encapsulate things under a serial port so the coco has a really fancy serial port that that gives it things mm. where i'm going for we're running ethernet we don't have none of the fujinet niceness is available to us because we're just hopping on the Ethernet and away we go. It's raw. Yeah. So now we might we might get that kind of niceness by putting it in like the Fravio server, the the remote server that uh, that our boot connects to. But it would okay. be kind of fundamentally different than FujiNet because you wouldn't be providing the services locally. You would be going and getting them from somebody else out in the world. FujiNet, you Which, take your so let me see if I've got this analogy about right. FujiNet, 
you take your Model T out to the Model T Club where they've got a nice little where they've got a nice little weather for, uh, forecasting station and they've got a nice track for you to run around on. Um, Coco IO, you take your Model T out on um, I ninety five. Right, but you can only drive okay. on the shoulders. <laughs> but well, but you can always take the B roads and the B roads work and that's what we're playing with now with sending web browsers and so forth. <laughs> So, for instance, you can't do HTTPS because Coco doesn't have the processing to secure the web connection. Yep. But you can do HTTP. Mm -hmm. So it may be that Connect will stand up a proxy server so you can make your request through us and we will down convert HTTPS to HTTP and maybe mm -hmm. reduce size videos, reduce size pictures so that the Coco can understand it. The idea is to just keep it very simple and keep the cocoa very directly connected to what's going on. So if someone right. wants to write a LAN game, they're right there on the Ethernet. They aren't writing a translator oh, oh, to oh, a serial oh. port. It's to time a... to get. It's time to get some po some cocoa multi-user dungeons going. Exactly. Exactly. So, exactly, so. exactly. Well, you figure you figure one LAN, one one Linux box with a public IP can serve a whole bunch of cocos. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And uh, it just uh, hopefully yeah. it won't be so that you know when you be first turn it on, we have to wait twenty minutes for the page to come up. Then no, they come right up. It's, okay. it's, it's cool. <laughs> I wish I my screen cap isn't working. It comes right up. It's pretty pretty impressive. Curtis, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. I, I was going to say it's it's kind of like you know the Xbox or the PlayStation Five is now where you have to get a twenty four gig software update before you can start doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but remember the Coco's only got two megs, maybe. So yeah, the software. Right, right. You're, you're yeah. Gonna be ours will be faster than theirs, actually. Yeah, you're right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, your maximum From update is eight net load. <laughs> initial initial init to net load is uh, just minutes. That's no, really cool, but yeah, definitely reserve one for me. I'll I'll pick it up for me at the fest and pay you for it there. In the meantime, That's... well, we'll talk offline. I'll I'll see what a good cutoff date would be for me to put in a version of the software that you and Henry have done into EOU. Cause I can't just keep doing it as you guys are doing updates every right, second right. day. You got to pick a spot and say, this is it. Yeah. And then so the if you guys come up with a spot, that's got enough functionality that you're comfortable with and is pretty well debugged and bug free that, you know, people have tested it fairly extensively. That's probably a good cut off date. Excellent. Excellent. We'll talk. And uh, right. see, I guess anyone else, Send me an email if you might want one. I don't want to come up short, but I also don't want to spend hundreds and hundreds for extra stock that's not, <laughs> not going anywhere. So uh, thanks, Curtis, and anyone else. Let me know. Yeah. And hey, sure Henry, that. did you want one? You kind of sound iffy like you were thinking about maybe getting one. Yeah, I'm de I mean, I definitely would like one to play with. Yeah, Ron, too. So, Henry, some, some project software that might be able to be leveraged or something like this. There's a guy that wrote a Mastodon client for the Apple II. And it uses a serial link to a Raspberry Pi that acts as the proxy front end. So theoretically, <laughs> that could same thing could be done for the Coco. Mm. Well, if you can think of it, you can do it anymore. Oh yeah, it's just a matter really? of which how many hoops you have to jump through. So. Yeah. Well, at least it looks like you got at least three orders there, Rick, uh, that you'll have to fill. Cool. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Who does it now? It doesn't have to bring the Coco <laughs> more for everybody else. Okay, uh, next up, David Ladd. Okay, let me see if I can get my camera to work on the phone again. Is that working? Yeah, we see a blue Oops, something it. with something on it. I have to wait okay. for uh, Mark oh. to zoom, zoom it up. <laughs> All righty. So, I've been accumulating stuff and haven't gotten around to showing some of the stuff off. This I've had for quite a while. I don't know if anybody recognizes this device. Um, yeah. It's a Coco uh, No, I'm just kidding. This is one of the SCSI to SD boards. Um, I, was hope, I was hoping it was a grease weasel. Oh, I got one of those for you, too. Um, oh, God. <laughs> so... This is uh, the version 4.2. Ed Snyder made a small run of these for me and Alan Huffman. Um, I got these originally, one for my MM1 and one for my Coco for use with the Kenton controller, which, of course, I never got around to ever 
making up a cable for. But, um, and this has been extremely useful for getting my MM1 partially up and running currently. So um, what exactly do you do? Put, uh, put a card in full of software and then shove it over to your SCSI drive or you're dumping stuff from the drive to the, or both? Well, in this particular case, this is to replace a hard drive. So okay. um, the SD card is kind of like the um, IDE of the super IDE where there's no separate files on this SD card. It is literally this converts the SCSI to the raw access on the micro SD card. And so you, basically you look at it on a PC. It's just no, raw sectors not, not, on the card, right? Not unless you have the firmware set up in such a way that you can partition the card and you create a partition on the SD card to where then you can use like the tool shed tools. And oh, then okay. under Linux, you do like the OS9 dir space um, slash dev slash SDA5 or something like that. And then you can see the files that are in that volume. Um, but as far as standard windows, um, you know, just open the directory and copy files. No. Okay. So this is just literally to be direct, direct SCSI. Now, the Sorry. other thing that I just recently got, let me move that out of the way. Now I need to, ah, now this is an item that Curtis covered on the news. This is the blue SCSI. Now, this is where you put the SD card. Um, in this case, the blue SCSI um, is similar. It's designed to be a hard drive, but the SD card has hard disk images that you put on it, and then you will label them specifically for um, you know, what the SCSI ID number it should be, the sector size, and then you, know, you contain the data that's in it. Um, so if you're putting the SCSI ID, you could literally mount like six virtual hard drive images at once, right? Should be able to do all seven. Okay. Because remember the SCSI bus, you can have up to eight devices on it, which right. of course the controller is one of those devices. So you can have up to seven devices besides the controller. So, um, but um, I've been running into some issues with my MM1 with certain size disks at the moment, which we'll probably go over that if you've got that other stuff in the news. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> um, but this is handy in the fact that uh, this is the current version, the version two, which was of, uh, what was that? Uh, Pull it down October of 2023. Right. And this one supports what's called initiator mode which you can turn this into being the SCSI controller and you can back up SCSI hard drives with it. Nice. Which was the reason I originally got this was for backing up SCSI drives, which I've already backed up, well, at least the ones that were still working that I had. Um, What's the green board on it? That's the Raspberry Pi Pico. Oh. That is the heart of the unit. But the reason why the it's called the blue SCSI is the first version, version one, used the blue pill development board like the first version of the Grease Weasel did. So yeah, they, and we should they, mention they, the blue SCSI is actually a cross-platform device. I mean, it's being sold for Macs and all kinds of other systems too. So anything that used to use SCSI back in the day basically can probably use it. Right. Bring, bring, bring um, so now we don't... So now we don't need the blue pill. Go. They can't be found legitimately, apparently, right? Because they're so hard to, they're all fake. Well, the blue pills, the biggest issue is, is a lot of the sellers, um, the blue pills, almost all the components are fine. It's usually the microcontroller that they're using the clones of, which are not 100% compatible. Right. Um so this but, removes all of that problem. Just... Right, which is why they went with the uh, um, 
the is, whole is... Uh, uh, Pico because obviously they're you know those are cheap. Is that soldered Here's... on or is it on a um? Nobody's cloned them yet. Soldered. Right. <laughs> yes, it's soldered to the board. Okay. Okay, so here's the other thing that I had gotten. I actually acquired two. These are the most current versions of the GoTech drives. Um, I have a black one, which is the one that I usually carry with me to work on PCs and the Coco or the MM1, and I need a replacement drive to temporarily get files off in case the system's got a bad drive. Um, these are great because they will emulate a floppy drive, five and a quarter or three and a half. Um, these will support drive zero or drive one, double-sided, both high density, double density, and I believe they might do extended density. Um, but this particular model comes with the, the rotator knob, and the OLED display. So you actually get a display of the files that are on the, the uh, USB drive that you can then select through. And if you don't have one of these and you're running off of re a real floppy drive controller only, these are valuable. Um, I believe uh, Terry did a video on uh, a previous version of one of these. Um, and yeah, they're they're great to have if if you don't have one. And those are once again are multi platform and work in a ton of systems. Yes, um, people with the Migas, um, Tier City Model One Threes, Poco. Yep. Would that have a Pi in it also? No, it's got a different type of microcontroller in it. It's I don't know what one. Um, you're more than happy to go to the the GoTech site and. Um, check out what the hardware specs of the different revisions are. All right. Now, here comes a nice little box. Of course, Your favorite kind of box. Yep. All right. So I got some 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 multiple things of toys over here. So I don't know if anybody recognizes this. This is uh the uh, um. Is that a game what's, board? What, um. Well, it's a rom cart by. Mark J. Blair. Um, we've covered these before. Um, I had some done. And then, of course, I've got a ZIF socket installed on this one. Um, but I did get um, an order of the boards, which is why I did this one up with the ZIF socket. And then to try out GLC PCB's printing service, with the resin printers, I wanted to see what one of the cartridges cases that was specifically designed for his his PCB. And so far, these came out really nice. And I, I have to say, based on the PLA ones that I've done myself and a couple other people printed for me, this resin print came out really nice. But no, no sanding needed, huh? Well, they pre-do that mm. when when you order from GLC PCB. So they'll cure it, they'll sand it. Um I think these two pieces was three bucks total between the two, I believe. And then you just I better put this ziff down so I can actually close this. But as you can see, closes nicely. And then of course you have your spot for your screw. Um, so, but yeah, that was my other Coco related acquisition was one of these, these, uh, printed cartridges. How big is that, uh, ROM? Is that, there's no ROM on it, but I believe, that board, um, I mean. well, the board, I believe can hey, handle, hey. um, I believe it can do 16. K and then you do banking by the jumpers that's on it. Right. So, but yeah, it's just a standard thing. And if you really wanted to, so it doesn't um, do the thirty-two K ROM option on the Coco Three. You mean? Um, it probably could if you wired instead of the jumper. If you directly ran the wa a wire on the back of the PCB mm -hmm. to that extra address line, then 
you could do um, the 32K sized ROMs. But right now, it's basically designed to be a, a Coco 1 2 style one then with the 16K. Max. Right. Right. 16K. And then, of course, you could use like I've used the 27C 512s, and I just bank between, I think, what, four 16K banks, right? Yeah. Um, so let's see here. The other things I was getting into, another GLC PCB box here. Um, so this one is something that I wanted to get into, which is the TZX Duino, which is the tape Duino style uh, um, project where you can do the digital um and then you just hook the computer up to it and i've i got the the boards made i want to do the project because obviously it's getting harder to find tape tape drives that are worth a crap these days <laughs> to use on the coco so i got those and then i also um downloaded uh david woods um coco um or not coco david woods 6809 version 2 um SBC which is stands for single board computer um we actually interviewed him on Coco Talk a few years ago um i think it was 2018 or 2019 i don't remember which episode um i got these made cuz i thought i'd gotten one from him and I couldn't find it, so I figured, well, I better get some boards made and at least make one. And then, lo and behold, I was doing, been doing some cleaning <laughs> after what happened last year, which I'm not getting into. But um, I ran across this yeah. in a box. <laughs> as soon as I can get it out of the bag, which is hard to do with camera in the way. So a fully populated, ready to go board from David. Hmm. So it's got the two serial ports. Um, it's got the SRAM, which is 256K. And it only has an eight support for an 8K ROM only because the, the 8K is at the very end of the memory map. The rest of it is all from the SRAM. And then, of course, you've got the 6309 and the serial port and Ooh, the, the two. number? Um, hold on, I need to take my glasses off so I can actually take a look at it here. As soon now, where's my flashlight? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I've been there. So it's a 6868-1 is the serial chip that David used. Yeah. It has an MC lettering in front of it, so it's a Motorola chip. Um, I've got to put my glasses back on. All right, so now, um, but yeah, this is one of the things I wanted to toy with because um, I wanted to learn how to start off with making a 6809 code that you have to set up everything yourself without having, you know, like basic setting up the reset vector and the, mm. the you know, all that stuff. I want to learn how to do that all my, on my own. And I figured something like this would be the best way to go because, well, obviously there's only one ROM and you have to do it all yourself. Mm. So, um, but that's pretty much um I did the blue scuzzy, so I think that's pretty much all of the things that I've been slowly stockpiling that I've uh, been wanting to work on. So any questions? <laughs> I have a question, David. Yes. Have you ever maybe considered a um a career in hand modeling. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> I th think you missed your calling, David, after that presentation. I, I really do. Uh-huh. 
All right. So All right. cool. So you got you got a lot of stuff on the go then. Oh, I've been <laughs> been collecting stuff. It's just uh well, you know, life happens and the last few years has not exactly been the uh most um how do I want to put it? The most uh, convenient for me to, uh, you know, work on stuff. So, yeah. welcome back. Uh, All but, right. So, hmm? that nope. It, David? I'm, yep. That's okay. That's it. I'm just so, just rattling wants, off. Who wants to go next, Frederick or Brian? Go ahead, Brian. I just have a few show and tell items and. I can do it quick. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, two hands. <laughs> um, okay. So you guys are always kind of giving me a hard time about the fact that, you know, when I go to show stuff or whatever, they're like, you know, backing up the truck, right. Or, you know, loading up the truck, load of stuff and everything. So I figured it was time that I actually uh, got around to buying a truck for all my stuff. <laughs> Does it have a backup <laughs> Oh, Mark, don't forget to zoom him up, too. <laughs> yeah. So. You bought um, that big rig, uh, Tandy <laughs> semi. So, so here yeah. we are. I finally there got it. Stuff. There it is. <laughs> here's, here's, the, here's the truck there. So. <laughs> it's a That's just one truck. of your fleet, though, isn't it? It's yeah, the Canadian I, uh, version. I actually, uh, I saw this uh, out there. <laughs> And, yeah, you're uh, right. That I is a Canadian version. It's got the French on it. Yep. Right. So legal in Quebec. There you go. What's the but, serial uh, number? It is, on it? it is kind of uh, it is kind of interesting though. I mean, it, it was actually I thought it was just a smaller little you know like Hot Wheels style thing or something like that. I was kind of surprised how big it was. I had never actually seen one of these. Um, the part that's kind of cool, if you guys have ever seen one, is it uh, you you can put batteries in it, and actually inside the box here is a little baggie with some little green uh, cams. And uh, there's four of them, and they're kind of shaped differently. And what the, what it actually does is you put the cam, uh, you, you put it in the base of this where the front wheels are at. Well, and when you turn it on, as it rotates, it the, the cam makes the uh, makes the wheels go like this. So it'll do different patterns and things like that and do circles on the, on the, on the floor and stuff. Oh, here we go. Here's, here's what it's talking about. So you can see here there's... This one here kind of makes it does a little loop de loop. This one does a circle. This one makes it go in a square pattern. This one does zigzag. So you put the little cam inside the uh, inside the tractor portion of the of the semi. And uh, although I was kind of reading this though, and I don't know if this is going to apply for many of us though, it says not recommended for children. So I'm not sure how, <laughs> under the ages of three. No, so under three, we're good. Okay. <laughs> see, see now after you've shown us that, now I know how all those self driving trucks work. There you go. Right. You have those Damn. Even the show is old enough to play with that truck. <laughs> so I thought you guys might get a kick out of that. So that was a, uh, um, I I picked that up. So yes, now I have a truck to haul all my uh, all my oh, goodies in here. So that's, that's uh, big enough down to here. hold my Ferraris. There you go, see? <laughs> perfect. Um, this wasn't really listed under Coco, but I was I I'm always looking for magazines and stuff, and this one caught my eye. Computer, computers, electronics, and it re caught my eye because it had the uh, uh, the CGP two hundred and twenty on the front of it. And the Canon or the Tandy? Oh, this is the, the Tandy version right here. Um, and uh, so I I went ahead and bought just this single copy though. Um, but I was just going to show you. I I had never heard of. You. Do you guys remember this uh, particular subscription? I do. I yeah. yeah, I've got some of those. Okay. Uh, this one here is February of 1984, and I don't, you know, I'm assuming because of the era, they probably covered a lot of the computers. But I, as I was thumbing through it, though, uh, not just because of the CGP 220, but anyway, this was a here's an advertisement on the inside for this class, uh, this technology class, and <laughs> and when you bought when you bought their package or signed up for it, it says training includes. Um, all of this equipment, uh, 16K computer, a modem, a breakout box, a digital multimeter, and ex an ex exclusive NRI discovery lab. But uh, there's your kit. <laughs> the kit that comes with the uh, comes with the color computer in it. Oh, I remember um, that was in the ad. Um, they also did a here's a here's here's an article they talk about with the the video text and you, and they talk about some of the different uh, video text. Uh, 
um, systems out there. I haven't read the full article yet. It was kind of just thumbing through it. Um, here's the actual review itself of the uh, of the printer. Uh, they go through its functionality, how it works and everything, and they give some examples of different printing that you can do with it. Um, and then I saw this, uh, the lastly here, they talked about uh, analog sensors for your personal computer. And they talk about different systems though, but they specifically break out and talk about the joystick on the color computer here uh, with the 6821. Um, and let's see, I think, uh, let's see here. Yeah, they, they talk about the they talk about the joystick and its input, and they even give some little sample programs where they're uh, showing how the input and how you can use the potentiometer as a potential uh, sensor uh, for a project that you might be working on. So I, I don't know. I thought that was kind of a interesting uh, magazine. I might keep my eyes open for a few more, but I guess I don't know how frequently um, they featured the, uh, the the Tandy Color Computer in their uh, in their articles, but. If, if I remember correctly, I think the earlier versions of that magazine was uh, uh, Radio Electronics. Oh, okay. Yes, it was. Yeah. And then they became uh, Computer? Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I, uh, in my youth, I had subscribed to them for many a years. Okay. And I'm digging what? in my closet now for my box of them that I still have. Yep. <laughs> do, do, you have do you have some of the little... you have some of the little 6 by 8 size Radio Electronics to go with your... No, it was full size. Uh, ones. <laughs> full size. Ah, here they are. Here's some of them. I, I was big on electronics magazines as a child. I had all of them. Oh, they didn't get any lighter over the years. <laughs> so here's a, a random box. I like yourself. Oh, it might have been yeah. popular electronics that did that because radio electronics, I knew, I know we were getting radio electronics in the 80s. Yeah, radio yeah, electronics yeah. and yep. electronics now eventually merge, but uh Yeah. Well, I just like the headlines, you know, video text takes off, floppies are on the way, you know. <laughs> the future yeah. is now. Right. right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but I re I remember that cover. I've got an um I've got one of those somewhere. I don't know if it was part of my uh like uh, uh color computer collection or if that was mm. left over from radio electronics. Anyway. Okay. Did you want me to wait for a second, Mark, or you want me to go nah, on? Okay. I've got uh, too many boxes to go through. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I just thought it was kind of interesting. Then they had some, you know, some good articles in there talking about the color computer. Um, let's see here. So um, I've been slowly uh, kind of acquiring some of the chips that are I inside. I did find one. The... Oh, would you... why don't you go ahead and uh, bring yourself up there real quick so... Oh, there we go. Yeah. Not about Coco, but uh, this was a May 84, May 90, 94. Okay. Yeah, as all the magazines all collapsed into one and then finally died, right? But yeah, they were, uh, yeah, they used to be, yeah, it says right here, combined with radio electronics. So yeah, it used to be uh, uh, a pure electronics one where you could actually buy like the kits and make amplifiers and all kinds of stuff. Very cool. Right. How many magazines lived off of that? The author had a kit to sell. So he wrote an article for the magazine to publish, <laughs> to push yeah. his kit. And that way the magazine got the article without having to pay anything. <laughs> and the author got a few bucks from selling the kit. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I want to write to some of those and see if they still have any. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been kind of slowly trying to acquire some of the chips that are maybe unique inside the, the deluxe cocoa. And uh, here's the most recent edition that I have there. If it's going to focus in there, uh, this is the uh, the serial chip. So this would be the sixty five fifty one right. serial chip that's in there. And uh, I bought two of them. So um, the price is pretty decent on them. So. Uh, got got those in, in addition to some of the other chips that I've uh, slowly uh, kind of acquiring. So just just got that one there. We all realize this is a Commodore number, right? A Commodore yeah. number on there. Okay. Stuck in our cocos from oh. <laughs> time long ago. Moss te it's Moss technology, right? It's... Unless you got the Rockwell version. 
And then the last thing that I want to show, you guys have all seen these before, but I've been wanting to get another one, been watching for a while, and and he finally did get it. He did put one up on his site mm. there, so uh, Zipster's uh, uh, Mini MPI. So, and uh, the the other one I have is was when he was still doing the white case. This has that uh, that kind of gray speckled granite sort of, uh, or however you want to call it, look to it. So it's kind of kind of cool, but uh, nice beefy legs on the bottom, so it sets up the right height. But uh, yeah, I've been wanting to get another one, and I saw one pop up the other day, and so I got got the second one that I've been wanting to get. So. And of course, he sends it with the uh, the power supply that goes with it. So, but uh, that's all I'd like to share today. Cool. Just going through these two boxes, I've got the Red Electronics going back to like eighty one, eighty two. No, uh, they're in the seventies. I still got them back here, going back into the seventies, all the way through the nineties. There you go. Ugh. I never throw anything away. <laughs> that's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time <laughs> yeah right. That's right. <laughs> so i'm sure i've got that episode somewhere because i uh that issue because I, I recognize that cover so i'm sure it's in there somewhere very good thank you all right let me flip some screens and let's see last but not least we got frederick Yes, well, um, I've been obsessing over my project lately that I forgot to do some videos, and I just posted one uh, for uh, the ACIA. Uh, but uh, no, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. It's the famous MMU that um, I've been pulling my hair out. That's why I'm bald. <laughs> uh, but um, I've um, started with uh, trying to prototype it with um, Logisim. And that's the uh, the concept of it is uh, perfect. It works number one, but when I implemented it, there was some issues. And I figured there was probably something with my wiring, but apparently it wasn't. Uh, but uh, anyways, I'm just gonna show you a bit what the circuit looks like for the MMU. And this is where am I? Oh yeah, can you see? Yes, you can. Yeah, I go here, and then you had clicked on the uh, on the on the presentation, not the actual soft, uh, software. Anyways, uh, there's a lot of wasted space, if I can say, uh, for for little things. Like for example, these two chips here. It, well, this pair of uh, register of chips is a red is, is register basically. It's the uh, FF nine zero, and all I need is uh, bit number six for the MMU enable, and FF nine one, and all I need is bit zero for task uh, to select between task zero and one, and uh, <clears throat> if I want to be. Uh, uh, compatible to the uh, Coco 3's MMU. Um, and then after that, I've got a uh, multiplexer here that will select between, depending if the MMU is enabled or not, uh, and other conditions, which is set by over here, the uh, PLD, uh, which is a 22V10. Uh, um, has a couple of condition that says, okay, you are going to activate your uh, your multiplexer to say, I'm currently um, uh, accessing a task or I am accessing a particular region of memory at that time. And over here, I have um, the RAM, which is oversized for nothing, but I couldn't find anything smaller. All I need is 16 bytes, right? It's for task zero and task one to remember uh, the uh, the blocks where they're going to go in, in memory. And I've got here a buffer to uh, bidirectional buffer to uh, to write to and read the uh, uh, the RAM itself. So that was uh, when I want to write, for example, at, I need to write uh, a certain block number, then it has to be a specific data, right? I need to enter the data somehow. 
and these um, two um, uh, multiplexers are depending again if uh, the conditions are met uh, will determine if it's uh, 64k addressing or the MMU um, giving uh, all the, the the range itself of the uh, two meg the two megabytes you can address. Um, if we go to uh, well, let me see what else do I have? Yeah, let's go let's go to the other camera. I'll switch back to the terminal later. So basically, uh, from the whole board, if I zoom out. You got your clock, you got your uh, uh, ROM and RAM, you got your CPU, uh, and you got your ACIA, uh, inter uh, interrupt, uh, and uh, priority interrupt encoder. This is the MMU. I mean, it's oh, this is the extra RAM that hasn't been hooked up. That's 512K. Um, basically, the issue I had once was strictly the wiring was perfect everything had to do with the programmable logic uh, i've been racking my brain at trying to figure out is this the issue that's why i've used um, uh, logism that's why i've used other tools also and i've used the scope i've used the probes and whatever the tools i had on hand and uh, but i started to see a pattern and once I saw the pattern of the the bug, all the multiple bugs, because once I found the bug, I found another one, Re resolved that bug, found another one, and it kept going like that. <laughs> this sounds like programming. <laughs> yeah. Right. Basically. And then I found the pattern of my the error of my ways, so so to speak, because I I keep fixing something, break something else, but I, but I couldn't understand why it it broke, but in the end. There was a, a specific pattern. So if I go back to um, to the uh, terminal uh, that's hooked up to my uh, my machine, um, when you do memory dump of uh, block zero, which is at address zero, it's everything is every all the RAM in the first sixty four k. Well, not sixty four, fifty six k are uh, initialized to zero. So if you do a dump at zero, everything is at zero. That's fine. But if I wanted to, uh, let's go, for example, uh, look at the map of the, of the memory. At the, uh, the, the bottom, you see the task registers. So task zero, you have uh, the block zero is assigned to uh, zero, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then task one has eight, nine, 10, 11, well, a, B, C, D, E, but I, I put it back to F. And the reason being my program, my ROM itself is at E00, which is the last block. If I change it to something else, I just basically pull the rug from under the, th the feet of the, the, the BIOS itself. And um, so if I want, for example, to test uh, to enable the MMU, I just go and poke uh, FF90 and give it the value four of 40, which is bit six, and the MMU is enabled. Now, how do I know if it's going to work? Well, I can always uh, poke a value at uh, the um, registers for the tasks, poke FFA0, is the first block for the task zero, and I'll give it some arbitrary number. And uh, I don't know, let's say 11. And if I go back and do a dump at address zero, whoops, forgot the P, it's no longer zeros, it's a bunch of random values. If I want to replicate at block uh, zero, at block one, I want the same exact thing. Dump, uh, no, poke. Uh, FFA1, exactly with 11. Now, we know that the first values are 9D and AE, for example. So if we do a dump 
at zero, uh, uh, sorry, dump 2000 should be the same thing. So 90 AE, 90 AE. So I'm just, it's a mirror basically. If I do a dump of FF00 because I'm literally uh, using the same address space as the Coco3 or all the Cocos basically. Um, at address FFA0, you have both 11s. Um, if I want to switch to task one, okay, let's go to um, uh, oak uh, FF91 and one because that's bit zero. And now I am presently at uh, looking at something else, which would be uh, block uh, number eight. So if I do a dump zero, because that would be the first block of task one, it's an another set of of um, of garbage, basically. Well, next thing I'll do is I'll implement a ID memory uh, sort of routine just to tag all the RAM according to the block numbers just to see if it uh, so that visually you can tell if it actually is uh, the proper uh, bank number if you will but uh, and to prove that you can actually pull the rug off under uh, from under, uh, under the feet of the BIOS where I can always go Wait a minute, what task am I? Task one, right? Uh, dump FF00. Yep, task one. So I just go and um, poke FF um, AF and give it something else, 33. System is frozen because it cannot no longer find any software. So just pull a reset and uh, dump FF00. At boot time, I initialize the values uh, of the uh, bank of the bank registers, of all the, of the task registers, to uh, from zero to um, to uh, well. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, for, six, for the five. viewers that are not familiar with the MMU and the Coco, if you take a look at the line that starts with FFA0, so the first eight positions are the 8K bank numbers for task zero, and the last eight are the ones for task one. And That's you'll right. notice that the last bank of each task has a zero seven. So basically, he's got the same code loaded. So if you switch tasks, the same code is still mapped in that upper chunk. And this is kind of how OS9's uh, interrupt system with the vector page works as well. But it enables you to have code that's common, even though every single other address of 56K is completely changed. And it's accessing completely different RAM, but you can instantly switch back and forth just by changing the task register. Yeah, precisely. So I my last issue that I had, which was we're really weird, is only when I had the MMU enabled uh, and I had... Um, for example, I was writing um, for a, a value to one of the uh, task re re registers. If it was even, no issues. If it was, if it was odd, it would replicate that same value that was writing to the task register to the uh, FF91 register, which is I found what what was going on was really weird because it had no. Uh, really correlation to anything and again i went back to the pld and i noticed that there was an issue an issue with the um uh, timing because the, the one of the registers that, that you write to is a positive edge uh triggered to uh to write to the register itself but um, it was expecting a negative edge uh, pulse to write to it. So, so, but somehow there was this timing issue that that was overlapping at a very precise moment that it gave a window to write to that register. So when I just changed those two values to say, okay, go to negative edge and not positive edge. Everything worked well and problem solved.
I'm sure if I did a graph of the timing diagram, I would see the problem even clearer. But I just, it was like, it's got to be that. Yeah. So that's, um, that's pretty much it. So I got a functional MMU that is emulating the MM the Coco 3s. Uh I'd say pretty much one to one. That's cool. All right. So and right now you've only got five twelve K RAM enabled, but you will be able to use two meg later on. You currently oh, yeah. I think got it running at two megahertz, but you'll be able to crank that up a bit faster later on too. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a, just nice. a question of wiring it up, but everything is there. I got well, I got five, tw uh, two more five twelve chips right here. They're just not wired. I just wanted to make sure that it works. Unfortunately, Patrick? though, the only thing that I was not able to do was to get um, a thirty two task. Uh, <laughs> yeah, booster to to work. It's just it's a bit more complex. Uh, I figured that I'll do version one. <laughs> right. out, and yeah. then we'll see later <laughs> make your feature creep gradual not all at once yeah, yeah, exactly. right, it's creep is the key word here <laughs> so frederick um you're yes. gonna uh turn this into a printed uh pcb uh, yeah, i am ready to do uh to do one i was debating if i should uh do a card for my um uh bus button for, for my passive oh, back lane. oh mm -hmm. there you go yeah Oh, there. So it's it's passive backplane. It's uh, even has headers that I can put on a uh, breadboard, so I can mm -hmm. just simply uh, tap into all the signals. And uh, my camera is a uh, AI is a bit uh, freaky. It's, it's yes. And, it's AI -ing on you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also, uh, or maybe I should do a standard single board computer, so that ways I could probably. Um, you know, offer some boards with some people if they wanted to try it. Yeah, well, see, see, so, so yeah, so, just uh, I, I could see people that might want to, you know, up their OS nine game, you know, go into something like this, so they could have more like an MM one or something without actually trying to find one of the five hundred that might be there. Anyway, that's all. Rick, go ahead. I was going to say, so what you need to do with your bus is you move the SAM and the VDG onto an external card, so you've emulated a PC style video card on your 60x09 computer and then life is complete yeah well <laughs> you know what's interesting is i found this guy on uh, youtube that took a 6845 not a 47 and which is a, a crt controller and he actually adapted a vga for it and added some extra modes to it uh that's not in part of the uh, chip itself and could do up to six, I think up to two fifty six colors if you wanted to, but he made it to two to to uh, to sixteen, uh, up to six forty by four eighty, and a, a few versions of resolutions under that. Right. With because that as shape. you because as you bring up the CPU speed, this becomes practical. Yeah, or on a Coco, you could do it on a Coco, but it's not practical. It's just not running fast enough to to do the updates but hey you don't have that problem <laughs> yeah and I, I plan to run it at least at four megahertz so, so i will test it see if i can push it that fast and uh, see if the rest of the hardware can follow also i mean uh, liquid yeah. nitrogen you'll be fine yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> i can't even winter, you know, same from thing a, from a flask and yeah <laughs> The whole uh, to use Frederick's uh, board, you'll have to move above the Arctic Circle and right, right. <laughs> or get some liquid nitrogen like Steve on. Burke has and pour it in here. <laughs> hey, Frederick, you need to make a uh, cocoa compatible slot or a couple of them so you can reuse the existing cards. Oh, well, there you go. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Especially, especially things like uh, you know, like the, the network cocoa cards. or something. Yeah, cocoa, <laughs> exactly. You don't have to build that from scratch, you just add it on. Yeah, of course. At least one compatible slot. Yeah. <laughs> then it'll be four. Yeah, yeah. then you can put a multi pack in your one. And then compatible David Ladd will get him be 16. But... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll have to investigate how the multi pack works. Like maybe I could put multiple at the same time, but we'll see. I got to say, a 6309 from scratch is really interesting. So go. <laughs> All right. Um, ready for a commercial break? 
Yeah, and then game on challenge after that, or okay. Um, are there any more project updates? Huh? No. Okay. Nope. Hey, Amy. Hey, Taylor. We're watching the Coco Nation show. Yeah, we are. Woo! You should too. Hello everyone, it's your good buddy, your good pal Amigo, and joined by that dastardly The Brent from ARG Presents. You're watching Coco Nation. I feel like that should have been longer. The Coco Nation Show would like to thank the following patrons. Alex Gayer, Brandon Donahue, Brian Walsh, Brian Weasler, Karen Askham, Coconut Bob, Daddy Burrito, David Ladd, Derek Smithson, Diego BF109, Don Barber, Eric Canales, Frederick Sigard, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Wabke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Justin Larson, Ken Reichard, Kevin Holloway, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, R. Allen Murphy, Retro Tech Time, Rob Binman, Rocky Hill, Steve Batson, TJB Chris, Tom C, Tom Gunderson, Tom S, and William A. Thing. Thank you so much, patrons. Welcome to everybody's favorite segment, Who's New to Discord? Zany Zapper says, Hi all, I'm Eddie S. Got my start in computers in spring of 1982 with a Coco 1, 4K, eventually upgrading to 32K then 64K. Parents were teachers, and dad picked up a couple of Coco 2s for them. Bit later I got a TRS-80 Model 1 from a buddy for $40, then dad got an Apple 2C. I still have the original Cocos and Model 1, all work. But a lot of other retro systems I had were lost when a tornado hit the storage facility they were in, and my mom threw out a lot after dad passed away. So lately trying to pick up some replacements and other systems I missed out on. The previous bios were edited for time. Thanks to, Boysen, Glenside Computer Club, Micro Hobbyist Frederick, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, Tandy Color Computer 3, and the Coco Nation patrons for boosting the server. Please consider joining Discord and visiting the welcome section to read these bios in full and see what the community has to offer. Just go to discord.thecoconation.com. See you on Discord! Welcome everybody to the Coco Nation Game On Challenge of the Week results video. This week we played Bust Out, or Super Bust Out, depending on which page of the manual you look at. We had a total of 15 players. Tied for 14th place, we had Mark B and Mr. Dave 6309 with 14. Low level, 161. <laughs> Canadian Retro Things, 169. Sloopy Malibu, 530. C. Duris, 629, Jim Rye, 1297, Mike, 1398, Nerf Herder, 1400, Mark O, 1485, L. Curtis Boyle, 1618, Shenley, 1659, Dr. Ted, 3120, Fred Provencia, 3334, and this week's number one score belongs to Tasman with 6072. Thanks, everybody. Surprise, surprise. We'll see you again <laughs> next week. Old school. And the Coco Nation salutes.
Tasman. Salud. 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 All right. So that was Bust Out that we played this week. Or Super um, Bust Out. Or Super Bust Out, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> now, I did find a couple of reviews of this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one was very short. It's in, uh, what is this, 80 US Magazine. Um, basically, they just say Bust Out's a breakout twin, but better than the original. Gravity options improve on the original. Because they're like doing 19 mm-hmm. different games in this article. They also have a rating system that they gave it a fair across the board on everything. So Get I don't two know. Two lines what... in the article. <laughs> and, yeah. a, and one line hey. in, the, in the review box. Rocket. Okay. Hey, that's better than nothing. Now, the really interesting review was from the January 1982 Color Computer News. Ah, so Radio Shack's taken a popular video game and done a very poor job of implementing it on the color computer. (laughs) For for the the most part, this game stinks. (laughs) That's not how you spell it. That's what I really think. (laughs) Two basic flaws with a K. I can tell this is not a rainbow review. For the most part, this game stinks. Two basic flaws are the paddle movement and the ball movement. (laughs) <laughs> like the two-dimensional movement of the uh, paddle because all it did was allowed you to knock the ball backward off the screen and he said that the ball <laughs> movement was choppy now the interesting thing is that he then goes on to talk about how he wrote a 4k version of bust out, or of uh breakout which is listed beside it and how it's so much better than this version. <laughs> we got our next game of the week then. Um, <laughs> and his uh, final conclusion of it, it's worth only a small fraction of the $30 Radio Shack wants for it. <laughs> so I think that's a negative review? Yeah, but he did say that even the version that he made was so bad that he wouldn't dare try to sell it. <laughs> but it was better He's than He's saying it's official. better than Bust Out. But it's better than Bust Out. Now, I actually have to disagree there. (laughs) You do recognize the name of the reviewer too, Ken. It's actually a game writer on the Coco that wrote this review. Andrew Hubble. Yeah, he's the same guy who did like The Frog. and Yeah. yeah. So did anybody type this in yet? Uh, No, I have not (laughs) typed it in yet. (laughs) I only just found this last night, so. Only 4K required. It should run an MC10 too. Yeah, Yeah. where'd you find it? And the first thing he does is the high-speed poke. It's yep. on the Color Computer News January uh which one is this? 82. January 1982. Oh, I I I have I have breaking news. Jim Gary has already converted it to the Coke uh, the MC10. <laughs> <laughs> and improved it. And it'll be uploaded to the archive later today. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh yeah, he did not really hold back in this review. <laughs> Now, I thought that actually having the gravity on it uh, really gave a different dimension to the game because yep. honestly, just having another bust out clone where you can just move across the bottom back and forth. Right. I, I mean, he talks just... about he talks oh. about knocking the ball backwards off the screen, which makes me think he just can't paddle very well. Yeah. yeah, you just have to move your paddle before you click the button to launch the ball, and that doesn't happen. It's only if you leave it, you know, right at the edge. Yeah, so. or 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 keep the paddle down at the bottom of the screen and don't move it up. <laughs> yeah, like one of the one of the things that Something. he did talk about in the article is that uh, the programmers for the color computer have absolutely no idea what to do with the analog joystick, and this was just a poor implementation of it, which I disagree with. But... Yeah, I disagree with that too. He said that I mean, he's the guy who wrote the frog where you can barely move the damn thing trying to hit the arrow right. keys. So, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say fault projection much. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he, he had some points that it's yeah very easy to knock the ball backwards and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I mean, mm-hmm. definitely having the gravity sets it as, apart from the other versions. And um, the two player simultaneous also does two the player simultaneous that two player. That's a nice addition, I think. Yeah. So I, I can play with my brother. We played each other like all the time on this game. And you can play cooperative and competitive too. Yes. Um, if I remember. 
Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have no friends, so I couldn't try it out with anybody. <laughs> That's but... what Coco <laughs> Fest is for. We'll be playing it live. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> I actually had pretty good luck with the Black Beauty. I mean, most of it's just my reflexes and stuff, you know, me, not the system. Yeah. The, right. In order to do well in this game, you have to have really good hand, hand eye coordination. It's a, yep. it's a yep. musk. You have to really precisely move that paddle. Otherwise, you know. Mm -hmm. you yeah, because it's a relative position, too. Like wherever you're holding the joystick within the circle is where right. you are on the screen. It's a direct one to one yeah. representation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And using one of these did not cut it. No. <laughs> <laughs> So I would actually personally have to say that it's a, a great implementation of the analog joystick. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah. It'd be like Polaris. Like Polaris lets you position your your missile command, you know, right. aiming thing yeah. Yeah. with the position of the joystick, you know, relative versus the Atari twenty six hundred where you can just move it left to right. You can't get fast over to where you want to go. Right. Yep. But you aren't gonna do Polaris with a D pad. No, it, or to our <laughs> joystick it would suck. Even an analog D-pad, you aren't going to do it. You no. need a joystick. I do have to say that I'm interested or to try pad. and find some more of his reviews to see if he's as, <laughs> as harsh on every game that's not his. Yeah, because you know what it reminds me? All it right. reminds me of Nick. If you're a game developer, you hate everybody else's games but your own. Is that All basically right, right Nick? Put him on the spot. <laughs> See, well, it's true. He's even admitted himself he doesn't play other people's games because you know they're, they're not any good. So I told you he'd be an hour late. <laughs> All um, right, so I think we have somebody here to tell us a little bit about playing this game. One of the people that got in the top two. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, your score blew everybody else's away, other than the top three players. I assume you're talking to me. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Hi, everyone. I joined the joined the show during the break. Um, so, um, yeah, I played this game a ton when I was a kid. Uh, uh, me and my brother together, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, one thing I really like about the game is it does add a lot of uh, playing options. You know, you've got gravity versus no gravity. You can play. Uh, two-player competitive, two-player uh, cooperative, um, you know, her vertical versus horizontal uh, screen orientation. Um, and so it, it gives a number of options there that a lot of other versions of Breakout don't have. Um, and I think actually the ability to move the paddle up and down as opposed to just left and right, uh, actually I think adds a, a, another literally a, another dimension to the game um <laughs> <laughs> you can you can move the paddle up and down in order to uh hit the paddle harder sorry sorry hit the ball harder so it can go faster if you need to or if you want to um you can uh and you can do that same tactic to try to to try to change direction uh, change the ball's direction uh uh more you know more predictably or precisely um, another thing that makes the game really challenging, which I kind of liked the challenge, was the fact is when you, especially in gravity, when you hit the, 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 top, the top wall, um, the ball accelerates like really fast. So the ball might be going really slowly and then you'll hit it, it'll hit the top of the screen and then just immediately shoot downward. Um, that makes it really challenging, and I think that's why some people find the game really frustrating too. Is that's one of the things that makes it kind of frustrating. But um, but you know, if you've got really hand co eye hand coordination, then uh, then you can learn to handle it. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's an this game is an acquired skill. Um, so <laughs> you, uh, you develop some techniques to to try to control the ball better and and get better scores. Uh, so I liked it. I played it a lot when I was a kid. Well, yep. yeah, I definitely agree. I, I liked it. I, I sucked at it. I was absolutely <laughs> awful. But, I mean, it was a nice change from a regular breakout game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you didn't really get any differences in breakout until Arkanoid came along and you got all the power-ups and stuff. So, right. other than this. And, and since this was a, a launch title, like the 881 time frame, um, it was kind of following along the lines of the, the VCS, the Atari VCS, which, of course, you know, Space Invader with 112 different options. 
And, you know, this is one of the few games in the Coca we got from that early time period that, you know, was competitive with that, with all the different, you have, you know, 10 different speeds or skill levels per. Plus, you've got, as, as Fred mentioned, you know, the cooperative two player, competitive two player, you know, vertical and sideways screens, um, gravity well, on, you, off. And, you could choose the number of balls you start with, too. Yeah. To, I always started with 20. I pl- always played with 20. <laughs> so that made the game on challenge a bit harder because we could only use five. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if I'd had if I'd gone with twenty, then Tasman would have scored like one hundred and fifty thousand rather than uh, rolled 6, around 000. a couple of times. And <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask Terry Stigman, but it looks like he's left the call. But uh, Busto was actually a bundle with TDP one hundreds for a while there, and I was wondering if he got any of his TDP systems that actually came with it. If it had any you know special notes saying you know bundled with your two joysticks, you get a free bust out card. I do know Glenn Soggy, the person that wrote it for the Image Producers, had mentioned during our interviews with him that this was his best-selling game, and it sold between a quarter of a million and 300000 over the course of the Coco's life, so pretty good seller. Yep, so obviously a really awful game. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. I think Andrew's just jealous because he didn't sell that many of the frogs. <laughs> right. <laughs> Andrew did do better ones, though. That King Tut game we played uh, yeah. was his, too. And that, was, that was a decent game. I have to say, as an Apple person playing the Apple breakout one that Steve Wozniak wrote for the Apple, that, yeah, this is a lot of, actually a lot more exciting. I mean, just the way it was done, especially when the ball goes super critical. But uh, definitely uh, definitely an up level from that. So I appreciated yeah. it. Actually, Marco, Good. if somebody does type in Andrew Hubble's basic one, because if I remember, Steve Wozniak's was also in basic, wasn't it? Uh, in uh, basic? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was in Intra basic, and then it was ported to Apple Soft Basic. So. So I'd like to say a comparison between the two and see what you think between the two, because hmm. I'm imagining it's probably based hmm. on Steve's. Yeah, it could be. Probably right. Yeah. Well, start uh, look, typing. It'll be ready before the end of the show. Well, yeah, we'll let Jim Gary do it first, and then uh, we just have to <laughs> copy it. <laughs> you showed both yeah, we'll just play it on the yeah. MC10. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Does anybody else have anything to say about Bust Out? Super bust out. One, one last thing, I guess. Um, during the uh, Game on Challenge a couple days ago, um, like I said before, you can more finely, I think, control the direction and the speed of the ball because you're moving the paddle in three to two dimensions. Um, at one point during the Game on Challenge, I was able to get the ball to go nearly perfectly vertically up and down. And um, and so it was, it was ever so slightly not perfectly vertical and so Ugh. the ball gradually moved up and down uh, gradually moved left and right from right to left actually and um and i didn't quite make it all the way to the other side of the screen but i remember as a kid i actually did do that i was able, actually able to get the ball going up and down vertically but gradually it would move it would uh, migrate you know left or right and I was able to clear an entire board doing that uh, on a number of occasions when I was a kid. With minimal minimal effort. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you, you have to keep that paddle really steady. It. Yeah. Yep. And that's why I, I didn't make it all the way across is because if your paddle is moving when the ball hits the paddle, then that it adds, puts English, puts, yeah. puts English yeah. on it. It puts English on it. And so that's what happened is after trying, you know, for like 10 minutes to keep that paddle steady so that it would not do that. I accidentally, you know, ever so slightly moved the paddle when the ball hit and it shot off in a different direction. And and that's uh, why I didn't make it all the way across. But I made it like, what, three quarters of the way across, I think. Um, I've got to admit, I've had no interest in breakout in a thousand years. But now I'm going to have to play this to just see about the fades. Can you can you like back off and slow it down? Smash her up. I got to know now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. Anybody else have anything else to say about Bust Out then before we put this one to sleep? It's Those it's it's not an ways. easy one. So especially with gravity. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier if you don't have gravity. Yeah. If you don't have gravity, which <clears throat> I think if we play this at Coco Fest, we'll just have it without gravity. And as oh, time goes on, the, the ball will, if the ball will slow down and not go as high as time goes on, right? So uh, <laughs> you have to, at some point, give it some extra momentum by hitting it upward. 
uh, so that it'll but not too much or it just takes off like a rocket <laughs> yeah this that ball could get really fast in this game it's a really big challenge i think uh, and that was my biggest problem was i did not have the finesse to keep it slow <laughs> yeah. me too yeah but if i mean this is a game that literally um if you have the cartridge version you can run it on a 4k cocoa and up so absolutely every cocoa it works with so actually mm. it's Interestingly enough, then if you type in that 4K version that he made, you have to compare it one to one because they're both 4K versions. Yep, I'm I'm curious. I would like to see how it compares with Waz Waz's. Well, even just the actual bust out cartridge versus Oof, this one yeah. that uh, yeah, like Andrew in his review said, Andrew yeah, made because <laughs> he did say that his is better. I'm sure he did. <laughs> so maybe I'll have to uh, get that typed in and get back to you next week. Where yeah, that'd be cool. I'm working on it now. <laughs> okay. Are you OCRing it or? <laughs> no, I'm actually kind of sitting here listening to y'all and uh, typing it in as I go. Oh, You're the only one on this panel be actually yeah. being productive. Then that's right, good. We're going to have results by <laughs> news. If you want to call yeah, this productive, we have to vote him off the show. So what Henry, you can give do? us a review by the end of the show. Well, possibly. We'll see what happens. I demo. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. Uh, it's four K. Column in the full. news. It's not going to be that long to syntax type errors. In. He's not the only one being productive. I'm currently hooking up my blue SCSI up to the MM1 at the moment to test it out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what we do to stay awake in this show? Exactly. <laughs> so, well, right. shall we talk about the other game we played this week? Please. Yes. Which was Don Pan. Which is um. Yeah, it's an interesting game. <laughs> it's unusual. We'll put it that way. As, as a lot of Japanese games are. Yeah. Although, <clears throat> excuse me, once you get into actually playing it, it's not that bad. Um, as soon as you... Uh, it's, just, get... it's quirky. I wouldn't say it's yeah. like, yeah, it's definitely not bad. It's actually a great, fun game. But you know, if from North American just, perspective, it's kind of weird. Just don't just think gotta, too much. It's, it's Japanese. Place. You got to get used to the fact that you really don't have control over your guy going up and down. You, it's mostly just left and right, and firing. Like New Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> I I have to admit that's actually why I never got Don Pan back in the day because the premise just sounded too weird to me, and <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> um, um, so, so I never played it. I never got it. Back well, in the day. when Mark read the instructions, it definitely was uh, different. So you say you don't <laughs> control up and down. Is it your air ingestion that controls your up and down, or does uh, it just no? You're, you're really just bouncing up and it down. Just goes it, wherever the heck. It you can control it a little bit, I think. I'm not sure whether that was like just placebo for me or <laughs> what, but it was. You, <laughs> Um, hope. You're basically just bouncing hope. up and down, and you got to move hope. back and forth to avoid hitting things, and also catch your balloons. Also, I, allowed. I have, have a physical copy of it. Yeah, I do too. And I've mm. never played it. I don't know where I even got this, but the label's starting to peel <laughs> off. I've never played it. I have it. That's that's actually one I don't have. I, I will I, say I did the same as Jason. I bought it with a bulk of other cartridges, probably from Mark Marlette years and years back. Just and never... I kind of, kind of was reading the manual, and I went, I don't understand this at all, so I'm going to try it. And then when I was doing it for the game site, well, I guess I got to play it now, you know. And, and actually, like like you said, Ken, once you get into it, it's a lot of fun, actually. It's actually a pretty yeah. darn good game. It's just the premise is so darn weird. Yeah, it's yeah. you just got to wrap your head around the premise and, and just have fun with and it. And there's three screens. I think I said last week there was two, yeah. but I forgot about there's the third. There's three, so. but the uh, instructions, as far as we could tell, lied. Because on the third screen, you're supposed to have crabs that you're avoiding, but um, I think it was uh, Jim got to that, and we, we never got, saw any crabs. Have we got any video of the game? Uh, just from the Game on Challenge. Oh, yeah, I didn't get a chance to join you guys. Sorry, I was really busy with work this week, so I didn't even have a chance to look at the Game on Challenge yet. Never mind, get on it. So Yeah, we noticed. Yeah, we missed you. We had to just make up facts about games. <laughs> That's what I do on my website anyway, so just read that. You missed quite a show, I tell you. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a look at how Thursday's um, show went so we can actually see some footage of Don Pan in action. 
Dr. Ted Nelson is actually saying if you push up on the joystick, you bounce higher than normal. A little bit. That's why I thought it's, I never could tell that that was a bit of a placebo for me or whether I was actually really going up and down. Control and when you hit the ground. Okay, where the heck did, uh, there we go. All right, so here's a bunch of screens playing. So we had a few people in on Thursday night. Uh, let's see if I can find a spot where Don Pan is highlighted. You just passed one, didn't you? Yeah. Um, well, there. there. This is on real hardware, it looks like. Yeah. So that's. So, yeah, you're just bouncing up and down, and you got to shoot the uh, birds and avoid. So, yeah, I guess you can jump a little higher if you push up or lower if you push down. Um, I was just trying to see whether when Jim got to the third level, if. Uh... Second level. Oh, you just passed the point where um, um, on breakout, he was doing the vertical. Oh, did I? Yep, yeah, a little more, a little more, a little more. I was a little bit that, before that's that. Right. A little bit that before. was after, just after I had it vertical, yeah. Uh, Before this, back or... it yeah, yeah, back it up earlier. maybe, yeah, like five minutes, because <laughs> I had it going that like that for a while. Yeah, there we go. Hmm. Oh, that was just the end of it. Yeah, back it up like a minute. There we go. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Smooth, no worries. Yeah, until <laughs> 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 until I accidentally gave it just a little bit of English and it. Shut uh, off. Yeah, they should have put English on the blocks. That would miss you up for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All anyway. right. So, anyways, uh, that's uh, the <laughs> Thursday night live yeah. game that we do in Discord on the Game on Challenge live uh, channel. You looking, so, you were looking for crabs. Oh, yeah. Crabs. And also, when you get a um, chance, uh, Ken, after you find the uh, crab level there, uh, Mark Siegel's got to come in on the game. Honestly, I don't know whether... Oh, there we go. There's supposed to be crabs here, but you're on like a desert island here, but we never saw any. So Thursday nights, 5 o'clock Pacific time, be there. Um, we welcome all Coco players playing any games. We prefer the game on challenge games, but if you don't want to play those, play something different. Yeah, you can be like Bob Emery. <laughs> or you don't even have to play a game. You can just hang out and chat. Speaking of hanging out and chatting, yeah, check out uh, Mark Siegel's comment on Don Ben. Okay. I uh, just got to. Very last one. Yes. I don't know how we, I don't remember how we got stuck with this title, but I didn't like it. <laughs> Keep in mind, this is the project manager saying, I don't know how we got stuck with this title. <laughs> now, this is written by Tomy, which is normally a toy company, isn't it? Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, I think the first version of this was on the TI 99. But um, yeah, it was cross platform. It, it's very odd that you look at it. You hear about it, you think this is definitely a kid's game, but it's not. No, it's too mm -hmm. hard for a kid. Which I think. I think is one of the the problems with this game is everybody would have just looked at it and thought, that's just weird. That's like a little kid's game. Picking I don't want to be trying right? it. Yeah, now if you had a like a spaceship and it was shooting lasers and you got aliens coming, maybe. And the adults come in, yeah. A bouncing up and down spaceship. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you see, you play Defender, it's basically the same thing. Some kind of trampoline <laughs> or, metric, yeah. Or if you have a you know a plumber and his brother and trying 
you know, <laughs> punch bricks in order to get coins, then you know, <laughs> then that you'll so. that might so. Yeah. Too hard for <laughs> the six. He says too hard for a kid. Do you remember being a kid? Yeah, actually, we were talking about that earlier with Busta, right? Like Fred, your your reflexes when you were younger were way better. So better. Yeah. Oh, jeez. I guess early teens. Although I guess the, the thing is, when I first looked at this game, I thought like it was for a really young audience. Yeah, like think, yeah, that's oh, what I originally a, thought too. It's, it's a it's... balloon that bounces up and down. Like that's for your like in the Dino Wars. Yeah, it's off the charts, um, cute factor type thing. Yeah, yeah. right, right. So I was thinking, but then I tried it, and I'm like, oh, this has to be a game on. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, from looking at the graphics and reading the description, it sounds like this should be like for ages five to eight or something like that. But when yeah. you get to playing it, it's reflex wise, it's more the teenager level. It's just that that's much more popular in Japan, that style of game for a teenager or a young adult. Whereas, you know, here you'd want, you know, something with blood and guts or something instead right. you know, or spaceships or aircraft carriers or something like that. So, but yeah, it's a good, um, it's a good game. I think uh, it's actually an underrated one, I would say. Yeah, I definitely have to agree with that. And I will try to make the game on challenge so I can actually try playing it because I haven't played it, I think, since probably when I did the web page ad or uh, entry for it. So Dr. Ted says that um, a lot of the early 80s Japanese arcade games had weird cutesy themes like this, which is true. Yeah, watching chronologically gaming because we've gone through quite a few of those in late 82. There's a ton of them. <laughs> Even even uh, not necessarily just the 80s. You think about, like, as games went on, you got things like Kirby and things like that. that yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a cutesy game, but violent. <laughs> <laughs> Rick says they didn't have video games when I was a kid. <laughs> Surely they had Pong by then. In the, no, uh, they didn't. No. When I was a kid, they, did, they didn't have Pong. When oh, I Space War. Space War came out in they, 71. They the when I was Pong a kid, game, it was 60s. The first Pong they, game was in the, in the 60s on well, the telescope. Well, they, well, yeah, they didn't have Pong. It was called Ping Pong. Yes. And you yeah. had a there, there, and That was a virtual reality version. Yeah. It was a two-player 3D. Yeah, 3D yeah. Pong. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> But you, you could have played like new. Space War on the oscilloscope in the old oh. um, you know, 1961 I'll, version. If, I, many... if I'd snuck into somebody's dad's lab. <laughs> yeah, how many how many kids back in the sixties were playing Pong on an oscilloscope? I mean, right, really? right. Oh, that was all the, the rage, lucky ones. It? That's who went to in, MIT in seventy four. It got kicked off of the high school teletype terminal for playing video games on it, like Star Trek and that kind of stuff. Or yeah, I, I was I was a sophomore and I got kicked off and I didn't get back on again until my senior year when I actually took a valid computer math class to get back on the school system but that was it they had a terminal and you put time on it like some kind of formal yeah. thing yeah to get scheduled i had to do that at university on the pms machine i thought maybe you were playing frogger on the teletype <laughs> that would have been a lot of paper <laughs> yeah. well not not the not the frog you're thinking of but the uh turn by turn one right, oh, right. Yes, the one that was mr day's frogger a log approaches from the left a truck approaches from the right do you hop <laughs> hop left <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should do more arcade games like that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, so That's for Don Pad, really you, you know, inflate you yourself. Do you inflate or do you <laughs> do you do you, do you a fart. shoot the bird, b grab the <laughs> balloon, or c just float to the ground? That's a or really do... good idea. Can I steal that? I might do something like that. that sounds <laughs> Don Pad. Oh, that boy. sounds awesome. I'm, I might try that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how, how about we see what is going to be new for next week? So sure. obviously Dawn Pan for one more week. And, and our Generally. other game is right here. Oh, that's going to be bugger. Oh, mind roll. <laughs> Ooh. I could never figure out how to get off the first level. Yeah, I, I, I occasionally can, but it, I don't know what I did different from the times I can't. I don't understand the first level at all. Does anybody I, here not reliably get past it? I'm, I'm in the same boat. Arrows, looking forward to the lowest score it's ever submitted. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same boat, Curtis. I have this game, but I got it just a few years ago for the first time, and I tried playing it, and I was like, what am I doing? I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. I, I 
Yeah, I didn't get on the first far. level. It's, I don't. On the later levels, like if you start on the second level, then then I'm fine. It's, it's a just lot like Marble one. Madness. I mean, you just got to uh, discover <laughs> where you're supposed to go. Like, um, well, okay, where is that on the first level when you just anything. got that lengthy hallway? You just run forever until your time runs out. You well, can you jump. Can go, you can not jump. You can go up and down. Like though, a 3D the, game. That this lengthy is like hallway. Um, you just got to. If you go to the right spot, it'll flash an arrow for you. Okay. And then you just got to go that. in the direction of the arrow. There, and you there's cross... only one direction. Forward. Yeah. No. <laughs> there's more than one direction. On the first I've, level? I've played the game once, and I've almost got all the way through the first level. What does the bug fix Are you thinking the same first level mean? that we are? Yeah. <laughs> well... Somebody, somebody it. fire it up so we can take a look at it there because I I'm, I defy Ken does, on this one. Does, does Sixty's <laughs> chat comment have any any creatures yeah. here? No, <laughs> no. The the and my, the arcade my, has, a, has a bug fix version to fix frame one. Ah, there you go. If is you got there, a bug fix version, that might be different. But the cart version is impossible. Yeah. Oh, okay. Unless you start on the second level. Right. Yeah, the, I remember having that problem. And you start on the second level. Yeah, can you get a choice. Oh. Yeah, you can. You can choose any of the levels, which okay, is how I well, got to the screen. Yeah, I don't know with the. I never had a problem with the first level, but if people have problem copies with the first level, we can start on so, hey, any level bus. you want. Now, I Ken, bus, are you playing off cart? Or are you playing off of the archive copy? I'm playing off the archive. So you have got the fixed one. <laughs> I guess so. Maybe it's fixed. Yeah, maybe the cart was always wrong. Yeah, I think it was. Right. Honestly, because yeah, the, I mean, it just there's just a flashing square you got to run over with your ball. <laughs> Nope, not on the card nope. version. <laughs> nope. oh, okay, well then, <laughs> darkness. Then the the. Uh, but basically, what you do is you is run broken. or jump or both or any combination, and you go for ninety nine seconds until the timer runs out, and then you die. That's yeah. the first level. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, when I tried it, uh, you went on the first level. Sometimes you had to go down because the first level is actually bigger than the screen. So sometimes you had to go down to get the flashing square. There's, there's no down. What are you talking about? There's no down in the car version. <laughs> it's just right. a running hallway. That's all it is. <laughs> well, it uh, looks like it's uh, just a running hallway, but you could, if you move down, then the hallway scrolled up. Can Mark add any anything to the mystery? Sixty saying in the chat, he says, I think the top, main top tip is to read the manual that tells how to do each frame. Because reading it, it makes no sense at all. It's not intuitive at all. <laughs> okay. This is sounding See, a lot, a lot uh, like I have a feeling that? I'm going to get a better score playing, letting Neutroid play by itself. <laughs> we'll all be so listening Bob's, attentively. Bob's playing right now. He's yeah. You just go across those. Uh, you have to run across those. Now is this the stairs. archive copy, Bob, or is this the? Yeah, this is the archive copy. Yeah, so it's, it's, totally it's probably different. fixed. Oh, fixed. So and then eventually solvable. when you've gotten all the squares off of this screen, then a black hole opens up and you just got to drop yourself into it. Oh yeah. Cause see on, on the card, it's just, it's just, it's just, there's just blackness. There's nothing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you start on like this level or start on level two, I should say, or higher, that runs fine. I've never had any problems. There, that is level one, but still, yeah. Yeah. Plain one, as they call it. Yeah. Now, this is like nothing like the cart that i have <laughs> yeah, no uh, no, it, no. It's, uh, it's not and, it, and was this one a fat binary or is it just coco three only no it's a fat binary because it's artifact colors on a coco one or two this will run on a coco one or two you're seeing the coco three enhanced color version here oh, but it auto detects okay. so i'm gonna have to download the archive mm. version because actually if they fix that stupid bug then yeah that would maybe be worthwhile right absolutely Luke Siegel says i don't remember this game at all <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> I remember buying this game it's, on it's like Epics. Clarence at Radio Shack there we go. and going, it's broken. See, Bob already beat level one, so. Say, Bob, you got the cartridge handy. We got to show Ken what we're talking about here. Yeah, I have the I don't even know if I still have my cart. Me, so while we're out. looking for that cart, who wants to see why the why bust down was so terrible? Why the uh, Oh, why, yeah. Why you got it done already? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. I, I got it done. Let me go ahead and. Oh, yeah. Okay. You got to bring this up full screen. Hi. Is there right? we go. There we go. All right. So you know, uh, back and forth with the joystick and whatnot. And what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this game is so much better. Time. And what? Oh my! <laughs> you hit yourself are in you, the. Is that a bug typing it in, or do you think it was actually done that way? 
collision uh, detection? If it was a bug typing it in, then it probably would have then it probably would have been along the lines of a function call error or something like that. That looks like All it's right. a straight up. It thing. went through, hit the panel from the back, and and hit itself in the butt. Pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> Yeah, still that's better than Neutroid. Way better than Buster. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's just like and... shots fired. Yep. <laughs> that, that, he couldn't have released it that way. This, that's got to be a no. A the thing yeah, was, he said that he never, never released it because it wasn't any no. good. It's that whole full yeah. transference yeah, thing I was talking about. <laughs> Check. You didn't misread an O for a zero or a zero for an O anywhere in the listing. Oh, trust me, I checked. <laughs> Detection actually works, but only after it's got to be the, the, the point. I'm, I'm assuming he's using the point up. command to register that the balls hit the paddle. So I would guess there's something wrong it, there. It, there's odd, odd, odd values on the way down and even values on the way up, or something stupid it, like that. It's got to be. It's got to be something silly. But you know, it's, I could go through and I could debug it, and I might find a mistake. But I just think it's funny that I didn't thought that no. was funny, and I wanted. To no, that would be really funny. Fix it if that was the way it was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's written in basic, right? So it'd probably be easy yep. to find that bug, I think. Yeah, yeah it's only right, 4K so, too, so it's not too much code. Uh, I'm hoping it's yeah. a typo, but that would be really funny if it never worked before. Right. Oh. right. <laughs> okay. There's here we go with cartridge. this mind roll game that Oh, uh, mind roll on cartridge. On um, cartridge. Oh, yeah, here we go. Don't you say joystick I was using before. Yeah, show us how to play this thing. I could not figure it out. Yeah, figure out level one in this. this <laughs> okay, I, I... well, if it's not working on the... Um, on there, the... that's what you get in level one. Oh, yeah, there, this is what you get. Oh, Perpetual yeah. hallway for all of time. Oh, so yeah, This is where I gave up. Yeah, yeah I, have no like, idea. What I had no this? idea what was going on here. I was like, what is going... Yeah, yeah what is this? Okay, so it yeah. just doesn't... The cartridge... Don't play the cartridge version. Play the archive version. <laughs> right. Now you now you understand why we always got so frustrated though, because you basically just do this until the time runs out. That's it. Right. I always try I never liked this game, and this was why. Yeah, it's like, what am I doing here? What what is the objective here? I don't. That that's why I started playing happening. on plane two, and then what's the other motivation? planes work. So the other planes you can actually get stuff done. Like they've got the yeah. nice tunnels and stars and teleporter squares and. So it's just acid an error, baths and an error on yeah. the uh, first part of plane one. But how could you let this go in quality testing when this is the first right? freaking level, the first screen? You can't even get off of it. Like, how could you miss that testing? Um, they did so level one. Second. They tested all the other ones. They released beta five as the release or something by mistake. Or, or they or they had it working and then they did a change for that effect, you know, for some other later level that affected the old code. Right. And they never went back and tried Save it again. Save 12 bytes or something. Which means yeah, their quality control it. sucked. But yeah. yeah. So is that an actual Radio Shack cartridge? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's what that's I exactly saw what it when does I bought Mind too. Roll. Yeah, yeah. And I've still got the cartridge, and I never played it because this is all it does. Yep. Same here. Yeah, I'm like, what am I doing? What am I supposed to do? What's the objective here? I, I couldn't. Yeah, I wonder I, how many of them got returned. Any sense to me? Yeah. Right. Well, I I started playing. Like I thought maybe I was missing some subtle nuance, but once you start on, if you tell it to start on playing two. Then the rest of the game runs fine. Yeah, there's actually quite a bit of yeah, good gameplay there, but play. this level is screwed. Yeah, except in the archive version, it's not. So there, you got something <laughs> new to try. You can try the archive version and play a level one which you've never played before. I have an actual game. Yeah, yeah. Press, a few, wow. press a few buttons on yeah, the keyboard. There you go. There you go. There's the entire <laughs> first level for you, as we all played it back in the day. <laughs> but yeah, the other ones are actually quite good. They got you know pretty good graphics and skulls and. There's even pipes you travel through and all kinds of stuff. Ooh. That's one of the teleporters. Oh, okay. Ooh. That's the acid thing. Don't want to wander in there too long. And suddenly the color works and the 3D works. And oh, it doesn't kill you instantly. It just kind of wears down your health or something. Yeah, you got to jump from those platforms and not get sucked into the thing. Okay. And each each plane is color themed, especially on the Coco Three. It's it's a bit more limited on the artifacting colors on the Coco One and Two, though it looks identical, it's the same resolution and everything. <laughs> but the other ones are all themes. You get a green theme, a blue theme, an orange theme. That's actually you know a pretty decent game, except for the level one bug, which I didn't know was fixed. So thanks for letting us know, Sixty. 
I didn't know it was a bug. I just thought the game was lousy. I, yeah, I yeah, thought it was so yeah. bad. I never tried another level. I just, me, me too. I, I thought care. that was, it was supposed to be that way. And I'm like, see, it's it's what, what's a, it? it's what a it? uh, collector's edition. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's like the very first version of Bomb Threat from Rick Adams where they discovered that bug. Yeah. Or Nick, what was the game you had released that had a bug on the first bit and you had to put, make you a patch version? On oh, mine, don't have bugs. Jumping Joey, <laughs> Neutroid. I'll say which one. We're still waiting for the bug fix for Neutroid, but uh... <laughs> bug fix or feature fix? Well, that that took a whole whole new uh, release. Rewrite whole a whole new rewrite. <laughs> what does yeah, the like... manual say for this um, this game for level one? Is there something we're not doing when you're running level? No, one? it's it's flawed. It's I mean, bug, we just it's a bug on the, in the cartridge because the just, um, yeah. archive version is totally different. Right. Yeah, because you're mean, going left to right in the archive version, collecting squares on a plane that's actually big enough to fill yeah. most of the screen. Whereas on the cart, you got one strip in the actually, middle, you can only go up. No, it has colors. You'll notice the cart's just the, a mangled. On the archive version, I think you start on that long hallway, but you just go up it for like three seconds and then you hit the flashing square and you go on to the next part. Okay. Right. Yeah. And you don't do that on the are, cart. <laughs> the graphics that's, are that's broken on the cart. To, so that's a great way to hook you in when you first start playing, right? <laughs> Just go yeah. down a single hallway forever. <laughs> and die. <laughs> and die. Yeah. And then you die. Fire up as I say playing 10 just for what we'll do one last look at it here for the people kind of curious. It's uh, interesting Bobby. that this is an epic one again. game. The fact that oh, it's up to level ten, crank game, it right up. <laughs> I find it yeah, interesting. It's, it's an epic game that was awesome. released. Ooh, it's black and white. We're back. Yeah, to that's the theme. And, and you have moving chrome. goals you have to try to get to. Oh, fun! Oh, that that sounds that sounds like some jobs mm -hmm. I've had. <laughs> 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 but still, that level. Those level one graphics are just broken, along with the gameplay. The graphics are broken. It's like everything's broken. And this also, I believe, was a cross-platform title too, wasn't it, Ken? I yeah. yeah. I would think so. Epics? I think uh, Amiga has it. And, uh... Ooh, Ooh, green. Green. There's the lightning effect. Ooh. So do me a favor and go back to one again to see what that looked like. I think it's just really off. Oh, this, the, bro the broken cartridge. one. You know, say if you're sitting on the flash when it goes off, your time gets sucked down really fast. There's a lot to the game, actually. It's it's actually a, a decent game, except Ooh. for you know the level one on the card. So this was also released on the PC and the Amiga. Um, other versions of it are called Qdex. Oh right, yeah. I think I might even mention that on my site if I remember. That's where I'm getting that information oh. from. Yeah, now, on the, on the cartridge, <laughs> all you can do is go up. Yeah, and it's broken. I mean, the 3D is yeah. gone, the colors are gone, the textures are gone. It's just. And I believe in the um, archive version on this, you just go up a, like three or yeah, four. Yeah, a little seconds. bit. Then you're into a wider room you can go left and right on. Well, you hit mm -hmm. the you hit the first flashing point and then go down a hole and then you're off to the next level, next part of the plane. And just think the fix is probably one bite. Right, right. <laughs> somewhere. Some... It probably yeah, just somewhere. failed to draw the flashing square. Actually, well, uh, Sixie, since you're familiar with the fact it got patched, do you know what the patch was? Just out of curiosity, you don't have to wait for the lag to let them catch up. But Right, because everything is so different. This has to be broken in some fundamental way. It's not just an oversight of an exit square or something. It's like way Yeah, wrong. no, it's, it's, it's <laughs> totally hooped, this first level. Also, I, you can I'm see on the lower sure right there, it says jumps, no limit. You Later on, you get stuff where you have a limited number of jumps. You get uh, levels where yeah. you can't jump at all. So you have to, like, you know, <laughs> skirt around dangers and stuff. There's there's a lot of cool stuff in the game. It's actually a pretty good game. So 60 says, uh, no, he doesn't know what the fix was. He just um, played it and realized he could play it. Right. That's weird. Yeah, Mark Siegel says, I wonder if there was a defect in the ROM. Possible. Right. And Sixty says, still don't enjoy it, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it if it's a defect in the ROM, then it got mass it, Everyone, yeah, it was defect. mastered wrong because every copy does exactly got that. this. Yeah, yeah mine, mine does too. Yeah. yeah. 
It hasn't been too often that Tandy's released a, an, an enhanced version or an extra version of a cartridge. I can only think of uh, Downland. Downland because it needed to get patched for the Kogel 3 specifically. Right. Um, Audio Spectrum Analyzer, which got the P-Mode 4 version, so it would run on a Kogel 2 or or a Kogel 3, I should say, without any semi-graphics. And that's the only two I can think of off the top of my head. You mean there wasn't an, uh, there was an enhanced version of script set? Yeah, oh, called, disc, script disc set. spirit set. Yeah, yeah, or or script set two, which was a script completely different. Two. Yeah, and there's that one, way, car- that one cartridge that required a different RAM to be put into the computer to make it work. So that was the easier fix than redoing a cartridge. Which one's that? Uh, there's a there's actually a tech wild on catting. It. Yeah, that one. Instead of fixing the cartridge, you had to bring your computer in just to have a RAM ch- chip changed out. So you didn't no, have I don't know about oh, that for one. Very certain, <laughs> for very certain computers, they well, just said it's cheaper to fix the computer than fix the game. Forget it's that. One of the, I just uh, won't color, buy the game. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the color computer uh, uh, tech buildings. Cool. <laughs> so it was like a, the RAM speed wrong or something? or what? No, it's why? something about uh, certain uh, brands of RAM. It came up in a, in a predictable pattern, okay. which the cartridge didn't like. So if you change one of the RAM chips to a different manufacturer, you end up with a different pattern. Oh, and that was cheaper than fixing the game nationwide. Right. Just, okay, the five guys that have this Coco, will give them a free RAM chip. <laughs> it's yeah. fixed. Can you remind me, what was the problem with Downland? Because uh, I have Downland, and I never The, the original one, if you plug the cart into the Coco 3, it just locks up. It won't play. Oh. Uh, did. So the 1.1 version, and the label changes. Instead of having the full picture, it's got text and stuff on the label. Uh, yeah, like on the white, main front. White label oh, with a uh, smaller I, picture. You know, I never, case. I never knew there was an update. So I uh, just assumed it just simply wasn't Coco 3 compatible. So I always just played it on my Coco 2. <laughs> yeah no the, the, the later cart works on both machines uh but the original huh. cartridge only works in a coco one or two i don't think i knew that that's cool well well you learn <laughs> I, 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 against all the odds you've learned something today from the <laughs> yes, yes this show Maybe is so informational and educational i tell you it should be required viewing in all schools <laughs> do you want to see the amiga version Oh, only, no, only for the uh, misbehaving students, though. That yeah, are don't let in. this happen to you. <laughs> and I happen to have both versions of Downland. Yeah, I do too. Like this? I have many copies of both versions. <laughs> yeah. So the bottom I, one there is the Coca One and Two version. The top one there is the uh, Coca Three compatible. Oh, sorry, choose. no, that's backwards. Yeah. The top you know. one now is the Coca One and Two, the full label with the full picture. And then one of the texts is the one point one version yeah, works in the Coco 3. The, yeah. I can't turn them the same oh. way because it's hard. I, hey, Nick Ranchi <laughs> says the Amiga version. I've got the Amiga Ooh. version. Uh, sure, yeah. fire it up. I want to see uh, you actually Amiga. play it, though, not just play a video. No, it's a video. I don't play ah, you. Wimp. But... <laughs> that's just that's cheating nick i, I that, want to that's... see nick's reflexes in action here is what i want to see <laughs> right <laughs> well but see that's what happens what you you get games like neutroid when you don't test your own games <laughs> <laughs> do we have a do and we have do we have a tally count on the neutroid jokes today uh, I'll put one. Oh, we should have. Yeah, we should have somebody <laughs> keeping track. <laughs> well, the inch screen is definitely different. I have to say. Yep. Is that yeah. his level one work? Yeah, showing. Wow, that's pretty that's, impressive. That's fancy. Fancy. Yeah. Okay, fancy. level one or plain one. Oh, it looks like an eyeball. <laughs> oh, you just died. And then you nope, no, that's no, how you jump you, into that's something. That's how you beat level one. That's how you get to the next thing. Okay. Yeah, this is so different than the cart version. <laughs> Oh, this is this is how the uh, the archive the version. version works. It just um... huh. I think it's funny that it's an eyeball instead of an eight ball, though. Yeah, that's a little weird, isn't it? A little bit more creepy. <laughs> yes. Um all right. Okay. Uh well actually I'll just I'll just jump it forward so we can see what some of the other I levels. got to play. Level or plane five coming up. 
Yeah, and then we'll we'll stop it after this so people you know yeah. don't get surprised yeah. about what comes up in the real game. So mm-hmm. it's got some different looking graphics there. It's got circuit boards. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't remember that in the Coco version. Oh, Your first eye drops anywhere on the maze, right? <laughs> <laughs> or a pair of glasses, or a monocle, mm-hmm. I guess, for this guy. Or, or contact lenses. There should be there should be contact lenses you can pick up. Yeah, your your power ups are your power ups are visine. Right. <laughs> they start getting red out. Yeah, I can't kill the sound, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what what it sounded like, but it was nothing. Special. Yeah, not not very good. Have some FM synth, boys and girls. Well, is it just those silly noises? Let's have a look. Now that that, that that's, that's this program you're talking about. All the silly noises. Yeah, it sounds yeah, like so FM synth. Kind of yeah. Tronish. Just just. Like you say, the cheap old sound card FM synth sound. Mm. They won't. Well, except the Amiga had DMA controlled uh, DAX, is what it had, 8 bit DAX. Sounds like some teenager messing around on a keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sounds like, yeah, right. piano lessons on the synthesizer. Anyway, it's actually a pretty good game. It's it's got a lot of variety. You'll see a, you, there's a lot of exploring as you decide, you know, learn what new pieces and parts of the game are. Because every level adds something new, or several somethings new. Um, but definitely, I guess play the uh, archive fixed version because yep, the cart is definitely broke, broke. After all right, all these now years. I just want to throw in something before we go. You know, uh, playing on our cocos is really fun, but um, if you really want to get into gaming, then the MC10 is the ultimate way to go. And I found mm-hmm. one for anybody that doesn't have one yet. If they're interested, they could pick this up. Oh, it's Ooh. only fifteen hundred bucks. What a good deal! American, <laughs> my end. You, or no, Canadian. Canadian. So, with, with so it's like twelve dollars. With shipping, <laughs> it's just over sixteen hundred dollars Canadian. As, as I was going to say, is Canadian wow. dollar def, uh, you know deflated that much? Uh, that's about twelve hundred dollars. Twelve hundred bucks American. That's only that one about... great price. There's that's no only sixteen K RAM pack. There's nothing here. Holy crap! It's still sweet. <laughs> it's you get plastic. the TV game switch. Yeah. Yep. Oh my gosh. Wow. Insane. Wow, what a bargain. Jason, you're rich. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the TV game switch. Oh, man. Or oh, the I'll original send you power one. supplier like box. <laughs> I don't need you know, mine has the composite mod. I don't need it. <laughs> I don't want those. I've I've gotten rid of a lot of those. I'm like, I don't have any TVs with a 300 ohm terminals. I don't need this. <laughs> I just thought that was um wow. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> basically what I thought. Just wow. wow. <laughs> you know how many Coco 3s you could buy for that price? One? Well, if it's the same guy, anyway. those are probably about 5 grand, I think. So. Right. Could be. Anyhow, so our two games for next week are Ken, uh Don Pan and Mind Roll. So join us at, since Sloopy's not here, you'll have to do all the... Uh... Yeah, join us on uh, Thursday night, uh, 5 o'clock Pacific time, on the Coco Game On Live... Uh, what's the channel actually called? I think it is. <laughs> Game On Challenge Live voice and video channel in Discord. And it's and, whoever uh... gets the highest score on platform one. Yeah, on the cartridge <laughs> version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're playing. We're playing the cartridge version only, starting on platform one. Well, only on platform one because if you start there, that's that's all you're getting. That's all. You're play. <laughs> and I'm joking. Don't play the cartridge version. Play the archive version. Yes. <laughs> Alan uh, in the chat here says that MC10 price is a deal. A single buck for every Jim Gary game to run on it. Oh, well, fifteen hundred <laughs> of them. <laughs> All right. Well, that's all I have to say. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, that's insane. Okay. Uh, Want to do a break, or shall we do the upcoming events? I'll do upcoming events. Then we'll take a break before the news. How's that? Okay. I just got to find them. <laughs> <laughs> just make them up. All three of them are on your screen there in front of you. Okay. All right, let's just read our blurb. <laughs> I think it's this one, is it? it? Says entering computer festival. Did I pick the right window? 
Yep. 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 Interim Computer Fest. Hey, Interim Computer Festival at Interest Space in Seattle, Washington. This is next weekend. It is. Mark, are you still going? Yes, I have my hotel room booked and I'm getting all ready to go. Because I did see there was mention here because they're talking about exhibits, demo speakers stuff here. There is another Mm Coco person going to be there. Yeah, uh, I I might have to Daddy Burrito. I think down for that. David, I attended the fate fest late last year and would like to attend again. Help out with uh, any help if is needed. I think it's Daddy Um, Burrito. I think. Okay. Is going to be like an an SGI Iris twenty four hundred workstation. That'd be cool. I seen Another Tandy Tier City person. collection by Eric Neustadter. Mm-hmm. Well, just I'm butchering that. Deck Alpha Station. That actually had a version of OS 9000 for it. Cool. Trying to see if there's any other Coco people down here. Oh, there's you, Mark. That's me. Did you say you might go down to Ken or? Um, I'll see if I can get away, yeah. I'm not sure. It's what like the Chilliwack Retro Computing Club is going to be represented down there too. See so a fellow. Yeah, they were there, there at the last one. So the guy right beneath me, uh, Michael Brutman, he's the guy that had managed the uh, uh, VCF Pacific Northwest in previous years, right there. Mm-hmm. So he's the one trying to get so. this resurrected to the point of becoming a VCF again. Yeah, I don't know if or, he has anything to do with it, but you know, whoever is running this thing, they're interested in you know bringing back that you know yearly event. So that'd be good. It would be. Cool. We'll definitely want to report. Uh, if you guys have enough bandwidth, uh, depending on who all goes there, if you guys can do a live show report on Saturday, be. that'd be awesome. We're, um, we're it's basically kind of downtown, little to the south of downtown, not far from the uh, from the uh, um, football and uh, uh, baseball stadiums. So there should be pretty good coverage. It's right, right next to the freeway too. So it should have okay, good cell cool. coverage. Do they, they have Wi-Fi right at the, the venue or? Um, I don't have Wi-Fi, but they do have Ethernet. So. Oh, okay. So you just have to take a really long cable and right, wander <laughs> around, around the floor. Cable around behind you. Ken can Ken can be behind you, like holding the cable up. Then and, one of those sideline guys, out. like the NFL's got to run the cable. <laughs> yeah. up and, down. and the guy with the boom mic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's next weekend. If you're in the Seattle, Washington area, you can go up there and meet Mark and possibly Ken and some other Google cool people as well. It looks like. And uh, Ken gave a pretty good review for it last year. And I, we went through some of the stuff, I think, and uh, there was some pretty interesting hardware there that we all ended up yammering about for a good half an hour, an hour. Next up, and also coming up rather fast, April 13th to 14th is the Indie Classic Computer and Gaming Expo in Indianapolis at Crown Plaza. And of course, this is one that is partially hosted by uh, Randy Kindig of the Floppy Days and Antic podcasts. And he was just out at VCF uh, SoCal, Southern California, as a uh, exhibitor. So this is actually more in his home turf. And of course, he's been a guest on our show. We've interviewed him, actually. And this one uh, is a fairly recently started one. I think it first, last year was the first one, if I remember correctly. Pretty close to it. So anyway, it's a, a fairly brand new one. It's not very expensive. $5 per person or $10 for an entire family. And uh, lots of you know retro stuff out there, uh, gaming and uh, home computers as well. And fifteen hundred dollars to fly out there. <laughs> <laughs> you could sell an MC10 and be there, no problem. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, next up, and thanks to Sluby for reminding me about this one last week because I I had kind of missed it. Is VCF East. And this is at the Info Age Science and History Museum in Wall, New Jersey. And this is April 12th to 14th. So it's the same weekend as the one in Indianapolis. The 12th, I think, is more set up. So it's basically the same dates. And I was hoping Slippy would be on the show because he's actually been to this one multiple times and knows a lot more about it than I do. Uh, he's, he's reported from it live a few times, too. I, I remember it's a bit more of a cram space. It's kind of on an old military barracks or campus or something. So there's a bunch of... Small yeah, I think it's a stuff. Fort Fort Monmouth, I think, is uh, where it's located. Okay. And it's yeah, it's one of the longer running ones too, isn't it? It's been around for quite a few years. Yeah, I think it's the first one actually. Well okay. Slippy must be at the Trenton Computer Festival. The what? <laughs> Trenton Computer Festival? Yeah, that must be where he is today and not set up on the show. What is that? It's right there at the top of the event list. Oh, okay. <laughs> or the New Jersey Makers date. 
could be there too. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking at I was looking at what was going on on Friday. It looks like they're starting out hard, uh, starting like right off Friday morning with like the eight with eight o'clock uh, with eight o'clock panels and everything like that. So Friday is actually pretty packed. They're doing their load okay. in like Wednesday and Thursday. Let's see if they have their schedule. Oh, Thomas Cherry Homes and Fujinets right mm -hmm. off the start, mm -hmm. the first guy. So they did mention they'd never changed the venue intentionally. So I guess just add more days is all you can do to make it bigger if you're not going to change the venue. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Friday. Yeah, you're right. It's it's filled right from the morning to the evening. Oh yeah. Is this, any, are you going to this one, Henry? Like are you in that area yes. or no? You yes. are? Okay. Yeah, I'm only about four hours away, so it's not that bit. It's not that bad for me to get there. Cool. Yeah, because Sloopy Sloopy goes there every year, and there's you know, a few other people that I know that have Cocos. I don't know if they're super active, but it'd be good to have a couple of active people to, you know, convince what the everybody else there why they're wrong for picking their particular retro machine. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. I know kidding. your processor was cheap, but ours is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got the Walmart of processors. Okay, next one after that, of course, is Cocoa Fest itself, May 4th to 5th at Carroll Stream, mm -hmm. Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, near Chicago, the Holly Newton Suite, same place it was last year. As we've mentioned multiple times over the last month, the main hall is already completely sold out, and there's five tables in the auxiliary room or hallway, depending, already uh, sold. Um, this is going to be a good one. Brian Weezer's going to be very busy at it. Interface. <laughs> I Sorry, see you that? have constructed your own multi-pack interface. Your skills <laughs> are now complete. May the 4th. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> now, Henry, you're going to this one too, right? So this is like the second yeah. show in a, a month you're going to. I'm planning, I'm planning on doing this one, uh, v, uh, doing this one, VCF East and uh, Boat Fest. And oh, cool. there, yeah, there's the one in September that I'm trying to remember what it is that I might Midwest. be able to do, but I'm not sure. Candy Assembly? Oh, no, it's that yeah, Candy Assembly. Yeah. Yeah, because that's in Springfield, Ohio, which, uh, Correct. you know, I used, I mean, it's Ohio. Yeah. What about Ohio? <laughs> oh no, it's, it's uh, I I lived in I lived in West Virginia and Kentucky for so long that it's like Ohio. I feel like is easy to get to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, there's Ohio's a lot of a state. <laughs> there's a lot of cool stuff at this one. Like Brian Weezer's bringing you know the deluxe cocoa for one thing. So you guys get to see it in actual action. And that's just part of what he's bringing. He's bringing some other stuff we haven't even told you guys about yet. So. Be there or be square. Speaking of Boat Fest, <laughs> so this is the third annual Boat Fest, June 14th to 16th, at the social event space, a different venue than last year in Hurricane, West Virginia. And uh, I've heard Boat mentioned on Friday they've already sold 20 of the tickets now, and they usually sell most of theirs in the last month. So they do have a limit to how many people they're allowed to have in the venue because of fire regulations, et cetera. So I would probably do it sooner rather than later just to make sure you you can get in. And the new venue is bigger and not too far from the old one. So if you were there last year, it's just a couple blocks away. Yeah, There's some new restaurants in the area. And they had some really good restaurants that Ken and I went to last year as it was. And now they've got some new ones that are in the same area too. So uh, but what good, good eating, I think, is what Aaron called. Sorry? Was the venue last year more of a fire hazard? Well, it was a condemned building, basically. <laughs> so I think the best way to describe it. <laughs> Not quite, but it had some crickety old steps. You had to go, no steps in this one. You just walk in at ground level. So also, uh, Aaron mentioned on his Friday night disaster stream that the old building has been renovated and is now a restaurant itself. So you can still go to the old building and oh, no, you know, the get floor some still as level as it was. Right. Can you set your bowling ball down? Will yeah. it still be there? Be, <laughs> be careful hauling all your cocoa equipment or, uh, through, that, through there because you might go through the floor. Yeah, well, the old one that was a bit of a worry, uh, but the new the new venue is actually you know fairly new and modern, so not no problem. The old there. one was a good workout because every time you walked across the uh, room, no matter which way you're going, it was an uphill walk. Oh, yeah, so cool. And if everybody went to one side, the whole building tilted. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if you weren't kidding. We are talking West Virginia here. <laughs> yeah, it has the famous signs about Wi-Fi too, didn't it, uh, Ken? 
not the Wi-Fi. The, the uh, GPS, don't, don't use yeah. your um, GPS. GPS. GPS, right? Because yeah. your GPS will not work here, <laughs> and it <laughs> doesn't. <laughs> Anyway, it's a great time. It's it's retro computers. It's retro video games. Occasionally, somebody will bring like a pinball machine and some other oddities. There's a lot of interactive stuff. Uh, you get to try out everybody else's platforms. They have game competitions. Um, people bring specialized hardware add-ons and stuff. So it's right from modern to old. It's it's a lot of fun. If you ever watch the Amiga show, it's basically a big group gathering of that. So it, you know everybody's got a sense of humor. That exact same weekend, if you're down more in the Texas area, is VCF Southwest, June 14th to 16th at the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center at the University of Texas, Dallas. Um, As I've mentioned in the last couple months, they have shows within a show, and one of those is a Tandy Assembly, which is all the old Tandy guys getting together, including Mark in our chat. Um, And they're they're planning one evening for all of them to get together. Now, I've seen that they have updated the... uh, Speakers at this one. So Boise is actually doing uh, a talk about the porting OS 9 to the Phoenix 256, which we've covered on the news before. <clears throat> and uh, he ported OS 9 level 2 over to that and got it up and running. And then Jeff Wires of Chronological Gaming is doing uh, a seminar as well. And then Marcel's doing this introduction to digital electronics. So there's uh, already some Cocoa content in the speakers already here too. So they're gradually filling up uh, the speaker slots. And Brendan Donahue and a few other people, you know, Brendan's guy who does the Coco VGA, of course, amongst other things, are going to be there as well, since that's back in their their backyard. VCF Midwest, number 19, the biggest of the VCFs by far. And this year is going to be really huge. Uh, when they did the initial allocation for the hotel, it sold out in like three hours. <laughs> so they've had to book more rooms, etc. Um, so this one is happening on... September 7th to 8th at the Renaissance in Schaumburg uh, Convention Center. And um, September 6th, the evening is basically reserved for vendors, et cetera, to set up. 7th and 8th is for the general public. Um, more rooms have become available since we talked last. Now, unfortunately, I don't know if it's my browser or what, but all these things I can click on and it doesn't do anything. I don't know if anybody else has had that problem on the site. but Oh, I think they're still designing the site. Oh, okay. You, there's a disclaimer going across the bottom that not that most everything's not working. I thought it was just the booking hotel was not working. Well, maybe they've changed it. When I was on it the other day, it said uh, <laughs> anyway. The last year they had what about thirty five hundred to four thousand people, and they're expecting quite a few more this year. So it's it's going to be a big one. It's going to be getting up to like Rainbow Fest size. So if you're into retro in general, and, and this covers everything from mainframes to, to minis to home computers to video NASA game computers. systems, uh, you know, PBX systems for phones, um, general electronic stuff like this, just everything's at the show. And it's the biggest by far. So if you want to catch everything at once, there's quite a few Coco people out there. There's a whole tier city section, I think, Ken. Is that right? Uh, usually, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how it's going to be this year because uh, obviously it's a new venue. So. Yeah, but it's an actual convention center. It's not like a large you know, venue hotel thing. It's like a, an entire building yeah. dedicated to this. So it'll remind me probably of the Comdex style where you had like six convention centers filled up. Hmm. But yeah, I'm going to make it to this one someday. <laughs> and then the last one as uh, henry mentioned is tandy assembly september 27th 29th in springfield ohio and uh, that's at the courtyard by Merritt springfield and i think the only this is far enough in the future they haven't really booked too many people yet um peter satinsky is already uh committed to be an exhibitor and he's one of the show organizers and i don't think they have any schedule on speakers and stuff yet but they do have an open invite for people to uh as you can see on the screen here in the middle, you can actually click on the speakers page and actually get some details to how you can book being a speaker at the show. And I will someday make it to this one as well. And that's it for the upcoming events for now. So okay. we can go for a commercial break and come back with the news. Hello, this is Mark Siegel 
product manager for the Color Computer product line and designer of the Tandy Color Computer 3. And I'm proud to be a citizen of the Coco Nation. Making games for the Coco for over 35 years. Go to my Coco Games website at www.nickmarentes.com for information and pricing of my later games as well as downloads of many of my older games. Coco 2's got personality, lots of practicality, fun, it's sensational, learn, it's educational. Coco 2's expandable, so easily commandable. It's programmable, so term exam grammable. Just you and Coco 2 do what you want to do. Coco 2, the color computer with personality from Radio Shack. Sale price for Christmas giving from $149.95. Radio Shack's Coco 2 do what you want to do. Just you and Coco 2. When you want the latest in TRS-80, Tandy, Dragon, MC-10, and all of their hardware cousins, no matter what it takes, or where news breaks, from around the world, to your nation, Coco Nation News with L. Curtis Boyle. So before I get to the news, I just wanted to mention something I saw in the chat here going between uh, Peter Willard and Mark Oberholzer about VCF Southeast. Now, where is that one? Located? That's the Dallas one, I believe. Okay. Because they're mentioning there's like a fifty dollar entry fee because it merged with the uh, gaming convention as well. Because the VCF Midwest is still free, isn't it? Mm, we'd have to check their website. Well, I tried. I think entrance is oh, entrance yeah. is still free, but uh, I think you have to pay for tables now. Yeah, as exhibitors, kind of like Coca-Cola uh, is doing. What is? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're saying visitor entry, so we'll have to check their website. Yeah, that is a bit expensive. I'm, I'm surprised, actually. Well, no, the VCF Southeast, that is... Da, da, da. That's not the one in Dallas. That's Southwest. Is it? Yeah, Southeast is the old one. Marriott Residence Waverly in Atlanta, Georgia is Southeast. Oh, okay, because I don't even have that in the, the rundown. I mean, even if it's expensive, I should be mentioning it, so... Yeah. Throw, throw me the link in the chat there, Rick, and I'll, I'll grab it for now. I'll add it to the list for the future. Um, not familiar either. It's a new one, but it's expensive, apparently. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I guess there's another VCF there. I'll have to start adding to the list next week. When, when is that one? 
Is it saving brick? Uh, this is from this link is last year's, but the, it's in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's see, how about in this year's? This year's isn't isn't up yet. Oh, okay. Now, they don't have Southeast up yet for this year, but uh, apparently it will be expensive when it comes up. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, we'll start off with the game news and get that out of the way first, because it's a lot less than we were going to have in the main news. So let me share that screen. And since we were speaking of Jim Gary before, here we go. <laughs> So Jim Gary typed in an adventure game called Adventure uh, from Let's Compute magazine. Kind of reminds me of what Henry just did. Um, it spanned five issues. So this actually got stretched over five issues that you typed in parts of it each time from the March of July of 1991. So this is quite late. Um, the problem is the magazine was canceled before the program was complete. So if you had a subscription <laughs> and you've been laboriously typing all the stuff oh. in for months and then the magazine gets canceled, you don't get to finish the game. So Jim at the time was asking in the MC10 group on Facebook if he would have any help or suggestions on finishing the game off. And then he just went and did it anyway. Um, so he said uh, later this week, I think just in the last day or two, that he made a version with the story completed by himself and added a title page for it. And this will require the 16K RAM pack, so 20K. So this is the original version as it was from the magazine transcoded to the MC10. Which I'll just show very briefly here. So, you know, standard text adventure type game. You got buttons to press. And then he uh, kind of gussied it up with his own title screen and kind of finished what he thought the plot should do at the end here. So I'll play just a little bit so you guys can see the title screen. I thought that was kind of cute. Anybody Reminds familiar me that... with... A... Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, a little interject. Anybody familiar with the Wheel of Time uh, series by Robert Jordan? Um, uh, that fa uh, That series famously wasn't finished and so Brandon Sanderson stepped in and finished it. And I always wonder whether or how the series would have ended differently if if uh, Robert Jordan had, uh, you know, lived to finish it. So I yeah. uh, kind of wonder the same thing about this game. It's like I wonder how this ending differs in from how it uh, was originally uh, envisioned. Um, kind of makes you wonder. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, more, well, I know more. Jim and a few others are going to see if they could try to contact the original author that wrote the articles for Compute and see if he you know, obviously had the game ready to go and they just published it across multiple issues. So if they can find him, if the guy still has his discs and stuff, they might be able to actually get it. Or at least maybe he'll remember. By the way, Peter right. Willett in the chat is saying that uh, VCF Southeast is uh, in July, he believes. Which actually, this means it's kind of late. They haven't posted anything yet. It's already mid-March. Right. Last year was July 28th, 29th, and 30th. So why oh, not end of July, year? I guess that gives them a bit more time. But yeah, uh, this is from the VCF uh, main site. So, so I've got the prices on the south uh, southwest pulled up. And uh, uh, I got to flip screens again. Um, adult weekend ticket twenty dollars, student ticket ten, and youth is free. Well, that's not bad. That's not fifty. All right, that's no, less than so half that. Maybe it really is the southeast one then that's went to fifty. Oh, you, yeah. this is Southwest you're talking about or Southeast? Yeah, Southwest in uh, in Dallas. Oh, the Southwest well. we know about did not go up. Okay. It's still 20 bucks for the weekend. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's at University of Texas, so I'm looking at the website here. And so yeah. at the bottom it says uh, uh, $20 for adults. for the pre That's the pre-sale price. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, if you want to check out Jim's take on how this game should have ended, uh, you can go download it. Right. And my question is, how did he decode it? Because it's obfuscated, so you can't solve the game by typing in the program. So he had to figure out how the game solution was encoded to provide a solution. Because if you look at the data statements, they're garbage at the start of a listing. Yeah, it's I like, think that was in the other video, which I unfortunately already closed. Well, that was yeah, but in any case, yeah, it's not as simple as I'll just Jigsaw. add an ending to it. He had to figure out the first nine tenths of it so that he could add the last one tenth of it. <laughs> this this kind of stuff, data. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, now I've got to add some more lines to do that that I don't know about yet that I have to invent myself. <laughs> 
So you have to know how that was created. I don't know. This just might be like a room direction table or something like what rooms you can exit to. That might not be garbage. Well, but I, it's not garbage, but it's like, you know, look at 5080. You know, we've got verbs kind of obfuscated by numbers. And then we go down here and we've got numbers in the string and we don't know what the boundaries of those numbers are. So it's really hard to figure out what the data is saying. So the people who type in the program wouldn't know how to play the game from typing in the program. The yeah, I'd have to see the original program because it uh, to me it doesn't look that obfuscated. Um, mm -hmm. But he's got the RAM in thirty six seventy five. Get the room number, and it's a mid string, a value of the mid string. So the numbers in there are actually the room number that you're going in that direction. Like the first might be north, the second south. That's the same type of thing I used to do. I, I just didn't do it as a single string. I just did it in array. Right, but you got to unmap all of this crap. Yeah, yeah, you so have to go through it. So that you can create data statements to finish. I, I guess it depends, too, how far was, along mm -hmm. it had gotten. Like, because they published five out of six parts, you know, it depends what was in that final six parts. Right, right the cliffhanger all, ending. All, yeah. the all the data statements. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> you are in nothing. You see nothing. You can go nothing. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, it's mind ball or whatever the yeah, it's mine rolls first level all over again. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, next up, Paul Shoemaker. I think he'll be bringing this demo amongst others to the show actually, because he's actually going to be attending his first Cocoa Fest ever uh, with the rest of us here. So, so uh, he's been working on you know various transcodes. He's worked on the Oregon Trail port from the Apple II in the past, for example. Um, that was a hybrid machine language and basic one. I think he got stuck somewhere there. So one of us is going to have to help him with that. Um, but he decided to see what, you know, could have happened if somebody ported the Apple II hit game. How do you pronounce this? Is Ken or uh, Mark oh, back around? Is it Karateka? Karateka? Karateka. Um, so at this point, he does not plan on finishing it. He just wanted to see what it would look like as kind of a thought of experiment. So he actually has a little bit of a demo, which I'll run for the minute it lasts. There's no sound. A little Broderbund uh, thing, and then a game by Jordan Michener. Title screen. Some fancy scrolling text. This is for the audio listeners, of course, can't see any of this. I won't bother reading it. If you want to see it, uh, you can check out the video on Facebook in the Coco group, or you can check out pretty well any version of the game on other platforms. This is all in, in Cocoa 1, 2, I should mention, P-Mode 4, Artifact Colors. This is not requiring a Cocoa 3 or anything. A nice smooth scroll with a special large custom font. And the initial screen with uh, some of the characters. There you go. So it looks pretty cool. Um... If people want to meet about the fest, I encourage them to continue onboarding it. <laughs> now, uh, for those of you that have played this game on the apples and et cetera, is this, was this, I'm assuming it was a machine language game, not a basic game? I'm not even sure. This is one oh, I've never played yeah. on the apple. No, it was yeah. machine language. Yeah, the definitely. It was language. awesome. Yeah, I don't think you could do full screen high res graphics on the apple and basic, could you? Yep, yeah, HDR and HDR too. Oh, okay. But you were pretty limited. You had shape tables, which were kind of cool, though mathematically complex. It wasn't the quickest thing in the world. And you could H plot a line, H plot from and to points to, or, or H plot individual points, I should say. And I think you could do a poke to do an HCLS or whatever they called it uh, yeah. to through the screen a certain color. And after that, that's it. There's no circle. There's no paint. There's no box. Oh, there's no bar. Fun, fun little thing on Karateka. Um, do you know how they got those absolutely amazing movements put together? Pretty well the same way that. he did that other game later on uh, where his brother was the volunteer to... Yep, he wrote yeah, a scope. Yeah. That's the term I was trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's even found some of his original film footage he's published up on YouTube and stuff that uh, show his brother like running around. I think even his dad did some of it, if I remember, didn't he? Like the running rolls and you know jumping onto a platform and all that kind of stuff 
Yeah, it's a fascinating history about that the whole the set of games that he did. Next up, this is a kind of an interesting one here for the old timers. <clears throat> so, website six five or sorry, website uh, YouTube channels the six five zero two show, which generally covers you guessed it six five zero two, has actually been doing some sort of stuff that's been on other platforms as well, including six eight hundred, the six eight zero nine, etc. And what he did here is he rescued some discs and some old text-based games that were from an archive of flex discs originally for 6800 and 6809. And he rescued six of these text games and he's actually published them up. Um, so I don't usually hear the word flex and games in the same sentence because <clears throat> usually it was meant as a more of a business CPM style operating system than anything else. So you, you know, there's tons of word processors and assemblers and compilers and all kinds of stuff. Uh, games usually were like, you know, Eliza or, you know, text-based checkers or stuff. But he actually found it for like, like a Star Trek game and a few other things. So the video is actually kind of interesting. And he does things quite old Hi. school. Welcome to the 6502 show. Today, I've got a pile of games that were rescued from a forgotten archive of Flex 2 discs. All this stuff runs in basic except for one. So let's get into it. Fast forward a little bit. Whist, and it's the Swedish variety. So, of course, they're all, all going right. to be text based, and he's running them on Dan terminals Monster here. So. 68 up and running. Well, there she is. Okay. Caps lock on. Let's uh, first load up the um, compact flash drive catalog and see where Swedish Whist is Wait, going skip to skip all that. One. Said it was 441, but 4. And it looks like Lars took the trick. Damn you, Lars. All right. So they're, they're mostly text-based, you know, terminal-style games, um, which were, you know, fairly common on Flex and even normal sound level one, for that matter. Um, but yeah, just, just finding an archive of some of the stuff that was written back in like 79, 80 type thing. That, that's that's pretty cool that, you know, the stuff was recovered without it being lost forever. And uh, most of the games he had here was Wist, Swarms, Hate, World War, Rocket Launcher, and Mini Trek VTL2. And... Uh, you know, they're 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 text based, but they're still you know if if any of uh, any of the people viewing or listening to this or on the panel for that matter that were back around in the early days, like Rick Ulan, obviously you mentioned that you played stuff on a teletype. Um, you know, this is the type of thing that you would have been playing all the time and just been amazed by because you actually have something you can interact with as a single player type thing. You don't require somebody else sitting across the table with a board between you to play a game type thing. So this 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 brought a lot of nostalgia back for me. I'd never played any of these particular ones except for the mini trek. I have played a version of that on a different system. But uh, it's not too often you hear about, you know, games on Flex and, and stuff being recovered in Flex aside from the main Flex archive. So that was really cool. Right. The machine played back. That was different. Yeah. Yeah. And he sent some other 6809 stuff. He's even mentioned OS9 level one in, in one of his videos. So I, he obviously sticks much more to the 6502 based systems because that's what the title of his channel um, but he does cover a fair bit of 6800 because there was a lot of commonality in the early, early days, like in the mid to late 70s of systems that were basically running the same, you know, programming languages, and et cetera. Um, and the mini truck one was actually in VTL2 language. It's not in basic like the rest of them are. <clears throat> this next one here was actually uh, sent to me. Uh, by the Wargaming Scribe. Now, he has his own uh, website that he goes for war games on every platform. And he's done several batches of uh, Cocoa-based games, like a lot of the stuff by... Uh, you guys did across the Rubicon. Why am I blanking on the name? Arc Royal Games and a few others uh, that were on the Cocoa. Uh, but he contacted me about this site, and this site is actually going through all Star Wars games or Star Wars related games. So both official titles that were part, you know, licensed and uh, other ones that are just, you know, uh, you know blatant clones. And uh, he's been going through all, you know, Terra City model one and three and Apple twos and all kinds of stuff. And he's uh, now on entry number 277 and he's done this first Cocoa one. And then this one case here, he did uh space war by spectral, which came out on the Cocoa in 81 and the dragon in 82 as a launch title. And he calls it Pink Star because he's playing like he's the guy's from Russia, actually. And uh, the site's in Russian. I actually have it running through Google Translate at the moment here. But uh, yeah, he's he's playing the dragon versions, of course, no artifact colors. So he, 
they changed it to be the uh, pastel, Nick's favorite palette of all time. Oh, and uh, then you get to see the uh, pink Death Star and stuff. So I thought that was funny. He wasn't too impressed with it. Um, then he also did The Force, originally called Invasion Force by Antico Software. This was actually a cartridge uh, option. Uh, by Charles Rosalind, who also wrote articles for Rainbow, I actually had a regular column there teaching machine language. Well, that's a screenshot of that one. So that's actually kind of like you're flying in the trench and you got to, you know, not run into the bars that are across the middle of the trench on occasion. You got uh, TIE fighters to shoot at the top and you have these uh, holes. I think you have to drop bombs in as well. So it's unfortunately a fairly simple game. I don't think we've covered this one on the Game On Challenge. Um, it's an underwater I... version. That <laughs> could be the atmosphere. Um, not that the Death Star had an atmosphere. I seem to remember seeing it last week. Yeah, you know, on one of the panel members playing it, it was just a little bit wonky on the uh, diagonal. Yeah, Bob, it's probably would have been you. I'm guessing it was playing it. Do you, if you're still on the call, haven't you looked? I don't know if you remember. More than likely, what 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 was the game? Uh, the Force or Invasion Force by Antico. Hmm. Which did for Antenna Corporation because they sold antennas and stuff too. It's on the yeah, screen right now if you recall. can see it. I don't recall playing that. Yeah, I'm looking at it. And his comment, of course, is well, at least the Death Star is in pink. <laughs> 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 so that that one he gave a slightly better review. It's not incredibly you know, an in-depth game. It was only 16k one. Um the sound effects are okay. The graphics run fairly smooth. Um, it's it's not a bad game. It's not a great game. Um, it's probably one of Antico's better ones. They also did Eight Ball Pool, which is a fairly decent one as well. And they redid some other ones, like they did Caterpillar Attack and a few others for Tom Mix and some. I think even from Computerware, they sold actual cartridges for the Coco. One of the few you know third parties that sold them. There's the cover from the uh, UK version, of course. Which actually mentioned specifically the Tier City Color Computer, and not the the Dragon at the time. But they went through both versions of Star Trench Warfare um, by Fred Skirbo, who was also a column writer for Rainbow, and actually ran Illustrated Memory Banks. So we had a very simple version that was a type in from Rainbow in '82, and then he did a commercial version called Advanced Star Trench Warfare. We added some more stuff uh, to the gameplay itself, and he also added in some better effects, etc. Now, the one version he's got here for the gameplay, I'm guessing somebody did try to type this in from Rainbow and screwed it up because I've typed it in from Rainbow way back in the day and it did not run as badly as it does here. Um, I'll play just a little bit of it. If it will let me, maybe it won't. Yeah, I don't know why it's not letting me, but at any rate, um, it leaves the ship behind sometimes when you kill it. So you got a ghost TIE fighter sitting in the screen and stuff and the scrolling of the trench does not work properly. Like there's a few things really busted with it. Um, so uh, somebody, if that's the version that's on the archive, somebody needs to go in and correct it. Cause I know I played it and it didn't do that back in the day. As you can see here, it's leaving the ghost version of it behind. And this is supposed to be scrolling using page flipping techniques. And it doesn't every once in a while it moves. And this one line here is totally wrong. It should be exactly diagonal matching the, the vertical lines of the trench here. And it's, you know, oh, that's it over. the one I saw. That's the one oh, I yeah. saw. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, that, that that's that's wrong. <laughs> and then here's the advanced version. Uh, and this one actually did the page flipping properly. The ships didn't leave garbage behind. You actually had a power meter on the bottom uh, that you actually get a, a recharge where it flies you super fast through the trench and recharges your energy back up as you go between waves. And if you get shot, you, your windshield cracks and stuff. This is the one he actually sold. And he was one of the few people that, you know, right up until 82, 83 was still selling basic arcade games, you know, games written basically without a lick of ML in them. And he did know a few techniques that were a bit, you know, new to a lot of people like page flipping and stuff that our basic actually could handle. So the game actually didn't play too bad. The one problem I have with it is just too random. The TIE Fighters only show up in, in nine specific spots of screen. You basically have to guess where it might go next and move your site to shoot it there. But it's it's so random. It's It's basically chance. It's it's just like rolling dice, like you have no real control. There's the ad from Rainbow at the time. And then it does kind of a flipping the color sets here when you get hit. 
Anyway, I've sent us some suggestions of some other ones because uh, a couple other Star Trek based games, and I was hoping maybe some of you guys could maybe throw in a few that you might remember. Um, Nitro Sign UU includes a text adventure game that was ported from, I think, the Apple II of an actual Star Trek or Star Wars game, sorry. Uh, um, what's that? Star Wars, isn't it? Not Star Trek. Yeah, no, it's Star Wars. Yeah, I, I said that wrong. I, you can tell which one I prefer. Um, <laughs> The other one that's uh, kind of uh, an outlier, it's not an official one, uh, is Sizigi by Spectral Associates, which is kind of a graphical, semi-real-time graphical adventure game with some arcade elements to it. Like there's a part where you go into a dark room and you actually have a lightsaber fight with Darth Vader in the dark where you can't really see him, but you can actually wave the the saber around and stuff here too. And, and if you look at a viewport, you'll actually see like stars and a, a planet scrolling by and stuff like that. So it's actually a pretty cool game written by Scott Cabot. Um so I suggested that one as well because it's definitely Star Wars based. Now, can you guys think of any other Star Wars based games on the Coco or ones that are clones Return of Star Wars? Return of the Jedi. Oh, there's a good one. Yeah, I forgot to mention that one. Beat you to it. Any any others anybody can think of? I'm trying you to think of Tandy. Uh, you mentioned the Star Wars. Uh... Adventure game for OS nine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know of any others actually. Yeah, we have a lot of Trek based ones, but not not as many. Star oh, Wars. It wasn't there one? There wasn't there a game called Trench that was like in, like listed in Rainbow? You had to type. Yeah, it that's in. the one we just covered here. Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> I was distracted. <laughs> um, okay, all right, yeah, that's all the ones I can think of too. Okay. Yeah, I can't think of like any Coco cool Three ones in specific at all. We have a bit of a dearth of Star Wars games. Somebody might have to fix that. Hey, Nick. Huh. <laughs> I Just making sure you're awake. I need to new toy. <laughs> over and over and. <clears throat> Anyway, next up on the Game On News is um, Tim and AJ of uh, My Drunk Sibling YouTube channel return to the Coco because they, of course, mix it up between different uh, our, our home consoles and home computers. And uh, episode 126, the one they just released yesterday, is on... Uh, how do you pronounce this again? Did we ever figure that out? Slay the Nereus? Nereus? How do you guys say it? Nereus. I always pronounce it Nereus. But that's that just that's just me. And is is this like a real word? I haven't had time to look it up. Is that something that's based on a real word? Or is it totally made up? It is. Is which one? <laughs> it's a real word. It is a real animal. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I always said one... it wrong then. So one nereus, two nereus. What do we got here? Um. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't decline like that. Nereus's. Nereus's. <laughs> it looks like a flipping millipede. Oh, that would make sense because, I mean, this is a centipede clone, millipede oh, clone yeah. type thing. So it is a Nereus. Anyway, it's Spectral Associates version of Centipede. Now, unlike some of their other games, like the Space War we mentioned a bit earlier here, this is, uh, or Microbes, which was a continuation of Color Meteoroids that Spectral put out with a bit of polish added to it. Um, this is one they never sold on their own. Uh, even though they had a centipede clone done, they got you know rights with Radio Shack to sell it as a cart, and they sold it exclusively through Radio Shack. They never sold it on their own. Um, now, since we haven't actually played clips from their show for a while now, I thought I'd play a little clip here. Just some people have never seen their show before can see the amount of humor. I don't think there's going to be any blue words on this particular little chunk I'll play here, but I could be wrong because they sometimes swear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, welcome to Sibling Rivalry. <laughs> yeah, where we were playing Slay of the Nereus. He pronounced oh, it differently again. <laughs> Nereus. 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 Hey, we're we're on the Coco today. The color computer. The color computer. Everybody's favorite. My favorite. <laughs> uh, Tim, tell me about Nereus. Uh, apparently, it is some fish thing. This is a nautical themed game. It is a takeoff of Millipede. Um, uh, one player at a time, so we'll be playing for points. 
You're keeping track at home? We always play for points, almost always, anyway. Yeah, one player at a time, though, if you're keeping track at home. Best two um, out of three? I do want to say that uh, Grandma Florence bought me this game. Grandma? <laughs> she did? Mom's mom. My mo Our mom's mother. Wow, very progressive of her. Yes. How did she know? <laughs> I asked her for it. <laughs> Were you guys out shopping one day and you said, I really want this? She said, yeah. okay, I'll buy it for you. Probably was unsafe. I anyway, mean, you get a lot of extra backstory there, so. <laughs> anyway, they're, they're a lot of fun. They were actually both at the fest. Uh, Tim obviously has been at the fest numerous times, and Tim's actively involved in the uh, Coco and now the Deluxe Coco uh, ports to MAME, uh, which if you have not got a copy of now, you should go get the uh, ROM. It's up on the Color Computer Archive. Uh, you may have to add the disk ROM to the zip file, but then it works fine with uh, MAME 273 and up, I think it is. And you can join in the fun of figuring out all the new commands and how they work. But uh, I think a good review of it. And actually, they, it turns out uh, they both really liked the game, so they played a lot more than three rounds. They went, uh, or three games each, they actually went quite a bit further. They're having a lot of fun. Uh, next up, Marco Spitaletti, as announced on the Color Computer Group on Facebook, uh, that his game called Acme Inc. was has been entered in the basic 10-liner contest. And it says it's a new multitask game. I'm not quite sure what's meant by that. I'm hoping somebody on the panel had a chance to play this. But basically, he posts about the game itself, and he's got his own itch.io page that you can actually download it. And uh, it's on one of those pages where you can contribute money if you want, but you don't have to. So if you want to support his endeavors. Now, one thing a bit more unique about this compared to some of the other games, we've had some other basic programming contests and stuff too, is that this was written with UG Basic, which is a cross-compiled basic that you host on a you know a modern PC, and then it assembles 6809 code based on your basic input, and then you can play it on the real thing. But it's basically you know fully compiled to machine language. Um so this is this kind of a design here, and we'll switch over to his HIO site where you can see some screenshots. Now, the other thing about UG Basic or uh, Micrographics Basic, so it's short for, is that it is cross-platform not only on your host, but it's also cross-platform the destination. So the exact same basic code or very minor tweaks will run on multiple machines. So this particular one is available for all the Atari 8-bit machines like the 400, the 800, the XL, and the XE. The Coco 1 and 2, I presume it works on the 3 as well. And also, the this is a machine I'm not familiar with, an Olivetti ProDesk PC-128. Anybody else heard of that one? I have no idea what that machine I don't even know what a CPU is. But yeah, as you can see on his uh, HIO page, you can see he's got some Atari screenshots here. And he's got some of the Coco screenshots here in P-Mode 3. Um, I'm guessing he's probably in Europe, and that may be why he didn't pick an artifact color. Uh, mode to put on the Coco 3 so you get color on you know even you know PAL based systems but uh yeah let, let's look at what unless he's added new back end support the three um assemblers that he's supporting are um the uh, AD80 sorry the Z80 assembler uh 6502 assembler and uh the 6809 assembler so those are you know three platforms you can target he might have added a new one I haven't looked recently okay now, has anybody in the panel had a chance to try this? Because this was announced early in the week, no. and it's a free download. So I was wondering, like, I think Alan, I don't know if he's still on. Is Alan Murphy still on? Yep. Did you get a chance to try this one? Because I think you Yes, kind of... I did. Oh, oh, there we go. Let's have a review. What'd so uh, at first, it's a little confusing because basically the way the barrels roll at you, you're like, oh, yeah, okay. I just need to move up or down or fast or forward. But things don't work until you start running. But once you get that, then, yeah, okay, you're, you're dodging barrels coming at you. So if you look on the, on the bottom screen there, the screenshot, you can see the coyote running uh, in a loop. You can see his feet are doing the, the cartoon. Oh, down circle. here? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you have to basically push off and get going. Otherwise, the barrels will just run you over. Okay. So basically, you're, you're running from left to right, or the, I guess the barrels are scrolling. And yeah, the you're barrels trying to dodge scroll at you until you start mo running. It was kind of odd. Okay, then when did you start running, what happens? Do you, does your character move to the right as well to make it harder? Yeah, yeah you yeah, it's much you know, much less time to to move out of the way. Okay, and is it and progressively you moving further to the right as you go, or how does that work? Well, yeah, up to a point, it, you you can't go too far over. 
Um, the and it's kind of cool that you can get hit in the ears sometimes and you're okay. <laughs> it's like you get your hair blown by, but uh but yeah, you don't want to catch a barrel in the feet or the 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 sun. And once you're fully fully going, you know, your your space on the screen is much smaller. So it, it does become a little easier to dodge until there's more and more barrels, which they do they do add more. Oh, so you really lean forward and get yeah less tall as you run faster. So yeah, grab it, give it a try. It's pretty, you know, a, it's a 10 line. I mean, I tried looking at the 10 lines. There are 10 big lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess my question for you then, because I haven't seen it run yet, is how well does it run? What, what types of sounds are in there, if any? Because uh, if this is oh, compiled basic, remember. I'm really curious what it what it runs like. Uh, yeah, I don't remember because what I ended up doing was immediately thinking of something that I wanted to try with UG Basic. So then I got distracted. Oh, okay. I have to write something else. Shiny. Okay. Is that, do you think this would be worthwhile doing a game on challenge at some point? Because it'd be nice to promote the UG Basic platform, uh, maybe with a sample game so people can see what that basic can do. Yeah, I. I don't think that this is going to be a game on challenge thing for like Tasman and those folks. Uh, I, you know, th this is a 10 line challenge thing to prove it can be done and it works, but it's not going to be one of these where you're going to replay a lot. Okay. It's fun, but it's, it's, you know, just a quick pickup. Wow. Look what you can do with UG basic. So on the game on challenge, fire it up, play it a few times and see what you think. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Uh, Ken, are you still here? But I wouldn't do this for no, two No, I'm weeks. not. Why? So I was thinking maybe, uh, like, from what you're describing there, Alan, it, it sounds like this is a, you know, a, a cute game and a good, you know, way of showing off what UG Basic can do in 10 yeah. lines, but it's probably not a game you want to center a game on challenge around. But right. do we want to maybe throw it in one of the next couple of weeks here as a little bonus side game type thing? Oh, yeah. a third one. Oh, we can promote it on the live show. And yeah. get some people to play it. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I'd like to see what people think of this and then surprised. and then see what kind of people would you know, once people get kind of interested in it because of the fact it's you know it's you writing in basic to make this, if the game runs really well, is maybe encourage some people to actually give UG Basic a try, which is an ongoing moving target from what I understand. He's still adding a ton of stuff for all the different platforms and stuff, correct? He's I think he's adding Cobra 3 support right now. Yep. So here, here's a concept. The high score is any UG basic game. Don't tell them which game. <laughs> that way you'll have to try a bunch of UG basic games to figure out what the best high score is going to be. Oh, the like mystery the game. Yeah. <laughs> I downloaded it and played it, and it was like he described. The other thing is um, the, the drawing of the character is perfect. I mean, if you, <laughs> yeah. look, you cool. blow it up with your camera and look at it, it looks great. There, let's see. Uh, I can rescale it so it didn't. Yeah, you hear you hear sound effects in your head from the cartoon. Cool. <laughs> yeah, you can't and see you can, there, there could be it. sequels to this for other UG Basic demo games. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell there, but it. Uh... Yeah, this kind of resemble a wily e. coyote there. It, it's good, right? The run in wily e. coyote is is good for the pixels it has, right? It's yeah, especially people with three, where you only got one twenty eight by one ninety two and four rather garish colors. Yeah, the personality does come through, and it's named Acme, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Acme. Right. That's perfect. Standard Warner Brothers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Company well, of all stripes. Since they've tried trashing the movie, which there is one that they won't release, this is uh, this is what you get. It's the movie tie-in game. Now that this contest is still ongoing, like this is an entry now, but it's not a winner or anything because I haven't decided on the winners yet. I believe. I, I recently um, uh, downloaded or played um, Stevie Stroh's uh, game. Cosmic Aliens, and that has some Star, Star Wars um, effects in it and song.
That's the German Have we ever part. done that on the, the game? I I played his Cosmic Aliens a long, long time ago, like when it first came out, but I don't think I've played it since. Deadline for submissions is today. Oops. Award ceremony is April 6th, so the winners will be revealed on April the 6th. I better get going on that then. Well, I'm trying to remember CET. What uh, time zone 20, is that? 25 minutes. <laughs> I get on Central it. I'll European, get on it. Just Central enough time. time. It's like uh, UTC plus one, I think. Yeah, that's two minutes a line um, plus upload time. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, send them that breakout thing there. They won't know it wasn't by somebody else. Uh, I think you already missed it. I don't want nobody seeing me peeing. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is an annual contest, and there's different c categories mm, for like sure. how long a basic mm. line can be and that kind of stuff, and whether it's compiled or regular basic. And yes, we brought this up before. Yeah. Yeah. I've brought it up, I think, the last couple of years, and I think we've even had Jim Gary's in it a few times. So. In fact, if I remember, one of the guys that regularly goes to Boat Fest and is a regular on the Amigos chats is actually one of the judges. Where to Can't send your sure. money? Yeah. No, he's really hard to bribe. I've tried. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Okay. Anyway, that's it for the Game On news. So that, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, game. I'll see if I can get a chance to download this week and give it a try myself. Because um, it definitely sounds interesting. Especially for ten lines of basic, um, and I really want to see what the what the uh, performance of the compiler is. And it sounds like from what you've mm. been describing, Alan, it's actually pretty impressive. Okay, I now I'll a, switch over to the regular news. I Go ahead, Rob. I have an update to my uh, joystick stuff. You want to okay. see it real quick? Sure. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> are we waiting? Huh. Oh well, what was it going to do? Oh, that, that, here we go in a loop again. Up here, and the um, as long as it's not an endless loop. Yeah, really. Um, I have to update. I found a uh, joystick like uh, um, Brian found with the gray cord to it. And uh, it's here. It has a strange, look at the mechanism in there. And this is hmm. real tall. That's I think I have seen one of those mechanisms in a Black Beauty before. Have you? And this is the bottom. It has uh, pat pending in the number, which is normal. But uh, it looks like it only has two screws. Not, no, it has four. It has tape on it, which I haven't touched. It's been on forever and then um what else the uh joysticks i got for uh, my uh, tdp 100 only have two screws and that's this one mm -hmm. and this is the one with the the can you zoom line. that picture up that's been um modified someone's hacked it yeah, but uh, it's the same as what he has, and it has the st this strange mechanism. And look how tall the, you know, this is a, a normal one, I guess. This is real tall, and this is kind of stubby, short. And so does the normal the one say one. patent pending or patent? Yeah, pat pend, it says. Well, the, the, the tall one says pending. What would the other one say? Let's see. One more thing to show. I know you got it in there. Here's here's the bottom of the. Uh, that one's got two screws. That's got two screws. No um, other holes. And, and it's, it's indented. It, well, the others are too, I think. Well, it's made in Japan, so that one was expensive. Yeah, it says Japan, but there's no number. You know, there's right. no. Uh, it, there's no patent number, and it was expensive because it came from Japan. Well, what I'm saying is no 26 number. Could, so they, could those just be a non Radio Shack? Uh, right. third party. Maybe they were going to sell them to like crap. Same molds. Were there a, was there a TDP version of this joystick? Yeah, that's the one yes. I was showing you. Mm. Now I'm wondering if um, T 
Terry, uh, he has a bunch of them. You know, he, he might show. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think he's here anymore. No. Right. But the, even the two screw version is set up for screws. You just Except that other one you showed, which doesn't even have the, the markings. Well, right. But I'm just yeah. saying the two that he just showed are the same thing. And he just didn't put screws in one of them. You know, this thing a... is completely different. And it didn't yeah. come from any Radio Shack supplier no. because they don't sell stuff that was paid. In no, but this is the TDP 100. And somebody took a little etching thing and put an A in here for the A controller. And the B controller has a B in it that, you know, somebody wrote with a, you know, a, one of those vibrating. So why would they not use Tandy's joysticks? It's weird. I mean, it was Sears. So why why wouldn't they just use Tandy's joysticks with TDP and the, slapped on? And the other thing mm -hmm. is, um, the one that has two, are, I wonder if, the, are they there? They could be there. I mean, the, no, I the, mean, the, the molding is, the way yeah, you would wide, mold it. But... Oh, you're yeah, saying, yeah. would that one have it? Strange. It's a similar joystick from a different lineage. Yeah. That TDP joystick is not related to the two Tandy. By the way, Joel Evie in the chat says, uh, my original pair of Black Beauties from June of 1981 also has that same mechanism and stick. And I think I remember one of my so friends who got a Coco before I did had one of those. It's a little wide, you know, half arc. Yeah, right. and it rocks back and forth and it goes yeah. side to side. Yeah, I have and seen I that before, that. but only the once. I seem to remember some of the jo uh, the joysticks that I had as a kid had the uh, had the tall aluminum, not the fat aluminum. Yeah, yeah, I had tall. I didn't I, even know I about the fat till recently. <laughs> so this probably never could have a cover because of the way it's built. You know, right. the other ones do. Black Beauties you know have mean? a cover. Yeah. Well, they're just kind of molded. Look, it's a see here. Oh, the ball. There's okay. Ball. Yeah. yeah, the ball. Right. And this is the one that doesn't have anything on top. So. But this is the cheaper, newer version of that same mechanism, is I guess. Yeah, you found some rare oddities there. I, and I'm it's curious cool. if next yeah. time on with Terry's back on here, since he does have some TDP stuff, uh, maybe check to see if his TDP joysticks are the same as what you got there. Yeah, and here we are, um, seven years later, talking about the same black joysticks. I don't know if they're stupid joystick. Or... Yeah. Well, no, we're talking about different black joysticks. We're not talking yeah, about the same there. ones. <laughs> well, I, they probably covered the the uh, craft ones, right? Back in the back in the day, in the beginning. Right. No one cared about the black beauty. That was the cheap yeah. joystick. Who no. cares? It works good enough. Goodbye. Yeah, got well, the the, the, the the craft ones that Tandy sold didn't come out for three or four years until after the black beauty. So. That's all we had for the Coco Ones run. Yeah. Yeah, I was a little nervous when I first got my uh, Tandy 1000s to plug in a Black Beauty into the, you know, they fit in. And I wondered if they would work. And they did. <laughs> all right. You never you never see uh, a Tandy 1000 sold with a Black Beauty, though, I don't think. No, nah, no. Nah. Well, yeah. After you spent that much for the computer, they wouldn't yeah. even give you one for free. That would be <laughs> embarrassing. You got to, you know. All right, to continue on to the regular news now. So some of you have seen the posts about this on Facebook at Pixel Attic Magazine, which is a UK-based magazine. When you want. The cover story on their issue 19 that comes out in a week. Um, and this is both a physical print magazine or a PDF. You can order it either way. And it's kind of got Tandy, the story of an electronics giant. And it's even got the Coco and stuff mentioned in it. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have never heard of this magazine before. Um, I have. It's... Um, there's a couple guys that are uh, members of the Amiga's Discord that actually are actively involved with this, and they actually have a sister publication called Amiga Addict, which has actually been out several years longer. But Pixel Addict is basically covering all retro systems, and it's definitely got a gaming slant to it. Um, so they've got kind of preview pages you can see on their website here. You can see, you know, here's the Coco One pre you know, featured prominently. There's Charles Tandy. You know, the original Radio Shack stores from way back, Steve Ledinger and stuff that helped create some of the you know early machine co computer machines for the uh, Radio Shack Tandy brand and kind of a history of the whole thing. And then it's 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 I'm really interested to hear about the UK perspective because um, Tandy was famous in the UK for overpricing the crap out of their computers compared to everybody else. Like even us people in Canada and Australia, like Nick, you know, we were used to our dollar, you know, being way below par with the US. We were paying a 30 to 50 percent premium. But the UK pound was actually worth more than the dollar, and they were still paying double the price what you know would they would have paid 
in North America. So they were kind of getting rooked. And I don't know if that had to do with, you know, VAT tax or what happened or just Tandy being greedy. Um, but basically it, it didn't do well at all there because it's just, you know, once a dragon especially came out, it was like half the price to get a dragon with a better, better keyboard and some extra hardware, like, you know, you know, real parallel port and stuff. So it's kind of, kind of surprising, but anyway, um, I wanted to bring this one up both because it's interesting and you, and people that have a lot of cross platform, uh, computers and video game consoles might like this magazine in general, uh, but also might, of course, like it because of the Tandy history. But the other reason is, is that on March the 30th, we're going to have the guys, uh, two of the guys from the magazine as guests. Um, uh, for those of you on the Amigos Discord, Pixels at Dawn is his nickname on the Discord. But Ian, he's uh, one of the writers and he, he does more work on the Amiga Attic magazine than he does on, on Pixel Attic. But he writes you know stories for them occasionally as well. And then the actual publisher, um, the main publisher editor guy, uh, Paul Monaghan. He's the main editor of the magazine, and they will both be on to kind of talk about the history of the two magazines, how they got this all started. You know, the gamble of actually trying to do a print magazine about computers in the 2020s, which is pretty well unheard of these days. Uh, but they've actually been going successfully enough. They launched a, sis, a second sister magazine. So I'd be curious to talk about that. But if you guys have any questions about this or if you guys order the PDF version of this one and, and look at the history of the Tandy and, and the Radio Shack as they explain it. And have any questions for you know the two of them or questions on the magazines in general, then uh, have your questions ready by March 30th because they will be our special guests. Next up, we have George Jansen released a, a two-parter. Um, basically, it's less than 10, part one and part two, because it got a bit long. And uh, in this case, he's getting into Coco 3 assembly language series, uh, going back to the graphics. And this time he's starting to work on modes that are not necessarily supported by basic because basic has H screen. What is it? Zero through four, which covers 320 by 192, four and 16 color, um, 640 by 192, two and four color. Maybe it's 320 by 192, two color. I haven't used basic in a loss. I can't remember. You guys can correct me. Uh, but, you know, the Gimme chip is capable of much, much more. There's, you know, two other vertical resolutions you can do. There's the by 200, which actually displays 199 due to a quirk. And there's the by 225 mode, which Nick and a few others have used quite extensively to give you a lot more vertical space. And, of course, there's really odd mode, or not odd, but there's a whole bunch of other screen resolutions you can pick from. And I know Nick um, has, has done quite a few of these because you can actually make math calculations and stuff easier. Say you do 256 wide, 16 color versus, say, a 320, which is kind of an odd odd size for doing calculations skipping between lines and uh i think on stuff like gate crasher and uh not zero hour but um your big shoot em up what is it called nick i'm blanking for some stupid gunstar. Reason. thank you gunstar aside from the title screen gunstar uses a slightly lower res mode too to keep the speed of the graphics up while you're doing you know multi-channel sound effects in the background too so um George just kind of goes through a, a thing about how to set up the gimme, um, the different registers for horizontal and vertical resolution, color depth. <clears throat> and then his second part goes into a bit more detail here. So I just wanted to show this. <clears throat> so you can see some of the resolutions he's got listed here. And these are just higher ones. He's not actually listing the most, you know, the, the lower ones that some of the other games have actually used. But it also shows you how much RAM they take on the right-hand side there. So you can see there's pretty big differences on some of these. And if you do some of the extended ones, you can actually start taking like, you know, you'll need basically equipment of 40K just to do one screen. Uh, on the other hand, if you do like a 256 by uh, 200 two color, which is, you know, P-Mode 4 with a few extra pixels, it's only six, six and a half K or just under. And then he's got, of course, the, on the left, you can see the equivalents of eight screen one, two, three, and four. So that's the resolutions and how you set up the gimme to do the ones that basic has built in. But there's a lot more other ones, a lot more uh, horizontal and vertical sizes. So I'll play just a little bit and kind of get a, a feel for the series if you've not seen it before. But basically, it's been, uh, George has been doing an assembly language tutorial series specifically targeted to the Coco 3. We've had a, quite a few, and there's multiple ones ongoing we'll be getting up to shortly in the news today as well that are you know covering all the Cocos. But uh, he said the first one has really done a Coco 3 specific one. Bring up the basic program. Okay, and it's loaded and I died to actually run it so you can see on the screen what it's going to ask for. Either one, two, three, or four. There's the four of them I said we'd test. We'll test them four. 
The other thing was to load our base, our program in. The other one is to exit. Okay, so let's uh, oh, let's post uh, part of it and give you just an idea. And I'm not very good at basic, so I don't do a lot of tricky stuff. I kind of like to spell it all out. So in here, if you typed in a one, you would get get down here to line 170, and you're going to poke in one one into the definition. All right, I'm going to go flip back and forth here so it makes you understand. That's this test right up here with this dashes. So you go through an explanation, a little bit of a demo at the tail end of the second part of Lesson 10 uh, to show some of the screen resolutions that you can get, including ones that are not normally supported by BASIC. And uh, there's a lot of variety. So, I mean, if you have, you know, if you have a game that you really want 16 colors, but you want, you know, better speed than trying to do a full 320 by 192, you can you know chop it down to quite a bit lower than that. You can make it like one twenty eight by ninety six with sixteen color or something like that. There's a bunch of odd modes. Um, if you want a good reference for that, Karen uh, sixty in the chat actually hosts a copy of Sock Master's old Gimme Reference uh, web page since uh, Sock's pages are down, and that covers all the different combinations uh, that these uh, different register settings on the Gimme support. And there's, there's quite a bit of different stuff to play with. And it, it can make a big difference if you need speed or if you need you know free RAM because you want to fit a fairly complicated game in a 120K machine, et cetera. So definitely worth checking out. Uh, and if you want to learn how to do machine language, Coco 3 specifically, this is a great series to check out as well. And uh, George is always posting his source code for all of the stuff he shows on his various episodes. On our Discord, the Coco Discord, he's got his own reserved channel for his series. And uh, if you want to save yourself typing in all this stuff, you can just download that and just load it into your emulator or copy it onto your STC and load it from there. Uh, next up, uh, Pierre Sarazin has released a new version of CMOC, which is the uh, near C compiler for the Coco. And you can actually compile both the Disk Basic and OS 9 with this. He's released version 0.1.86. And what is new in this version, he's got some minor bug fixes, improvements, and some optimizations. He's got a new command line option, which is dash MC6839, which adds a single precision floating point library, which is basically the math routine uh, ROM that you could have bought from Motorola back in the day. So it has all these new routines you know, debugged and, and ready to go. And you can just call them, and they're well documented. Um, this means BASIC does not need to be around for floating point as in previous versions. So in previous versions of the CMOC, if you're running, you know, compiling to basic it would if you're doing any floating point math routines it would have to map the rom in temporarily call the routine in the basic rom then come back out and there'll be a bit about the speed differences here i'll mention from a, another post from another person but anyway that's all added in so you actually don't need basic in there whatsoever he also added uh extra commands str spn str cspn str tok str p break and str rchr he added S break and S break max to OS 9 specifically. I don't know what those are because I'm not super familiar with C. I, I, does anybody in the panel know what those specifically do? Any of the ones I mentioned? Anybody? Anybody? Don't get me lying. Anyway, they're, they're those those ones there. <laughs> I know what string talk. I know what string tokens yeah. does, but yeah, I know what string. Yeah, I know right, but don't ask together. me to explain none of that because it's going to be wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> so, what does string token do? Is that token? You know, it, look it up a token table or tokens. something. No, it breaks oh, it into tokens. Uh, um, if you have a uh, if you have a string that's delimited by a character like a comma or spaces or something, then it'll break them into individual items in an array, if I recall right. Oh, okay. So it creates subfields out of the main. Yeah, and then okay. null terminates each of them. So then you have individual chunks, as I recall. Okay, that makes sense. Never bothered to use it. I always did my own, but yeah, I imagine you could probably use if you change your your separator to be a space, you can or space dash or something like that. You can actually parse like a command line or something. That's that's it. exactly what it's there for. Okay. That's yeah, precisely yeah. what it's there for. Uh, James Jones is saying uh, S break is something to do with memory. It's a Unix call originally. Yeah. Anyway, if you wanted to get that, like I said, he's also done some bug fixes and optimizations. So for those of you that have done projects using CMOC, and there's a fair number, I know Brendan Don, he uses it for a lot of his Coco VGA demo programs and stuff. Um, go get the latest version. Uh, Pierre's been really good about you know updating this fairly often, so it's, it's a moving target, but uh, he's improving it all the time. And it's free. 
And then kind of a follow-up to that is a separate blog post uh, from a person that calls his blog The Boston Diaries. And um, the guy's name is Sean Connor. And he had posted in the Coca Multimedia list, the, the list serve that a lot of us, you know, have subscription to. So we get stuff for people that don't like using social media, like Facebook or anything. Um, and what he did here in this particular blog entry is he compared the speed of Microsoft Basics floating point to the Motorola IEEE code, um, which is what CMOG is using now with that special library. And he found that on average, the Microsoft one is about twice as fast. Now, I don't know if it's as accurate, um, but I was kind of surprised by that, to be honest. But uh, he actually gave you some sample timings and stuff here as he ran it through the two different ones. But he said, the, really, the only surprising thing here was just how fast Microsoft Basic was at floating point. Now, I've never really looked at the IEEE specs um, to see if they're you know, much more focused on accuracy versus speed type thing. And maybe that's part of the difference. I don't know. I don't know it if anybody else here. Any, it shouldn't make any difference whatsoever because ultimately... What you're doing is you're multiplying you're multiplying the mantis and determining what your exponent is. Yeah, but I'm wondering if maybe it keeps a couple extra bits of uh, accuracy oh, or adding two together or something that maybe the other one's not or something. I don't know. Yeah, that's precision, not accuracy. Or, yeah, yeah. But, but double precision, don't you need double the mantis before you can start slowing things off into... Double precision, double precision effectively gives you um, twice the bit width. Um, it's not, I don't think it's quite twice the number of bits of precision for the Mantissa. I could be wrong on that one. Mm -hmm. I just haven't, I haven't looked at that spec in a while. Yeah. He does do a, a little bit of a comparison between single and double point or double precision, I should say here. And it takes about twice as much time as you'd kind of expect. But yeah, if you want to delve into that, I know like uh, Henry, you're kind of like hell, hell bent in the same area right now doing math routines and stuff in, in your fourth project. So um, I, have you ever looked at the 6839 ROM source? Because that is publicly available. Motor I didn't know it existed. Oh. <laughs> so cool. I'm going to have to look at the, 63, uh, the 6839 ROM source. Yeah, because basically there it was their equivalent of a math coprocessor, except it was actually just really ROM routines. It was there was no you know co-processing happening. It was just you, you jump in here with these entry parameters and it'll do the calculations for you. But so now didn't we have oh what is where where'd I put it? Oh yeah, the uh that's the serial port. AM ninety five eleven. That's what I was thinking of. The AM ninety five eleven. Oh well, that's okay. a math co processor. Yeah. Yeah, that's a math co. Like a real, real one. Because I, I think if I remember reading somewhere that Motorola originally planned on this being like a commercially sold thing and they just never really sold it that much because a lot of people already had routines written themselves. And uh, okay. basically, they eventually put it up on their BBS. I think I remember it was I first saw the Motorola BBS and the documentation and the source code was actually fully available for all the routines. Hmm. I'm going to have to look at that. Okay, hey, continue on our current theme of uh, semi language tutorial series. We've got Coco Town doing a semi language sound for the Coco One and Two or Three, Part Six, and uh, this is where he actually gets it running, you know, fully off using the same H sync trick that Nick used on Jumpin' Joey, and he's actually got it running in the background while Basic runs. So uh, I'm not going to play the whole thing where he's explaining how it works and, and getting into the code details here, but I'll play you a little bit of a demo so you can kind of see what it runs like. Now, obviously, when you're triggering interrupts that are sucking over half a CPU time, basic is going to run a fair bit slower. <laughs> um, now, he, he'd kind of forgotten. Well, I guess he couldn't currently run it the way he was running it. I think he's running it with drive wire loaded into RAM. So he's basically running the ROM to RAM thing. So he's running complete RAM. But he has the option of you know downloading the, the code and then running it in ROM mode, which case basic itself would speed up if you do the regular speed up poke, which he didn't do in this video. So potentially you could be running the basic side of things probably 30 to 40% faster than what is shown here on a Cocoa 1 or 2, if you just leave it in ROM mode. Now run it. Everything is clean. Well, by the way, he has mistakes. Let's watch this. God <laughs> What the f <laughs> Oh 
Yeah, so here's Picard again. Picard again. Anybody's program uh, knows those exact statements. Out. Yes. Uh, have you figured it out? I'll give you a hint. It is related to all of my mad, hasty, rushed changes. Remember, I had grabbed this block from up here so that the trashing of D and therefore A and B would happen before I reinitialized B. Well, what about this? Yeah, forgot to this move his uh, you, setting the U pointer before he stores it. Comma U. Which I to be initialized before I start writing anything into it. You know what U is at this point? We'll skip ahead a bit. <laughs> Okay, so we're playing notes and they're fully initialized. Add chord is good and fast. We're not corrupting any memory that basic is relying upon. We should be ready to go back to trying to paint that house with some music in the background. This is the type of routine I wish they built in basic as an option. It sounds pretty good. And there's something thrilling about seeing the command paint running in the foreground while something's happening in the background, while song is being played. This is something back in the day I wouldn't have thought was possible. But of course there is a price to be paid. Things are slowed down. So actually let's compare the speed of this with the speed of that original program running without any of the music in the background and without those horizontal sync interrupts. Bit of a difference. <laughs> yeah. I like the tune. Yeah, he uses up to four voice chords in this, so. And like I said, he could have, if he'd, if he'd mapped this as a 32K RAM, 32K ROM, he could have ran basic at double speed like the ROM part portion of it anyway, so that would have helped a fair bit. But the fact it's running at all, I mean, I've seen Coco 3 demos do this in basic okay, a fair bit. Okay, yeah, it is a lot slower. Um, and, and mainly because you have, you know, more, much more fine control tuning, and you can use an FIRQ, which has far less overhead than the IRQ that, unfortunately, Tandy Motorola tied to stupid things. Um but yeah, it's, it's it's really cool seeing that, and uh, he goes through and explains you know how the whole concept of it works, and if you want to learn how to do, you can actually do background music in your basic programs without any extra hardware. That's pretty darn cool. Next up, Alan Huffman has been rather busy this week, so we're going to mention a few things, and a few of them cross over to some other people in the Coco community as well, which we'll get to. So the first one here is he posted on his Subitha software blog a story that originally appeared in Mary Kramer. Some of you around in the mid-2000s will remember her. Uh, her Cocoa Nuts newsletter, and this is from May 2007 issue. It's about the discovery of the first Cocoa 3 prototype found at Microware. And he goes through the whole history of when you know, Microware was starting to clean out some of the old building and they had to downsize a bunch of stuff. And they kind of went digging in the basement and uh, discovered that amongst some other things. So this is what literally... The Motorola, or sorry, Microware uh, old office's storeroom looked like it was just a mess. <laughs> it's just scattered all over. And, uh, you know, there's just chunks of hardware all over the place for different, you know, gimmick systems and SWTPCs and all kinds of stuff. So it kind of goes through all that. And then they discovered the original one of two Cocoa 3 prototypes before the Gimme was even a chip. Uh, it was a bunch of series of stuff on the board. You can see all the bodge wires on here. And they also discovered these uh, Ethernet, or not Ethernet, uh, network controllers. I can't remember what the exact terminology of them was. Uh, right. But there was two versions of that board, too. As you can see, they're quite different between the right two and this one. The only one I ever saw was the right, one of the right two with the, uh, that's actually twin lead in place of coax for the network connection. So yeah, this is the one that Brother Jeremy brought down, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's a nice Tandy move, isn't it? We use twin lead. We don't need that fancy coax. <laughs> Were they using 300 or 600 ohm twin lead? No, 300 ohm twin lead. You can buy oh, a radio wow. shack and a big spool. The, yeah, the stuff they had in stock, you know? <laughs> Essentially free. Well, I splurge. <laughs> 
So anyway, that was a pretty cool one. And for those of you who've never seen the uh, Coco 3 prototype board, that's the bottom. You know, it's a little rubber thing, so it didn't, you know, bump on the table too much. Didn't rip the bodge wires off when you set it down. And that's the top. And the gimme, I'm trying to remember that was which chunk of chips? Uh, I like this it. chunk over here. But you can see the connectors in the back. They had the composite out already. Right. Um, now, this actually had a few features that the Coco 3 eventually, you know, when it came, became finalized, did not have. So it has stuff like an onboard disc controller chip, um, which would have been kind of nice to have that built in. Okay. So notice this is interesting. See the little red dots on everything? Candy chips that were anything that wasn't stock had a little dot like that on it in different colors to tell you what it was and why it was there. So multi-pack upgrades had a little dot, brown dot like that. It's like the mark of Tandy without actually printing Tandy on it. So anyway. Yeah. And unfortunately, these pictures were taken at a time when digital cameras that uh, Alan had were not that great. So uh, I've seen some requests to zoom it. I will zoom it, but it's not going to get too much clearer. It's not going to do much. <laughs> but you can see, like, I think this is all the RAM here because it's basically a built-in 512. Mm -hmm. um, channel sector for RF, you had two-button joystick support, of course, a composite. If you look on the right, bottom, bottom on the right, that big chip, what's that one? This one? I don't know. Yeah, what's that? Not a, uh, you see it as good as I do. <laughs> I think it's a 512K um, SRAM. There are larger high-res pictures of this, by the way. Um, yeah, just not on this particular page right now. There was something there was... 512 bytes of RAM, which is interesting because uh, that could be um, a pallet RAM. Yeah, because it is speculated that these, the original pre gimme chip being manufactured by VLSI prototypes, might have still had the 256 color mode that was on the spec sheet mm. um, for the original Coco 3 development, which, of course, you know, there's several things. The onboard disc controller went bye bye on the final one too because the cost would have been too much, but. But that that this entire board minus a little bit of you know disc controller stuff uh, got shrunk down to what you see in the current Coco Three motherboard, and this thing is much bigger than even the Coco One board was. So is there a loose chip just sitting in the middle of this board? Or yeah, in the middle there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is that? Hardware so, guys unite. So where is this board now? I think Mark Marlette has it. He was supposed to go through and try to you know basically make a schematic on it basically so we could try to recreate it and see what exactly features it did have but as far as i know he's never never gotten to it or at least he never finished it what was on the underside bodge, bodge wires. wires from hell lots of them <laughs> it looked yeah, like an old wonder. mainframe it's a, a lot of bodge yeah it reminded wires. me the the back, back plane on the pdp 11 or the uh, hp 3000 mini hey, it's some old ibm or something exactly Oh, there we are. There you go. There. That's a lot of bodge wise. No, it's not too bad. They're all the same, <laughs> they're all the same color, though. Master yeah, but this, there. this is a PCB that was made, and they, yet they still had things that had the bodge wire. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot for a... For the, well, uh, you should have seen the next revision. <laughs> for the uh, Xenix machines, there was an upgrade to the uh, 68,000 boards. It was this extensive, and we had to do that in the shop. Oh, you did it in the shop. You got seven of them, Mark. Get to it. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> uh, when they went when they changed version of Xenix, uh, yeah, Unix Xenix. Uh, there mm -hmm. was extensive modifications to the sixty-eight thousand board, and yeah, it was it resembled this when we were done with yeah. it. We're gonna oh, need it by goodness. Wednesday. If you're smart, you'd have three or four spare ones sitting around. You pre-do them, and then somebody comes in, you yank their board. Verify it works, bring the board and swap it. <laughs> well, it. yeah, but to pre-do them, you have to have done them. Yeah. There's a yeah. little <laughs> catch-22 there. Where, yeah, I've got five on order, and we haven't pre-done any, so. I think we only did it two or three times. Nice. All I can that. say is, uh, with my skill of soldering, this just scares the hell out of me. But this wouldn't happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> As it should. <laughs> All right, yeah, I believe I believe all these uh, when Brother Jeremy moved to England, I think these all pretty well went to uh, Mark Marlette. So, nice. well, like the article Someone mentioned there, that one on the left 
does not have an edge card connector. Yeah. I remember seeing that one too, actually, at the at Coco Fest when Brother Jeremy brought them down. It's like, got pin header, so I guess that's he also had the there. gimmies that were pre they they were actually run on the assembly line, but they were pre-production models for testing basically to make sure the production line was working correctly. And they have that different gimme with that little metal clip on them. Right. Yeah, with the retainer. Yeah. Next up from Alan, he did part seven of his Lights Out, which is a port of the basic Coco 3 game that uh, Rick Adams did. And in this particular case here, he actually not only finished up and cleaned up the color basic one, which he does go through the listing stuff here, but he actually decided to port it to his first computer ever, which is a VIC-20, which has even more screen restrictions than we do. So he went and kind of cleaned up the basic source, started adding some extra features, etc., <clears throat> I mean, he shows some of the editing on the, uh, the VIC-20 emulators and stuff. And then screenshots of the VIC-20 version running. And then he did a basic listing here showing what changes were required, because this is meant to run at a color basic, not even extended basic is required in the Coco. So any lines between the VIC-20 and the Coco that are different are bolded. So you can see this entire first chunk is exactly the same. Oh, this line got changes. Oh, these uh, three lines here got changes. And that's it. Basically, the same basic program worked on both. And now he wants to do a little bit more on it, but he's going to take a bit of a break from it because um, he's already done you know seven parts and it's supported to two different machines. Now, as we mentioned last week, uh, Roger Taylor is the person that got most of Steve Bjork's old estate sale at uh, a great you know money cost to get it all. And um, Alan is actually uh, committed at one of the max levels on his Patreon to help him along because it was quite a bit of money that you know, Roger had to spend to get all this stuff. And you got to take a look uh, at some of the stuff here, including we have saw before the uh, Super Pitfall 2 listing. Um, there was a printed paper printout, and uh, I don't think any discs with that have been found yet, though I could be wrong. It might have been updated since. Uh, but there's printed out uh, source listings for Clowns of Balloons, Megabug, Micropainter, Rampage, Bash, uh, what was labeled as the Marty Goodman game, which eventually became Marty's Nightmare. And uh, another one was called Super Pitfall 2. Um, now, there is no Super Pitfall 2, as far as we know. Um, there was an announcement for one um, on other platforms, which was basically a port of a Japanese game that has nothing to do with it all whatsoever. They're just basically rebranding it to become part of the the series. And you can kind of see a picture, you know, here some of it here. So I don't know if this is what Steve would have based it on or if this was a separate project. But it does show here that he'd worked on it since November 11th of 87. And he originally put, you know, finished uh, March 29th of 88, but then he scribbled it out and put you know, April 4th. So he obviously did some changes. But it'd be quite interesting to see. Now, Alan's speculation is maybe that's Mind Rescue because Mind Rescue is kind of the same engine, but a different gameplay. So instead of going around and shooting, collecting treasures, you're actually trying to find miners that are trapped and, and passed out in the mine, and you actually have to take them oxygen bottles. And uh, But basically, the scrolling engine, the scoring engine stuff is exactly the same. You have this air tank gauge, too. You got to you know keep track of your own air. And he did kind of the same thing before because he actually did Arkanoid and then Bash, which was kind of a simplified Arkanoid. It had some of the power-ups and not all of them. There's no lasers, for example. And he was quite famous. I mean, one of the reasons that Steve could sometimes turn around a game quite fast, like I think Rampage took him literally one month exactly, is because he built up these libraries of routines he would reuse in games. And you can see an obvious one from the early days here, the Zaxxon isometric scrolling, and then Gone of Buona, which came out a year or two later, which basically is using the same style engine. Um. So basically, uh, they're trying to figure out, uh, and, and and Rogers mentioned he's going to see if he has the assets, like if he can find a disc with all the graphics and stuff, because all he's got is a printout of the code. That doesn't tell you how the graphics looked. Um, so hopefully that's something that can be you know reconstructed and see exactly what it is. And for those of you um, more interested in this, if you go on to Rogers' Patreon, and you can you know join for free, but he does have the, the tiers that will definitely help him out. Uh he actually shows some pictures here. So here's another picture of the Super Pitfall 2 source. Here's a picture of Rampage. You can see it was started on November the 3rd of 88, finished on February the 3rd. Um, Micro Painter, which was actually a Datasoft product. Megabug. Marty Goodman game, which became 
And this one was done pretty quickly too. That was a month in 1990. Clouds of Blues. So this has a little uh, addition to it. So Steve basically completed February 19th of 82. But there's a European color mod, and they spelled color properly for the Europeans, uh, by Jerry Humphrey on November 30th of 82. So this is, you know, eight months later, nine months later. Or nine and a half, actually. Um, so I'm curious if Karen or any of the other people here that are in the UK or in mainland Europe that had PAL systems... Um, did your version of com com Clowns and Balloons use like a P mode three, one of the two color sets there, as opposed to the artifact colors that we got? I wasn't aware of that, if that's true, but I'm kind of curious. There, there's a lot of those Tandy titles that have a, a routine. Even, even uh, Temple Rom has it in there, uh, where you hit, you has you press the clear key. Yeah, or you hold it down, like Gone Up, Up, Super Pit, or sorry, Pitfall Two have those, for example. Yeah. Yeah, because I know I, when Rick started messing with, uh, you know, uh, Temple Rom again, he's like, I didn't remember writing that, but that was, he says, I, I think that was something that they gave me to put in there. Yeah. But it, if it's, a, when they say a color mod, it's not, it might be just more than just uh, going from P-Mode 4 to P-Mode 3, because if you did that, then your colors would be all over the place. You'd get, get, you'd get the four P-Mode 3 colors, but they won't really be, where you may want them to be, you know. Yeah, you may want to swap like color one and color two, so for example. This color when you're mod may be something that goes through the code and reassigns the way the colors are are used, so that when you do go to P mode three, you don't end up with a pink sky. <laughs> I'm still <laughs> trying to get my head around. Bottom is one ninety two, the end of the screen, presumably. While bottom is then bottom, but then. What what else would bottom be? I guess if you're shifting the bottom of the active part of the screen, you're doing a scroll or something on, well, you may want to move that. Well, I don't know. It's, um, it's just a weird. That might be just the initialization thing. value of it. Basically, European they're going to be equal to the mod, change. You know, who knows? What I like about this one though, because he did Arkanoid, you know, the official port, is that when he did Bash, which is kind of like I said before, the simplified version of it. Start date May second, eighty eight. End date May fifth. One weekend, basically. <laughs> right, right. Knock her out. It's Turned almost it all the exact Monday. same graphics. Some of the backgrounds changed a bit, and I think the paddle changed, but it's basically with the same bricks and everything else. So it's it's doesn't surprise me that he got it done that quick because there's not that much of a change between it and Arkanoid taking stuff out mainly. Oops. Okay, another part that's kind of linked with Roger as well. Um, those of you I think I've shown before here on the show, the Steve Burke OS9 Level 1 bouncing ball demo that was meant for the Coco 1 and 2, and it was a machine language game to show a spinning bouncing ball, you know, kind of like a lot of the famous ones originally from the Amiga. And uh, this looks like Roger found the disk image that has the original color basic version of actually drawing everything. Um, and then he's got some utilities included in this disc image, which Roger doesn't run at this time, but it looks like it's actually set up to maybe be one of those hybrid discs where you could have half the disc to be disc basic and half to be OS9 on the same physical floppy. Um, so this might've been how he created the original drawings of the ball and created the get put buffers for the ball. And then he would have imported those into OS9 with probably TRS copy at the time was the utility radio shack sold. And then wrote the machine language routines in OS9 level one assembler to actually do the actual thing. But what this program does is a basic program to actually draw the balls and then draw them in shit different bit shift positions. Um, and then it actually runs a, a machine language version. It doesn't have the scrolling text the OS9 version has, but I think it was kind of a, you know, make sure it's working properly and looks okay on, on the disk basic version of it. So this is something I think most people probably have not seen before. And I have a more full screen version of it over here. And this is Roger running it on his emulator. Now he's got this uh, quite overclocked because it's quite slow drawing <laughs> the, uh, the ball. Because it's basically a whole bunch of, you know, trigon trigonometry calculations. So the ball in the, this final version, it didn't animate the ball with um, palette shifting. It did it by multiple frames of the ball. Yeah. 
Well, the, the it was for the Coco one too. There is no pallet. Yeah, it's true. So he's drawing the slightly different rotations and getting them into you know buffers. Yeah. And that's what the final result. Now this, Alan was asking if this could be done in basic with the fast get put buffers, where it does by the line only. I think it could run this fast. I mean, from my experiments of fiddling with that, which I showed on the one Coco Tech episode, I think this could be run on in basic at this speed. It'd take a fair bit of memory, but like I said, the the actual version of uh, OS nines is actually quite a bit different and added in like scrolling text in the top and stuff too. But I think this is the actual original drawings that created the ball that he used in his OS nine demo. And if you take a look at his disk directory here, which he had here, um, besides the you know the actual graphic buffers and stuff that he's creating here, is asm to text is co eighty which would be, he had a word pack two, which is 80 column card. Uh, but he's also got an OS9 shape file here. So obviously he's planning on importing this into OS9 at some point. So I think this is the precursor to what the eventual OS9 demo, which you guys will be getting with uh, EOU 1.01 in the next month or two as one of the new stuff, new new programs included with it. So kind of a historically pretty, pretty cool to have found that. I'm hoping he actually has documented source code in the OS9 one because that was something I was going to start disassembling. But if it's already there, I can save myself a lot of time. <laughs> uh, next up, Chair City Retro Programming has uh, fixed it up so that he can actually get hit. The player can get hit because in the previous video is showing you could attack the snakes, but you wouldn't get hit yourself. Um, and he also added the uh, the wizard uh, character, which is the bottom of the two main characters. So the other one's the swordsman at the top. Uh, that he can cast a repel spell because he's been pretty useless up to this point in the game. And uh, he's actually got his you know health bars all working properly now too. So when you get hit, your actual health starts to go down. So he's, he's getting further and further along with it. I really wish you would kind of switch to the get put tiles because an even bite boundary because it's basically a tile-based game would be so much faster. <laughs> but it would take a bit more memory than draw. And here we're just going to plug into one of Nick's games again for some reason. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so basically what is going on here is Lacoco Strangiato, alias uh, Bob Emery, I believe is still on the panel here and may want to comment on this. And he's, uh, I'm just going for an unmute his mic. I'm here. Okay. So this, you were replacing a I PIA with what you were told was a replacement that should work verbatim the same. Is that what happened? Well, this is basically the part that, uh, Rocky Hill lists in his, um, uh, parts list for the Athena boards is a okay. bill of materials because they are a modern replacement. But there's a but. Uh, the main but is that it's not 100% I'd say functionally identical. It is compatible, but it's not necessarily identical. Kind of like the 6309 is compatible but it doesn't do everything exactly the same yeah and what you notice is that on some of nick's games it basically is playing some of the music way too fast mm -hmm. which i think i've got it queued up for that right now interesting Nick, why didn't you foresee now, this? <laughs> it's but yeah, that's right. It's fast on the title, but it's not in the game. It definitely is IC five specifically. I think that's it for now. Yeah, if you go I'll into the game, to, uh, it wasn't change. fast in the game. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to find And that yeah, gives here. me a theory. Oh, or is it? Hang on. No, that sounds right. That's good. Yeah. So yeah, it's it, normal. Yeah. So it does it fast it. on the title. So what I am doing in jumping in jumping Joey, because this is a Coco one and two game, and the Correct. music needs um, a seven round about seven kilohertz interrupt rate, and uh, on the Coco one and two you. You don't have that. 
uh, the horizontal runs at about 14 kilohertz, which is too high for what I wanted to do. So I needed to halve that. And this is using the technique that Simon, of course, um, has, uh, whereby you skip the first horizontal interrupt um, by delaying, turning off the interrupts and then waiting for a horizontal and delaying long enough so you cross over the next one before turning it back on. And in that, during that period is where you do the music. And then the second part, you would do the game itself. Now, on the title screen, I'm doing that delay to get the music because it's the same, it's the same code that I use in the game and at the title screen, but there's no game playing. So in other words, this is probably doesn't have uh, the game playing to delay it long enough um, after it has skipped um, the first. So your horizontal. delay See, isn't long enough because it's yeah. no game. And I, and I, I can't remember what I exactly did at the title screen, but I mean, it worked fine on a, on a, on a real Coco. Yeah. So basically thought, you're timing it right down the cycles. Cause what there's 57 cycles per H. Well, yeah. Well, I time it for the first part because I need to know when to actually skip. Um, the first horizontal sync. After that, then the game can kick it, kick in, and then it has to resync at the end of that. But I must be doing something different at the title screen because it doesn't have the the overhead of the game to do in that second half. Right. And it worked fine on a real Coco, whatever I did. But obviously, this uh, this uh, other. PIA is uh it's got some difference. Yeah, and there's some speculation from Sockmaster in the in the Discord that he thinks that maybe the lag latency time of the chip reacting is mm. faster so that it's right. actually coming out a little bit early, you know, before the first H sync within the IRQ service routine happens. So it's actually triggering, you know, pretty well immediately on the next H sync at 15.75 kilohertz rather than the, you know, skipping every second one to give you their 7.7. Uh, yeah. I can testify to that. Even though you're working on the same clock speed, the results come in quicker than you would expect at that clock speed. It's, it's yeah, a mess. Newer yeah. Chips are and actually, hard Rocky hard. Hill, who did, you know, designed the Athena board that Bob was using here, he said, uh, Sockmaster's Donkey Kong transcode runs really fast with that chip as well. So apparently this has actually been seen before, even on Coco 3 yeah, type you stuff. So. No, I haven't experienced that. That was kind of where I got the idea. But when I went and played Donkey Kong, it seemed normal. But then I don't play Donkey Kong near as much as I play Jump and Joey. Okay. So, I mean, there's there's a couple versions of Donkey Kong, too. There's the original one, and then there's the uh, mm -hmm. Donkey Kong remix, which is a bit more optimized, I think. I wonder if the, maybe he's talking about that one in particular. I don't know. I've tried them both, and I haven't. It doesn't seem sped up to me in any way. Okay. So, Rocky, um, I guess for, uh, one other question, because I know SOC auto senses if a 6 through 9 is present, and it kicks in, you know, some basic... I think he kicks in native mode, for example, which would obviously speed things up. Um, I'm wondering if you, Rocky, had tried it with the 6809, maybe? Um, and maybe that, or or with a 609, like maybe that's the issue is that, you know, one person's testing it one way and one the other. And yeah, David Lad's asking, which chip are we talking about? Now, you figured out specifically which of the two PA chips is, is, is where you replace it where this happens. Yeah, it's IC5 on a Coco 3. It's the uh, PIA chip on the right. Okay, okay but, and is my, that with the... but but is it is the PIA that you're using? Is it one of the newer uh, Western design <clears throat> versions? Yeah, both of these are the Western design chips. Um, and when I put in an original sixty five twenty one for IC five, then the music played normally. Yeah, that was one of the things that I meant to ask uh, Rocky Hill about because, um, like, for instance, with the issues we had with emulators and the joystick stuff on, what was it, Photon? Yeah. Where the latency, the 
or what would be the propagation delay. Um, they were taking advantage of how slow the hardware was to react. Well, these new Western design chips, um, especially if you mm -hmm. bought the newest ones, those can run at 14 megahertz. So, <laughs> yeah. so right. yeah, they're designed to be, <laughs> be faster. So, yeah, that's probably what's causing the issue is that they're just, they're reacting faster than yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, Rocky says he tested his when he got the speed up that he, you're talking about here uh, with a 6309 in his Cocoa 3 Athena board. What are you running on yours, Bob? Uh, it is a 6309. Oh, okay. And a 87 Gimme. Rocky, are you using That's an 87 random. or 86 Gimme? I, you know, that has slight differences on the timer, FRQ. I do know there's a bit of a difference there. I don't. I don't use the um, the gimme. No, this is talking about the Donkey Kong, where it speeds up its oh, music right. too. Yeah. So I'm I'm trying to figure what the differences are that you know Bob's not seeing a speed up on on Donkey Kong or Donkey Kong Remix, and and Rocky is. Because so far they're both using six zero nines. They're using the same Western Digital chip. I'm wondering if maybe the difference of the eighty six versus eighty seven gimme. Which, as Sockmaster found out, the timer interrupt is different between the two a little bit. Rocky says he, I have both, but I don't remember which one I tested with. We'll have to try it again. Okay, cool. Yeah, if you can report back to us, Rocky, or even let Bob know for next week. Kind of curious to see. Sounds like back to the grind of gaming. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, you know You have what? to do it at gunpoint. Work, 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 be, work, work, work. It'd be <laughs> interesting... Know? It'd be interesting if you have a real Coco, Coco one or two, where which has a socketed PIAs, run uh, mm -hmm. Jumping oh, Joey in yeah. on one of those and swap yeah, out. That's the actually PIAs where I. It's actually where I got the sixty-eight twenty-one from. Is my old Coco one. Yeah, oh, well, try it on against a, the new one. Okay. Yeah, try a co a real Coco one with the new um the new PIAs. And see if mm -hmm. it does the problem on real hardware. So the question we'll becomes, if, if you have to extend your skip and IRQ delay, how far can you extend it before the original hard hardware then misses a second IRQ to try to hit a middle ground where both pieces of hardware work with the same code? So, yeah. That's well, that was the question. problem with the, the timer interrupt on the gimme between 86 and 87 gimmies, because there is a cycle difference, I think, on the, the lower... <laughs> three or four right. ticks on the fast clock rate or something. I can't remember the exact details, but there is a difference. And my question is, could we somehow leverage this kind of like the 6309 and maybe make a, a more optimized machine for Nitrous 9? Well, I think it helped Frederick with his 609 board for sure here, because if he's going to try to push it up to four or five megahertz, then uh, right. having uh, PIAs, yeah. PIAs, you know, that are rated for 14 would be kind of helpful compared to rated for two. <laughs> you think? Oh, it's a, it's a pretty fascinating out. So hopefully, between all you hardware gurus out there who don't you well, know recoil in horror after seeing the Koki Three Gimme prototype board, well, and plus with those new PIAs, those are going to be CMOS, so those are going to be low lower current draw and heat generating chips too. Right. Mm -hmm. So faster rising and falling of edges or whatever that's called. Because it doesn't have far to go. Better every no day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm grasping at straws there. I'll let you guys figure it out. Okay, well, since Henry's actually here, and this is his he break key video, do you want me to just play a little clip or do you want to just... Uh, Go ahead, play clip. part I should jump? <laughs> nice. Nah, Whatever's whatever's funny. The idea behind any behind division behind any type of division is that you're doing a you're doing successive subtractions. Now in binary, this is surprisingly easy because and in binary, that's the fun part you can about either it. Subtract <laughs> once or zero. so surprisingly so easy in theory. Overflow, but like when you got to deal with the when you got to deal with the actual like manual math, it becomes a little bit difficult. Video. It will now, this, result in a the whole thing about getting output from the the whole thing about this uh, this episode was getting output um, from the stack onto the screen and to get output from the stack onto the screen 
years. I had to go through implementing multiplication, division, and subtraction. You know, not necessarily in that order. I had to implement some stack manipulation. It was just like, it's it's amazing when you dive into that, what you wind up finding. So I, I had fun doing this, you know. I had fun doing doing the actual project. Um, I was I was rather embarrassed at myself because I couldn't do simple math. <laughs> but you know, yes, that's par for the course. The whole idea, though, is like, okay, I want to do more than just show you, hey, this is the code you write. I want to show you, hey, this is why you write this code. This is why you do the do things the way you do things. And not everything is necessarily as intuitive as you might think. Yeah. Well, you must have been enjoying it somewhat. I mean, compared to Cocoa Town, there was a lot less bleeping out of, of you know, programming language. <laughs> a programmer language, I guess you should call it. Um, <laughs> then Cocoa Town I've, had. I've had practice. <laughs> hey, it's, it's cool. You got, you got your, uh, basically your output of math and stuff is now, oops. It's, it's now running for your fourth interpreter. Or mm -hmm. compiler. What are you making an interpreter or a compiler? I actually should ask that. Fourth, fourth is kind of compiles. compiled anyway, isn't it? Yeah, fourth fourth by its nature compiles. What you've got uh, what you've got going on is is um you've effectively got a REPL. Um and even if you're defining words and uh, defining words in the REPL, those words get compiled. So the idea being that you put together a word based on other words, and all it's doing is it's setting up calls to the uh, like machine language calls. Everything's a go sub, effectively. Okay. That's kind of what I faintly remember from it. <laughs> you kind of built your own language, actually, because you it's, it's almost like having macros, except more complex and more versus yep. up. And done in reverse Polish notation. Yeah, that's just to confuse me. <laughs> I can't wrap my head around that. No, I can't either. <laughs> For Henry, it comes second nature. I don't I don't know how. It was my. It was the first major scientific pro calculator that I had access to. Was an HP like I think it was a forty five. So, so you just grew up backwards and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Cool. <laughs> His brain's wired funny, folks. Someone had to do it. There have been more than one person tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I still like your cursor that you did though, with the shifting around of the. Individual oh, yeah. pixels wanted, and wanted block. to have fun with it. I wanted to do something that like was still obviously color computer, but not but also oh, obviously... but also obviously fourth, because you're the only person's ever done that type of a cursor that I've seen. <laughs> the cursor is actually a, a, a library noun that you write. <laughs> <laughs> hey difficult, check it out. It's an ongoing series as he creates his fourth and uh compiler. Now, this is one you want to actually put onto a ROM. Um, yeah, so that actually you could idea, replace the color basic boot. ROM. Yep. Yeah. Color, uh, like instead of color basic, you just boot to it. But um, next week, uh, or not next week, when when uh, the next one I do, I'm probably going to go over, like I said at the end of it, going to go with the um, putting together of the FujiNet device that I've got all the parts for and whatnot. Um, just kind of take a break from it for a little while and do some soldering. <laughs> that sounds like the worst break in the world to me, but I can't solder. So. <laughs> That's, that's, uh, to me, that's equivalent of like, I'm going to take a break by uh, hanging out of a tree with my hair tied to a branch type thing. Where's your hair? Where's your hair? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. David Ladd, now it's your turn to shine. And that's a uh, hint to see wow. if you're still here. His head's shining. <laughs> yes, I'm still, still here. I had to hurry up and try to get the stupid thing to unmute. Okay, so what's up? Hey, we got your video for the MM1 group on Facebook, on Facebook, where you literally say, I don't post very often, but I figured I would share that my MM1 seems to be still partially working. So you actually have two videos here, and I'll just let you talk about your MM1, the situation you're in and stuff while I play the videos. So the first video is you actually getting it up and running, period, uh, to a monitor. Now, unfortunately, you don't have an XT keyboard, which is what that requires. Um, right. And then you have a second video where you actually you found out that your terminal port is working, so you could actually log in and do some things. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so when I went to hook up the MM1, um, obviously I couldn't find the keyboard, but at least with the SCSI to SD, with the image I had from a backup I did many years ago before the drive died, uh, the 
MM1 booted. So I was like, ooh, that's a good sign. Um, of course, the hodgepodge of stuff so I could get video was the next fun part. Um, but um, I've been running into issues. Of course, if you scroll down in that thread, there are several more videos in there now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like uh, your startup file too. Still loading modules and setup files. <laughs> yes, because the fact that my MM1 is one that has the 8 meg backplane. So I'm loading every single one of the fonts, the tile sets, the, the other buffers, whatever there was, I'm loading it all. <laughs> That's kind of like what I do with EOU, <laughs> which everybody complains yes. about it takes too long to boot. Yes. Look, this is a 16 bit, 60,070 base machine. It's doing the same thing. In fact, I think yours boots slower than mine does. <laughs> well, and this is coming from SD. But then again, you know, uh, I'm on a 68070. So I'm running, I think, 12 megahertz, I think. Equivalent. Yeah. The, the 68070 by Signetics basically was a 15 megahertz part, but it wasn't as efficient as this, the Motorola 68000. So it runs the equivalent of about 12 and a half megahertz, 68000. No, I actually think this machine's running at 12 megahertz. Um, oh, you got to clock yeah. down? No, I, I think that's just the way they were. I think for yeah. the faster speed, you had to have what was the 68340 upgrade, which plugged into where the 68070 goes. <laughs> and yeah, I don't have that. But currently, my current things that I've been um, finding... Is with my machine. Yes, it does come up. Um, I've been working on trying to. Um, I've been working on trying to. Um, I've been working on. <laughs> what okay. the heck just happened? Yeah, he Someone's died. Watching the video and it's feeding back. Um, yeah, that was me. I clicked on it by accident on the, the Twitch. <laughs> I thought we were in the Matrix. David <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. David, so basically, um, I wanted to make a bootable volume because the boot ROMs only support booting from a cluster size of one volume. So quite a few years back, figured out what how many logical sectors your volume can have for OS 9 to stay at a cluster size of one. Well, of course, on the SDSI to SD, I created two 512-byte virtual drives at that sector count, and then two 256-byte sector-based volumes. So that way I could easily access those two volumes from the COCO, because obviously all the SCSI drivers and IDE drivers on the COCO only understand 256 byte sectors and they have to do deblocking. Well, the MM1 doesn't do deblocking. It natively supports larger sectors on hard disks. So I had to make sure I used a volume that was a 256 byte sector based, which thanks, thankfully the SCSI to SD and the Blue SCSI support that feature. So, but I've been running into issues where I start doing my hard drive backup from my old zip 250 disk image to my 255.996 megabyte volume it says it's out of space even though that there's 254 megabyte left and i verified it on both the scsi to sd and the blue scuzzy and they both do the same thing so it's not a scuzzy issue yeah, it seems to be a driver or file manager issue. So, yeah. But I kept dropping back the sector count until I was able to format without any issues, which I had no problems formatting. And then I could do a full backup of the volume without running out of space, even though there was space. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's been an adventure over the last couple days and i was actually uploading videos 
to the thread while we were doing the show. Yeah, I'm going to try to play some of these, but unfortunately, I don't know if it's just my Firefox got screwed up or something. It was putting these stupid green things in the corner, and then it's also playing it in a tiny little postage stamp thing in the middle, so it's like, it's not really viewable right now. Um, well, the greens are correct, because currently I got the MM1's output display in the top left, and then I've got the putty overlay in the bottom right. Oh, okay. I thought that was a glitch. I, no, I put the green, so that way it kind of helped di differentiate to, from the two the windows. So, but yeah, the top left is so I could see the booting of the machine when I type break, which is basically oh, Nitrous 9's version of reboot. Um, okay. Uh, and then that way I could watch the boot process on the top left. And then once I got the terminal prompt back in the bottom right, then I could start doing my thing. But. Okay, so you're making progress anyway. Like you're, everyone's up and running. You're actually able now with that little glitch, you know, kind of push to the side. Now that you figured a way around it, you actually got the hard drive being formatted. And you're working with the blue SCSI on that now. Both. I've 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 tested both. Right now, my primary device. I'm still planning on using the SCSI to SD because I got two of them. So why not put the device that I originally purchased in the machine that okay. I got. No, I keep, like keep I us posted because a few of you have getting your MM1s running again. I mean, a lot of people have not seen the MM1 in person or running in person. Uh, so it'd be cool to get some videos. I know you know Joel Evie's put a few up already, and now you're putting some up too. And once you get your keyboard and stuff, so you can actually start running some of the graphics apps. It'd be kind of cool to show people what, what the whole MM1 hype was about because they used to take out like a you know, two page, two full page ads in Rainbow and stuff. So, I mean, that was, and probably the, out of the uh, Coco 4s, quote unquote, the MM1 was by far, I think, the most popular one. Um, well, for for me, um, see, when I was back in high school, um, I'd gotten OS nine level one, and I was dabbling in assembly, and I was just loving it back, especially on on you know OS nine level one, and once I got the Coco three, um, and OS nine level two, that was a total blast there, um. Unfortunately, I never got into assembly yet with the 68,000 CPUs, but the, the biggest thing that I liked was no more 64K barrier. Yeah. You know, you, you would have full access to all the, literally, all the right. So it's, yeah. it, it was something I wanted to, wanted to play with. It's just, you know, work at the time and stuff it's just my mm1 just became basically my database entry for my driving logs from driving all over nebraska and iowa for doing service calls a couple uh, comments in the chat here i want to mention so james jones says yeah the uh, 68070 is notoriously slow it lacks one of the alus 68000 has which is why it runs you know 15 20 percent slower than the equivalent clocked 68000 and um, Joel Levy says, yeah, the 68,070 is 15 megahertz on the M01. So you're, are you running yours under the original spec or are you just remembering the speed wrong? Okay, I'm, I must just be rem remembering it wrong because I would, you know, that's what I remember being told was 12 megahertz. But yeah, it know, runs the equivalent of 12 if you're comparing it to an actual Motorola part. But well, and Joel actually says 15 megahertz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it definitely does run slower than a. A Motorola one at the same clock speed. Now, before I go into the next uh, story, where I actually have a screen to share, there's uh, another one I wanted to share as well. Uh, if you remember from last week, we talked about Michael Pitsley. He's the guy who's been doing all the multimedia educational stuff, both Tandy and, and uh, Dorset he's been doing lately, which is basically cassette-based software for the Coco One that would load in a program, and then you would display graphics, and then it has actual audio recordings of you know, real sound effects or people talking, and they would kind of mix you know, loading graphics and animating them on the screen along with the actual voice stuff, you know, doing multimedia and cassette back in the early 80s. And he, he sent me a bit of an update and a bit of a clarification of what exactly the door set software is doing. And it's a bit different and pretty forward thinking, I think, uh, about how it actually works. So I'll just read verbatim what Michael sent me in the, in the uh, message. 
He says, soon I'll be putting up another library that I found, but I wanted to let you know how they designed in the event you don't know 100%, and I definitely did not. I I'll load a program with Claude M. This program can be used with almost any of the Dorset courseware tapes. This program reads the data on the cassette to load graphics and do the motor on and audio on offs. The program also keeps track of the score of the correct and incorrect answers that you've made, and it'll display at the end uh, to basically grade the student. The graphics are loaded as the tape is read. Now, this is pretty neat, is even if there's a bad spot on the tape and certain graphics cannot be loaded, the program will still continue without an error. The graphics on the page may be jumbled a bit, but upon reading the next bit of code graphics on the tape, everything will go back to normal. I can load this program from the spelling course and run one tape, and then I can pop in a math tape and not even have to reload another program. Heck, I'm willing to bet if I can pop out a spelling tape midway through and stick a different tape in, it will continue like nothing happened. So they actually built it somewhat adaptive that if you get errors on the tape, like the tape got crinkled up or something, it'll just proceed anyway and try to keep going as best as it can without crashing, which I thought was pretty pretty forward-looking, you know, because tapes do get crinkled, especially if you have a crap tape recorder. So I, I, I've been kind of fascinated. They actually took the time to, you know, kind of think that ahead and let the program still run. Plus, they made it such a generic machine language driver for it that basically you just swap any of their courseware and then it just runs with the exact same software. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And, and he's got another library of Dorset stuff he's found. So he's going to meet some more video series coming from him showing some of the other courseware that Dorset had offered back in 82, 83. After that, we've got Primal Bits on YouTube. Um, we covered his channel once before because he had actually got a Cocoa 2 and was basically doing some testing, it said, on it. And he had to fix the keyboard because uh, one of the Mylar lines, I think, was screwed up on it. So there was, you know, certain keys were not working. So this one here, he decided to do a sequel where he's actually decided to do upgrades. So the first thing he did on this particular one, he did two things in, in principle. He uh, added the ex or replaced the color basic chip with the extended basic chip because he's got a Cocoa 2 late enough that it's a single ROM. And uh, he also uh, upgraded the RAM up to 64K, which, of course, you know, it confused him in basic because it looked like his RAM went down. Because uh, with color basic, when you do a print mem on a 64K machine, you get 31,015 bytes because there's no high res screens to be reserved because there's no extended basic. And when he put it in and he upgraded 64K, of course, it came back with like 24, 2280, whatever it is, you know, because it reserves enough room for a 6K PMO4 screen. So I left him a comment kind of explaining what was going on, why it went down. Uh, but he got it all successfully. And he's got one of the Cocoa 2 boards that actually has two different RAM upgrade options. It is a 24464s or the little satellite board headers. You can actually put the 4164s on a, a satellite board. And this is right when that big fire happened at the chip manufacturer in Japan RAM prices for everybody, the entire industry went through the roof. And uh, basically that was kind of Tandy's way, I think, of uh, you know being able to handle trying to get either of the two types of chips. If they get a better deal on one, they sell you that upgrade. If you got a better deal on the other, they'd sell you that upgrade instead. Stupidest crisis ever. It was the plastic the chips were potted in that couldn't <laughs> be gotten anymore. So... <laughs> The RAM was fine. You just couldn't package it into a chip. Yeah. So I won't play the video. It's eight and a half minutes long, but if you want to go check it out, and he has some of his commentary just on the Coco in general, because he's kind of new to the platform. And if I remember correctly, this is also one where he mentions that it was Boise that kind of got him the Coco and got him interested in actually doing these upgrades and stuff. So thanks to Boise, we've got another new person you know, into the Coco family. So that was cool. Next up that, we have uh, Conrad Hoffman. Um, oh, sorry, Conrad's the guy that I think Boise uh, convinced to buy one. Um, but he did a kind of a, almost a YouTube short. It's about a minute and 41 seconds. But basically, he's got a Cocoa 3. He's got a Cocoa STC. And he just kind of gives you a quick overview of the computer itself and then what he mainly uses it for, which is playing Sierra games. And one thing I find interesting that he quoted here is that he said he has a 10 to 1000, which he pans over to on the left here to show as well. Um, that he's also got the Sierra games on. But he said he prefers playing them on the Cocoa 3 because they run faster. So I'm wondering if he's running Nitrous 9, 6 through 9 uh, version of it, because that definitely is faster. Because uh, I don't remember, now some of you people that have had both Tandy 1000s and Cocoa 3s and have played the Sierra games, if you're doing the stock original 6 and 9 version and the stock original Tandy versions, was the Cocoa version faster even then? Or was that only after the you know, the, the operating system and you know, CPU upgrades? Has anybody here actually had a Tandy 1000 played the Sierra games and the Coke ones? 
No. No? Okay. I never had a Tandy 1000, so I have nothing to compare it with, so. Okay. I played Leisure Suit Larry on a Tandy 1000, and it seemed pretty much identical to what Coco does, but I never really got to play it on the Coco until quite a bit later. Okay, so you wouldn't be able to really compare the speeds then. I mean, visually, I know they're almost identical because they're 16 color, 320 by 200, both of them, so. Hey, you can check out that video too. And if anybody wants to uh, write in or or you know leave a comment in the Discord or something, I'd be interested to see if people that have experience with both of them. I, I'm kind of surprised uh, that the uh, you know the eighty eighty eight eighty eighty six machines are going to be slower than the Coco three. Next up, Jim Mullis. This is his programmers. What was that just incompetent programmers? <laughs> Okay, so next up, we've got uh, the YouTube channel, T-H-S-B-I-A-J-K-K. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, but I believe that's Jim Mullis, who's doing the Superpowers port, and he's been using Graph Express by Sundog Systems' Jeff Steidel to do it. Now, we've seen a few times where I've played the demo that accompanies the uh, the program Graph Express itself. Uh, what he's running here is the IntraBass demo, which is basically is more geared towards letting the programmer know what your options are as opposed to just, you know, flashy graphics and sound now a caveat i have to do up right up front here and i've hit this problem too i know nick has as well is that x on windows and mac has some problems with sound especially if you go off with that window being the main focus which i think he had to do for his recording software so it gets really warbly and i don't know like i know uh kieran runs you know under linux himself and i'm presuming he doesn't have these issues (laughs) um but it, you'll excuse the sound, and here's basically what I'm going to say. But for those of you who have not seen this, it, uh, and you're interested in what it can do, um, here you go for a nice little three-minute demo. I'll lower the sound a bit, too. So, Actually, I'll fast forward a bit here because we don't need to see the splash screen. Showing you some of the different size screens you can run and the fonts that adopt to. Click a few that basic normally doesn't have. This is kind of cool when it's using double buffering to, you know, do smooth animations of lines and boxes over top of a background. And here it's doing a fast window copy to do scrolling. And wow, that's starting to look like OS 9. (laughs) Well, would you need OS 9 now? Well, honestly, I mean, his 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 box uh, drawing is actually quite fast from what we're used to from Basic back in the day. But I think Nitrous Nine actually is faster than that. And you can save and load pictures. And here it gets into some of the sprite stuff here. So this is actually where it auto detects, you know, collisions and you can put sprites with more priority in front and back. And you get to drag it around with your joystick, which he's just setting up in his extra emulator here. But you'll notice that box lights up as soon as it detects that that sprite has actually touched it. And he's got the other uh, static version of the same face that uh, is now made to be a foreground so that your shape goes behind it. And that's all hand- handled automatically using the commands that are built in the Graph Express. So there's that one. And then the second one he did is he decided to kind of demo uh, horizontal scrolling because the demo you just saw had vertical scrolling, which is what he really needs for his uh, superpowers game. 
So he's kind of experimenting with the uh, you know different size screens and different color resolutions. I think the particular one here, he does 256 by 192, 16 color. Um, now, this is something where I'm going to try to go through Graph Express and try to dissemble pieces of it and see if I can just find a couple of the routines that do this kind of like block memory copy stuff. Because that I can patch to run without needing to kick in native mode to run with 609 TFM instructions, and that should speed it up quite noticeably. So I'm hoping, because he's had a bit of problems trying to get it up to the speed he really wants it to run at. So once EOU 101 is released um, and we finish our disassembly of the Deluxe Color Computer, I might take a little side track to go into Graphic Express unless somebody beats me to it and see if I can speed up a couple of those you know, memory-critical routines with some 609 instructions without requiring native mode to run. Because he was having some problems with native mode crashing. Because basic's not really set up to run native mode. Oh, it's probably gonna do that little loading screen again, isn't it? Skip that part. So he's displaying a 225 screen, but he's only using 192. So he's drawing some lines in the background so you can kind of see what's gonna scroll. And there's the speed it runs, scrolling at 256 by 192, 16 color screen, which is about 24K, I think. It's not too bad. Reminds me of the uh, basic demo with the fast get puts I did for the Coco 1 and 2, um, though this is definitely faster. Uh, but this is something that, once again, if I can get it to run on 609 with the TFM command, will speed up drastically from this, probably twice as fast, if not a little bit more. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes when I get to it. Uh, next up, this is actually from the Discord. So I don't really have a web page to show you, but he did put a screenshot in. So uh, Mike Miller posted a screenshot of him getting Flex and the programming language called PL9, which is designed for the 609, running under the SWTPC emulator. Now, for those not familiar, that's Southwest Technical something. Products something. Corporation. Thank you. <laughs> um. So basically, he's got it running under that emulation, and that was one of the various, you know, sort of scientific technical machines, like the gimmicks and a few others too, smoke signal, cheap tune, et cetera, um, that ran 609 OS 9 and Flex. And um, what his goal is now, now that he's actually got this running, because he's been trying to pull these different source codes and stuff off some of the Flex archive disks uh, from the Flex archive we've talked about on several previous shows. And he was trying to get the PL9 language actually running. And he's got that running now in here. So his next goal is basically to do some changes to the interrupt system so that it becomes Cocoa compatible. And then hopefully he will be able to get not only the, this version of Flex running, but also the PL9 programming language and its trace debugger utility uh, running on the Cocoa itself. So we'll have a new language to play with. And I'm not super familiar with it. It looks like it's got pieces of basic and pieces of C because you got a print, but you got the backslash N for the new line uh, designator, more like a C style thing. So I'm not familiar with this language. Is anybody on the panel here familiar with this language? No, but I wonder if it has something to do with like IBM's PL1, except maybe it right. might be the 6809 yeah. version of PL1. That would make some sense. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really looked at PL1, so I don't know. Looks like uh, I just found a, a, a PDF of a uh, reference manual for it. Its title is Programming Language for the Motorola MC6809, that is to say PL9, by Graham Trott. Okay. He doesn't mention, though, if it's based on PL1 or is it he considered a brand new thing? I'm not from a PL1, to be honest. But No, not, a, not in the colophon at any rate. Uh, I can okay. look in the history. That's page three-ish. In the meantime, there's a couple of comments from uh, Karen about uh, XWAR and the, the sound stuttering issue. He says, indeed, I don't have any of these issues under Linux, and I don't uh, on either the Windows or Mac laptops have access to either. But I guess I probably haven't experimented with Focus much. Um, I've tried back and forth with a few people to try and get the auto buffering default OK. Do feel free to play with those options yourself and report back if any help. It probably won't help that Windows 10 and 11 seem to have completely different audio systems. A lot of Windows 10 audio stuff doesn't work in Windows 11, so yeah, it's probably but it's, it's a problem on there. OS X too. I mean, which is a Unix-based, you know, kind of under the hood thing, but it has the same same issues. I, I tend to get much less audio distortion if I keep it in focus, but if I'm running something else, 
Yeah, it's the foreground and X was running in the background. It, it gets just as stutter as you heard on the demo. Um, James Jones is also saying maybe there was a PLM from digital research for CPM as a program yeah, language that, as well. That looks like what it's based on is PLM if I'm reading the history. Okay. Yeah. I do see the Wikipedia page on PL1 shows procedure or proc, entry begin, do end. And I see this little snippet up here you have on the screen has procedure main. So I don't know, they may all kind of be interrelated. Right. Okay. Anyways, I, I'm curious if you can get it working because it it looks like a like I said, it almost looks like a C basic hybrid, almost. Mm -hmm. Just from the you know the two lines of code I can code. see. <laughs> yeah, PL one. Forget it. It's COBOL. <laughs> forward slash asterisk asterisk forward slash. Maybe maybe cool to see it running on a, on a Coco. Because I I don't know if we ever had it, even when Flex was the you know the big thing from Spectral TSC and Frank Hogg. I don't know. If, I don't remember seeing PL nine on the list of languages. There's a bunch of TSC compilers and basic compilers and stuff too. But curious to see where it goes. So keep keep going at it, old Mike. Now I'll switch over to some Dragon news. So Julian Brown, um, if you remember last week, he. had done a couple of pal daughter boards like he's basically designing his new replacement dragon so that you'll have a daughter board whether you want ntsc or if you want pal rather than you know hard merging it into the main motherboard and you have to make two different versions of the whole big main motherboard you just need this little satellite board that's a little bit different and the main board will stay the same but he was having problems so he had one that was not working properly the one he did and then he'd mailed out uh this exact same pcb to one of his friends and had them you know assemble and solder the chips on and his friends worked fine so we finally figured out what was going on and why it was not working there was a faulty 74 ls32 chip and a fuse on his that was not working though in his tester it apparently it passed but it actually shouldn't have it's it's not working properly so once he put a new one in now it's it's working again so glad he got that figured out um and he's also posted an update to his revision three enhancement board so at the beginning of the project was trying to do the same as Rocky did, make it a duplicate motherboard so you can actually make them again so that you can create new dragons. But now he's decided to go, you know, deluxe cocoa on it and he's going to be adding some new features. So his Rev3 board for the refinement, he's removed the third PIA because, of course, it normally has two just like a, a cocoa does, but he'd added an extra one in in favor of an AY compatible sound chip. Although the wiring for that third PIA is now passed through directly to the video card. Pretty much everything left is fine tuning and fixing that troublesome pal video, which he talked about in a later post that he has got fixed now. So yeah, he's actually making basically the uh, the deluxe dragon, I guess you can call it, because it's going to be pretty close in spec because the dragon already had a R32 chip in it and uh, the deluxe added that. And now he's adding the AY chip, which the deluxe also had as well. So they're almost kind of on par now, which is cool. Next up, Morgan Hetherington actually posted a couple of things. Now, he's not normally a Dragon user, um, but he does a lot of 3D printing stuff with color. And uh, he was kind of proposing some you know, alternative designs to doing the Dragon logos a 3D print. And he's got one that's basically just black, white, and red, you know, the traditional one. And he's got another one that actually has the full color like the Dragon label does for the Dragon 32 here with the red and black Dragon symbol above it. And he's asking if there's anybody interested that would like to purchase it or if he should make enough that people would purchase them. So if you are interested in this kind of thing, and unfortunately for the audio listeners here, you're going to have to go check out the picture on the Facebook Dragon Group to, to get a full scope of exactly what we're looking at here. I can't really describe it very well. Uh, if you're interested in that type of thing, let, let him know because he, he will actually make some of these. And then it kind of proves his credentials. He did another post where he kind of listed stuff he's done for other platforms. So he's done this you know, large 3D print with full color doing the Night Lore, which is a game that's actually been converted to the Cocoa as a cartridge that Neil sold. Uh, I'd done a Chucky Egg here with this little you know symbol here too. And he's done some other ones. And he's got a few uh, Bruce Lee. If you're familiar with that game from Datasoft. Uh, Dundurak, which I'm not familiar with. The Great Escape, which is kind of an asymmetric one. But these are all 3D printed uh, with with lots of color. Um, and they actually look really good. So if you want a bit of a collector's item, a little bit different than actually, you know, having the retro stuff itself, um, definitely leave him a message if you're interested in this kind of stuff here, because it gets if he gets enough demand, he'll do some dragon specific related ones. I mean, maybe we can bug him about some cocoa ones too. 
Next up after that, we've got Helen Osborne posted a video of the Dragon 32 demonstration cart running. Now, unfortunately, her monitor and camera seem to be having some issues because the the screen gets a bit warbly and wavy and, and the camera keeps re-reading the, the lighting and stuff wrong. So it keeps changing the colors to something that looks completely washed out. So I won't play too much of this. Um, from what I could tell, and judging by complaints in the uh, right, you can see the top one from Richard Harding. How did they think this was a good thing? I think it's basically a basic program demo, uh, extended basic, basically, that's on a ROM card. And it's basically, I think, it was to try to sell extended basic as being fairly advanced. I won't play the whole thing because the sound is quite annoying, but I'll play a little bit of it here. I'll skip the loader part. Turn this down a bit because I know it's a bit annoying. But basically, it's a little scrolling text of, you know, describing the features. So here it says, Dragon 32 gives you 32K of RAM, extended basic language, color graphics, sound and music. And it's sticking with basic. So, I mean, you're talking play and sound. You're not talking the multi-voice we just saw from Coco Town and Graphics Express. And it goes through and does, you know, little graphic demos, very simple ones. Um, basically, the type of stuff you'd find in the manuals, I'm sure. Scrolling text. Let's see if we can find a graphic bit here. That's sound already. Maybe for... Nine available colors. Yeah, so here's like a simple one. They draw a little baby cart. Hey, it just goes on that. And from my understanding, and Karen and maybe some others can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I believe that was like a little demo cart they would throw in the stores that people can kind of see, you know, a bit of an ad of what the basic could do. And honestly, Extended Basic was quite advanced for its time. There wasn't too many other basics up at that level for ease of use for graphics and stuff, especially with stuff like Circle and, and Fill Paint. Um, except for maybe I think in England, the BBC Micro actually had a more advanced basic than this. It was more you know, like Basic 09 style. But uh, if you're you know comparing it with those, say a VIC twenty basic or a Commodore sixty four basic or a Spectrum basic, it was quite a nice advancement. And that's all I have for news this week. Okay, well we've uh, gone over the five hour mark. Woohoo! <laughs> We're back to normal. <laughs> hey, it's about time. Even though we wake up an hour early, it still seems like a long show. Right, <laughs> the pills okay, are was... working, and for a, season uh... seven, we can go longer. <laughs> oh. Seven hour shows. <laughs> the goal is by the end of the uh, seventh season here, we're just going to have a twenty four seven like CNN. That's where you never stop. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can attempt to make I, that. I already got oh, the no, moniker no. for it. My I got to would... do. I got to do my best, James Earl Jones. Now, this is the Coco Nation. <laughs> Actually, my wife would hate me if we went twenty four seven. Oh, don't worry, we can do after dark quite well. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, we done with that been a thing before. I already got the phrase for us: uh, TCNN, the Coco Nation Network. Ooh, oh, ooh. <laughs> I like it. Hey, if uh, you get a chance, uh, you go to Ron's garage. You can look at a. Uh, uh, website called startups startupstumbles.com and they have a timeline of Radio Shack from the beginning till now and how they changed hands and things changed and stuff. It has a Radio Shack uh, logo on it with the Grim Reaper behind it. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> if you get a chance Just to wait. Look. Startup Stumbles, huh? Well, at least yeah. the last guys that bought it do sell electronics so there might be some hope. That's the ones in South America or whatever? Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's better than the Bitcoin drug addict. Oh, that was exactly, horrible. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Twitter went into, like, art <laughs> rating. It was terrible. But Radio Shack wasn't a startup. It was an established company. They yeah, it got bought out by Tandy, actually. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, they didn't fail as a startup. They failed as a company overall at the end, towards the end. They sold out to the dark side of cell phones. That's right. And, and they, they went to the dark side. 
sold their computer stuff to what was it, AST Research? Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Then Tandy oh. bought uh, Grid at one point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And oh, who and could Curtis ever forget Jones. their super successful Thor disc? Mm-hmm. But they, they Curtis... actually. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, you know, one of the things I kind of forgot about Curtis when we were going through all that stuff. Mm-hmm. The one thing I forgot was the uh, Ian Maverick's uh, diagnostic card. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Well, let's save it for next week. We can do a comparison. Ken can show off Frank's and we'll compare it with Ian's. Indeed. Hey, Bob, okay. is, is, is that a white multi pack you've got there? It is. Yeah, the oh, the style. earlier white one, not the, the uh, later Tandy Slim. Yeah, that's what I mean, an early white. Early. Let me go ahead and run the outro. Has Proof has again has that the, the uh, silver one deluxe was. <laughs> this concludes another episode of The Coco Nation, the world's leading live interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things The Coco Nation, visit us on the web at thecoconation.com. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to show at thecoconation.com. The Coco Nation show would not exist without the community and its cast and crew. The Coco Nation theme song copyright 2022, D. Bruce Moore, mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. The Coco Nation is over. Join us on the Coco Discord server. Coco forever. Over. Go home. <laughs> it's, it's never over. over. Run. Oh. Old man Ron's garage there. That's right, buddy. <laughs> Out of my yard. Here you go. NES playing whippersnappers. Yeah. All right. Yep, I yep. can't do it as good as Bye, that. everybody. Yeah, I think it's a pizza. Oh, next week. Bye. <laughs>